Good afternoon, dear colleagues and delegates. Welcome to the virtual conference update in cardiology 2021, scheduled on a digital platform on today and tomorrow. Regarding the speakers, we have wanted to foster a sense of togetherness between the generations, experienced teachers, and relatively younger speakers. Hope you will enjoy the session. Our first session is on hypertension. For this, I'll invite Dr. Shukumar Ghosh and Dr. D.P. Shina to moderate the session. For chairperson, we have Dr. Shuni Banerjee, Dr. K.K. Mitro, Dr. Bandita Das, and Dr. Hello. Rajat Kanti Goswami to grace the chair. Over to you, sir, Dr. Shukumar Ghosh and Dr. D.P. Shina. Subhashish, you will yes. be moderating the session subsequently, right? Okay, madam. Okay. Sir, please go ahead, sir. Uh, Sukumar, sir, kindly go ahead. We are first to show one more thing. Okay, yes. Hello, am I audible and visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I will please go and visible. So, good afternoon. This is the first session of the update in cardiology 2021. And our first speaker is none other than Dr. Arindam Pandey, who is an excellent speaker and is an excellent cardiologist. Dr. Arindam Pandey, can you start your deliberation now? Are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm fully ready. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to present in this August forum. And the topic which I have been allotted is also very relevant. And the chairpersons and moderator, or all are uh, my professor or teachers. Uh, professor Dipishina used to be the convener of my uh, examination, DM final year. So it's really a pleasure for me to present in this August gathering. So the topic which I have been allotted is hypertension, when to start, escalate, and de-escalate the drug therapy. Without wasting much time, let us uh, go through the brief presentation. As we all know, hypertension is a very important uh, disease, chronic illness. Estimated 1.4 billion people worldwide have high blood pressure, but the problem of blood pressure as a disease is just 14% of the patients who are actually suffering from hypertension, they have their blood pressure under control, only 14%. So that is the biggest challenge of hypertension management. So many of the individuals who are actually suffering from hypertension, they do not know at all that they are hypertensive. So it is a huge task for the healthcare worker and professional to uh, diagnose the patient and to, uh, uh, to start the treatment in a proper way. As you all know, hypertension management, it, it encompasses two aspects. One is lifestyle modification and another is drug therapy. Now, before I start, because my uh, you know, talk uh, topic is uh, when to start. So to understand when to start, we need to understand the definition of hypertension. But the problem is blood pressure definition, it is not uniform. Different bodies across the globe give different kind of you know, parameter for definition of blood pressure. If I if I give, give you a simple example, blood pressure can also be you know different in different settings. Say for example, in clinic, the blood pressure definition is different. 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the definition changes. Similarly, self-measure blood pressure is also showing some other criteria for definition of blood pressure. Now uh, these are the three, uh, three important uh, recommendation blood bodies, Inter International Society of Hypertension, ESC and ACC. You can see uh, ESH and ESC to some extent have some degree of uh, collaboration and similar definition regarding the blood pressure as a definition, clinic blood pressure as per them. If the systolic blood pressure more than equal to 140 or diastolic blood pressure more than equal to 90 is defined as hypertension. But if we look at American College of Cardiology, uh, 
as per them, more than equal to 130 uh, systolic and more than equal to 80 to be defined as hypertension. Now, why this difference? This is because of the different trials. One of the trials is a, is a sprint trial. Uh, the sprint trial actually had more impact on the American College of Cardiology guideline, but we must clearly understand how the blood pressure was measured in sprint trial that is probably not similar to the clinic blood pressure as we are uh, many a time actually uh, measuring the blood pressure in our OPDs or clinic. Now, how the blood pressure is being measured is extremely relevant. It is very important. There had been clear-cut recommendation how, uh, regarding the position of the patient, how he should uh, sit, how the foot uh, to be dangled down and to be supported, how the hands to be supported, how much time the patient take rest, and what are the things he, he is supposed to avoid, say, for example, smoking, a full bladder, all these things are to be avoided, which may not be possible possible in our day-to-day -day clinical uh, situation. So nowadays, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or self-measurement of blood pressure is get, getting more and more relevant for defining someone who is actually hypertensive. Now, if someone is detected with hypertension, what are the initial investigation to be done for all? These include this list, and this is as per the you know European Heart Journal, so ESC guideline, hemoglobin, fasting sugar, lipids, Triglyceride, potassium, sodium, uric acid, creatinine, liver function test, urine, and 12 lady CG. So these are the mandatory investigation. Everybody should be subjected whenever he is uh, first time detected with hypertension. Now, regarding the management, I already mentioned one is lifestyle measurement, and second is drug therapy. Now, uh, regarding lifestyle measurement, there have been important steps, though they, they are very easy to enumerate, but very difficult to follow. But in studies, they have shown consistently, say for example, healthy diet, weight loss, reduced dietary sodium, increased dietary potassium, physical activity, moderation in the alcohol in conjunction, have definite impact on the overall blood pressure of the patient to the tune of 5 Millimeter, to five millimeter of diastolic and systolic blood pressure reduction. So as a whole, if we can apply all of them, there will be significant reduction of blood pressure. So they do have important roles to play. There is no denial of the fact. Now regarding the you know commencement of pharmacotherapy or when to start medicine, in this aspect also, different guidelines, there is some disagreement. But say for example, the current ESC guideline is 2018, ACC is 2018. 2017, there is another important guideline which is known as NICE guideline, which was updated in 2019. But the latest guideline regarding the hypertension management is actually WHO guideline, which is published this year only, 2021. So I'll try to briefly touch upon the important guideline as the WHO guideline is the latest guideline. So I'll start with WHO guideline, when to start pharmacotherapy in individual with confirmed diagnosis of hypertension and systolic blood pressure of more than equal to 140, diastolic more than equal to 90 is a strong recommendation to start pharmacotherapy. And in individuals with existing cardiovascular disease and systolic blood pressure more than equal to 130 to 139 is another indication so we can understand nowadays the concept is changing. Not only the digital number of blood pressure is important, now other risk factors are given equal importance. So if someone who is having additional risk factors, say for example, diabetes, dyslipidemia, strong family history, or already an existing cardiovascular disease, threshold for commencement of pharmacotherapy in this high-risk individual actually is far, far lesser. This is as per the current WHO recommendation. Now, WHO suggests pharmacological antihypertensive treatment of individual without cardiovascular disease, but with high cardiovascular disease and diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, and systolic blood pressure, 130 to 139, as I already mentioned. Now, there have been other additional important thing. What are the medicine we can which you can start? Uh, overall, four classes of antihypertensive medication are given equal importance. But yes, uh, beta blocker. Uh, though it is not considered as a first-line therapy of hypertension, but in some individual which is who are actually having compelling indication to start beta blocker, there it has to be taken, uh, you know, in, into the initial uh, regime of the medication. Now, uh, the combination pill. This is a new concept. Most of the guidelines, be it ESC or ACC, they are now preferring combination pill for management of type two, for management of hypertension as a class two A recommendation. So, if we are having an option of combination field, it is always preferable 
to be uh, to start with single pill combination who also uh, you know resonated the same thing so in individual who is actually uh, qualifying for pharmacotherapy start with two drug combination therapy preferably a single pill combination either ac inhibitor arb dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or uh, diuretic thiazide type diuretic is to be initial treatment the target goal is less than 140 by 90 and follow up they are also very very clear regarding the follow up 3 to 6 monthly follow up many time in our practice we see patients are very very you know uh, uh, concerns uh, if the blood pressure is not under control within two days, three days, they repeatedly consult you, which is probably not imp- not actually rational. You need to give some time for blood pressure to come down. So and regarding, uh, you know, ESC, when to start pharmacotherapy, ESC, the uh, classification of uh, blood pressure is little different from ACC and other bodies. Uh, they, they, they actually uh, differentiate it to high normal, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Little uh, difficult to remember, but this I feel is more relevant because we cannot just generalize and we can understand very clearly if the blood pressure is grade one, more than 140 or more, more than 90 diastolic, there is no confusion. We need to start pharmacotherapy along with lifestyle measurement and lifestyle measurement are actually advocated to all patients yes for borderline blood pressure say for example high normal blood pressure it is the lifestyle measurement which is to be applied first followed by follow up and then if the patient requires uh, pharmacotherapy has to be started these do not follow if the patient is having high risk say for example this is ACC 2017 guideline as per then the stage 1 hypertension as per ACC is 130 to 139 and that's 180, uh, 18, Here, if the clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk is more uh, more than 10 percent, then actually, along with uh, you know non uh, pharmacological therapy, lifestyle modification, pharmacological treatment has to be started. So we can understand that risk factors are actually given importance in the overall uh, management of uh, hypertension. Now, this is nice guideline 2019. This is another important guideline, but this actually simulates the Yes, so I'm not going to detail of that. Now, third part of my, you know, second part of my presentation went to escalate. So this is very, very important because this may be very relevant in our day-to-day practice uh, when we are supposed to increase the medication. Say, for example, nowadays, most of our patients, we are starting combination pill with two antihypertensive medication. Then actually, as per ESC, we can see as well as WHO guideline, three to six months, so this is very important. We should not hurry. Three to six months is the average, you know, uh, time we should give to evaluate whether the patient's blood pressure actually is improving or not. If it is not a resistant hypertension or very, very high blood pressure, in any case, for very high blood pressure, patient actually requires hospitalization. Now, if the patient is an OPD patient, actually three to six months has to be given for at least, you know, initial management to work. And this actually is uniform. This is actually similar in WHO, ESC, as well as uh, EA, EA, many of the guidelines. Now, regarding the choice of pill, as per the ESC 2018, ACNV, ARB, plus calcium channel blocker or diuretic are the initial therapy. But as I mentioned, beta blocker at any treatment step when there is a specific indication for their use, say, for example, heart failure, angina, post-MI, atrial fibrillation, young women or who are actually planning for surgery or pregnancy, their beta blocker actually comes high up in the you know, armamentarium. Similarly, as per the year ACC 2017 guideline, we can also see at least three to six months of time has to be given before we consider that the initial management is not effective and we need to escalate the therapy. That is how we are supposed to do. And I'm not going to detail. This is the algorithm of resistant hypertension management. As you all know, resistant hypertension by definition, uh, three antihypertensive medication, one of them has to be a diuretic in full or maximum tolerated dose. Uh, if the blood pressure is still high, we consider is resistant hypertension. And all the guidelines has agreement regarding this. If it is not controlled, the fourth drug has to be a spinal lactone or a 
April non. So we need to consider the acquired, you know, uh, uh, this condition. We, uh, many of the time, if we just give 25 or 50 milligram of uh, spinal lactone or 25 milligram of April non, that is many a time effective and can actually reduce the resistant hypertension to a control group. Along with that, spurious resistant hypertension has to be considered. Say, for example, patient is not compliant with the medication or suffering from some other comorbidity. Say, for example, very common is obstructive sleep apnea. So those things are uh, coming in a big way. And escalation matrix as per the NICE guideline is somehow similar. So I'm not going to detail. Now, third part is the de-escalation of drug therapy. This is very, very relevant. Not many conference we actually discuss regarding the de-escalation of therapy. And to be honest, limited has been said about the de-escalation of drug therapy by prominent bodies. Now, ESC says it may be possible to reduce the number or the doses of the drug, but uh, you know it is very important. Patients with prior, you know, uh, previous accelerated hypertension should not have their treatment withdrawn without the supervision. Is it possible? There is a, there was a systematic review of 66 articles with 28 studies reporting proportion of people with the threshold for treatment in specific study for six months or longer after withdrawal of antihypertensive therapy. 49 studies reported adverse event or change of potentially leading to adverse event related to withdrawal of antihypertensive. So it's not very usual up the medication altogether, but there are no data as a, on the opposite side as well. 21 cohort study, 7 RCT analyzed proportion of people remaining non potency for 6 months or later. So it's very important that if the patient's blood pressure is uh, very nicely controlled or the patient is experiencing spells of hypotension, we need to gradually withdraw the medication one by one. And in very few small percentage of patients, it might be possible. We have problem. Are they we are not audible? Predict successful withdrawal, but the evidence is conflicted. So effects associated with uh, withdrawal risk included changes the changes in the biochemistry, heart rate, pulse rate, dynamics, kidney function. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So conclusion is available evidence shows around one quarter of mainly older patients on antihypertensive therapy can withdraw such medication without return of hypertension for two or more years. Due to the limitation of the evidence, the safety of this approach is not known for people at high cardiovascular risk and withdrawal, withdrawal is successful in those with lower baseline blood pressure or single agent and stopping medication does not mean the end of monitoring. Further studies should examine the short as well as long-term benefit and risk observed with this, you know, uh, this uh, withdrawal of all medicine altogether. Thank you very much. Thank you. All done, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Yeah. Will the next speaker? Uh, sir, kindly unmute, sir. I send a request. Uh, uh, Bisvarup, sir, kindly unmute. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. yeah, please, please go ahead. Respected chairperson, uh, all distinguished guests, dignitaries from the CSI, and my dear colleague, today I will discuss one of the challenges like resistant hypertension get the patient through. We often face this problem in our day-to-day -day clinic. And hypertension, you know, it's world most important leading risk factor for cardiovascular disease, stroke, disability, and death. In last few decades, we have observed significant improvement in the management of hypertension and control of the hypertension and also awareness of the patient. 
Despite this improvement, there are a large group of people with hypertension failed to achieve target blood pressure goal even with three uh, even with three antihypertension medication. And often they are, can also achieve this uh, target with four or more medications. So this group of hypertension has been designed as resistant hypertension and they are associated with adverse outcome even with ongoing treatment. So So, what is the definition of uh, resistant hypertension? The uh, ACCHA first uh, issued this scientific statement in 2008 on resistant hypertension. After that, several modifications have been made. Now we have ESC guideline in 2018 and also ACCHA guideline in 2017. <laughs> According to AHA scientific statement, resistant hypertension can be defined as BP of a hypertensive patient that remains elevated above goal despite the concurrent use of three antihypertensive agents of different class. So, what is the goal? That means systolic blood pressure should be less than 130 and diastolic blood pressure less than 80 millimolar of mercury. And what are the three antihypertensive agents that include calcium channel blocker, angiogenic dancing converting? enzyme inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blockers and also include diuretics, preferably chlorthalidone. And all agents should be administered at maximum or maximally tolerated doses and at an appropriate dosing frequency. And definition of resistant hypertension also include uh, exclusion from non-adherence uh, to the treatment and also white coat effect. And According to uh, ESC 2018 guidelines, the goal is somewhat different. Uh, it is below 140 millimeter of mercury in systolic blood pressure and below 90 millimeter of mercury as far as diastolic blood pressure is concerned. So, what is the prevalence? So, it is very difficult to assess the true prevalence as the resistant hypertension definition includes exclusion from non-adherence and also white coat effect. So there is another terminology that is coined that is apparent treatment resistance. That, uh, that means that when one of the data is missing, particularly when dose frequency, uh, when medication dose or non-adherence or white coat, white, uh, coat effect is missing, one of the data is missing, it has been called as a apparent treatment resistance. In uh, different population-based and clinic-based trial, it has been shown that the uh, prevalence is around 9 to 80 percent of the patient diagnosed with hypertension. So the most important is what is the prognosis? So that's why we are so much concerned about resistant hypertension and it is associated with adverse prognosis and several studies have been confirmed this mm, findings that in a study of more than 4 lakh patient compared with patient without resistant hypertension, patient with resistant hypertension had a 32% increased risk of developing instant renal disease, 24% increased risk of an ischemic heart event, and 46% increased risk of heart failure, and 16% increased risk of uh, cerebrovascular accident. So resistant hypertension has been associated with increased incidence of cardiovascular event, cerebrovascular event, and also target organ damage. So what are the patient characteristics? The most important demographic characteristics of uh, resistant hypertension is older age, black race, and male sex. And they are associated with multiple comorbidities, important obesity, left ventricular hypertrophy, albuminuria, diabetes mellitus, CKD, and most important is obstructive sleep apnea. It is associated around 50 to 70 percent patient of resistant hypertension. They are also associated with some metabolic abnormalities like hyperaldosteronism and also decreased level of renin. They are exclusively salt sensitive and there is also hyperuricemia. Some physical aberration also can be seen in resistant hypertension group of patients that 
means there is also vascular dysfunction uh, in terms of uh, alternation in the function of endothelial function and also vascular uh, resistance or increase and decrease in the vascular you know, peripheral resistance and also peripheral and carotid atherosclerosis also can be seen in this group of patients. Before the diagnosis, before we reach the diagnosis of resistance, before we establish the diagnosis of resistant hypertension, we have to exclude the most possible causes of pseudo-resistant hypertension that include, most importantly, adherence to the prescribed medication, another is white coat effect, and proper measurement of blood pressure, that means BP techniques should be proper and also suboptimal therapy, that means the clinical inertia should be excluded from this group of patients. And that contribute importantly in the failure in the management of the uh, resistant hypertension. And medication non-adherence accounts for around 40% of the patient and white coat effect around accounts for around 30% of the patient and particularly suboptimal therapy of antihypertensive regime in this group of patients that also fails to achieve the target blood pressure in this group of patients and also the inaccurate BP measurement. So what is white coat effect? This can be defined as the observation of repeated BP elevation in the office with controlled and significantly lower BP outside the office in a hypertensive patient on medication. And the white coat effect can be easily identified by 24-hour ambulatory BP monitoring or home BP monitoring. And during the evaluation of the patient, we have to take detailed history of particularly if patient is taking any drug that uh, reduces the efficacy of antihypertensive drugs that includes NSAIDs, oral contraceptives, sympathomimetic, cyclosporine or tacrolimus, erythroboitin, VGF inhibitor, alcohol, cocaine, amphetamine, antidepressant and glucopoid and mineralocorticoids. So during uh, this is the algorithm for evaluation of resistance, resistant hypertension. First, we have to confirm the treatment resistance that clinic BP should be more than 130 by 80 millimeter of mercury and patient taking three or more antihypertensive agents including calcium channel blocker, blocker of renin angiotensin system and a diuretic at maximally uh, maximal or maximally tolerated doses. And we have to exclude pseudo-resistance that means uh, non-adherence to the treatment and also white coat effect. Uh, because the diagnosis of uh, resistant hypertension requires exclusion of uh, non-adherence and exclusion of white coat effect. And we have to also assess the secondary hypertension, particularly in during uh, history taking if there is any suggestion like that young hypertensive who are presented with severe hypertension in the stage 2, stage 3 hypertension or who have a uh, target organ damage from the beginning who have a resistant hypertension that gives some clue that patient has been suffering from might have suffering from secondary hypertension and most importantly the pulmonary uh, primary aldosterone it is very commonly associated with resistant hypertension particularly in resistant hypertension prevalence is around 20 percent and so we have to uh, screen for this group of patients particularly the biochemical screening uh, like uh, aldosterone and plasma renin ratio and with uh, also plasma aldosterone level if it is more than 20 or 30 and uh, absolute value of uh, plasma aldosterone is more than 16 milli, in, in, uh, ng per ml if it is so it has been considered that they should have been primary aldosterone. Term. The other important uh, secondary hypertension include renal para parenchymal disease, renal artery stenosis, and also preocomocytoma. If in the history there is paroxysmal hypertension along with palpitation, pyloidectron, uh, uh, all this uh, present, so that gives some clue to that maybe preocomocytoma. Pushing syndrome, and importantly, the obstructive sleep apnea, it is associated around 50 to 70 percent of the patients of resistant hypertension coaptation and other endocrine abnormalities. Next step, we have to assess the target organ damage like fundoscopic examination and cardiac left ventricular hypertrophy or coronary artery disease is present or not and proteinuria, bovinal filtration rate and also peripheral artery disease, uh, whether these are present or not, we have to assess it. 
during biochemical analysis we have to give stress on the particularly metabolic parameter like sodium potassium level and also blood urea creatine and also uh, blood glucose level and special uh, stress should be given particularly pulmonary aldosterone we have to measure the plasma aldosterone and uh, renin ratio and we have to also take the uh, metanephrine or urinary metanephrine level to exclude pheochromocytoma and endovascular imaging should be done uh, with special reference particularly if we thinking of renal artery stenosis so next step is how can we manage this resistant hypertension first we have to exclude the other causes of sinto resistance and white coat effect and medical medication non adherence then we have to promote lifestyle modification particularly these patients are very much salt sensitive so we have to ensure low sodium intake less than 2.4 gram per day intake and with that there is also lifestyle intervention particularly 6 hours of uninterrupted sleeps and there's that particularly less intake of alcohol and also promote the weight loss and also promote exercise particularly brisk walking on 15 minute, uh, minute at least per week and then we have to optimize the three targeting ensure adherence to three antihypertensive agents, particularly RAS blocker, CCB, and diuretics at the maximal or maximum or maximally tolerated doses. And diuretics should be uh, preferable that loop uh, chlorothalidone or indobamide should be preferable than thiazide diuretics. And if there is renal dysfunction, particularly EGFR less than 60, then we have to consider the loop diuretics. Still, if BP is not at target, then you have to add low dose mineral uh, corticoid receptor antibodies, particularly uh, spironolactone or epinephrine. If BP is still not at target, then you have to add uh, assess the whether there is sympathomimetic overactivity, then you have to add beta blocker if, uh, uh, like metoprolol or or labetalol and calvitolol. If beta blocker is contraindicated, then you have to go for central alpha, uh, alpha agonists like clonidine and guanafensin and all these things. If still BP is higher, then you have to add hydralazine, 25 milligram thighs daily and titrate up to maximum dose. If still higher, then you have to substitute with minoxidil. And most of the patients are controlled with this medication. If still they are on the higher side, we have to think of some novel treatment like renal denervation and carotid baroreceptor stimulation. Though simplicity, hypertension, cetal, and binar hypertension. Yes, can you conclude, please? Yes. Uh, and uh, some other uh, different uh, treatment uh, modalities are on the horizon. And to conclude, that resistant hypertension is common and its prevalence is around 5 to 20 percent, and it is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. And important issue is that optimal treatment regime and exclusion of pseudohypertension adherence to the treatment and lifestyle modification is most important and addition of aldosterone is most important in this management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar, for giving an Yeah. Our, no, what the, sir, next speaker, sir. There is some technical uh, glitch at this end, but uh, I would request all the panelists to be present during the discussion, present during the discussion session. Our next speaker is Dr. Pankaj Singh. Dr. Pankaj Singh, are you there? Yes, sir, I am there. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, anybody can see my screen? Uh, not, 
no. Uh, uh, actually, the last speaker has to. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, sir. No, okay. you, you can uh, you can share it now, sir. Kindly click on share screen. Uh, and, uh, One minute, sir. You can able to see uh, share screen, sir. Bottom center. No. Bottom center. There is a green button. Eh? There is a green button. Button. If it is not oh. visible, kindly make it a full screen of your Zoom window. Uh -huh. Kindly make it maximize. Kindly maximize your Zoom window. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I can see. Yeah. Initially, I have done it, but. Uh, Yeah. 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 Okay. So kindly make it full screen and. Uh, okay. Bad name. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm Dr. Pankaj Singh, and uh, I will respected chairperson. And uh, dear colleagues, uh, this is a virtual uh, conference, so I'm uh, giving this from my hospital. So I'm a bit disturbed. Our primary has come in the uh, emergency, and I'm trying to summarize it quickly. Uh, my topic, which has been given to me, is a systolic and a diastolic J curve. Very little is known about this, and uh, so uh, I will go through all the aspects of it. Uh, J curve effect is describes an inverse relationship between the low blood pressure and the cardiovascular complications the cardiovascular effect and this effect is more pronounced in the patients with pre-existing coronary artery disease hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy there is a strong j curve phenomenon between the myocardial infarction and diastolic bp in moderate to severe hypertensive patients only they have coronary artery disease because in the hot trial they have seen that well in the patients who have a coronary artery disease were saying j curve phenomenon and j curve phenomenon is also associated with uh, systolic blood pressure and uh, mainly it is related to the pulse pressure what is the concept of uh, j curve and here we can see that uh, the hazard ratio of a uh, cardiovascular events when it is seen over a period of a diastolic back pressure, we can see that it is less at the level of uh, uh, sorry, 80 to 90 millimeter of mercury. And uh, in 1979, after a study over a period of six years follow-up, Stewart reported five times higher risk of a myocardial infarction in a hypertension patients with a diastolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter of mercury when compared with those of diastolic blood pressure of 100 to 109 millimeter of mercury. And this was the first time the concept for J curve came in. Came in. And 10 years after, Krug Sang reported a new strong J curve phenomenon between myocardial infarction and diastolic blood pressure in moderate to severe hypertension patients only when they have a coronary artery disease. Uh, most important thing, what is the mechanism of a J-curve con concept? How we can explain the J-curve concept between the blood pressure and the cardiovascular events? There are three most important theories which has been proposed. is a low myocardial perfusion. What happens in the patients with a coronary artery disease or in the patients with a hypertension patient with a left ventricular hypertrophy during systole, the intramyocardial vessels are contracted and they are stimic. And the coronary arteries are the only arteries which are filled during diastole. In the patients with a coronary artery disease with a proximal coronary artery stenosis, the diastolic flow, uh, if the diastolic blood pressure is low, flow into distal to the coronary stenosis is less and there is a subendocardial ischemia. And this subendocardial ischemia further leads to increase in the LV in diastolic filling pressures which further decreases the coronary perfusion pressure and further decreases the blood flow to the endocardium. And this severe ischemia leads to the myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. The second is a reverse casualty. This is a, a very simple phenomenon in which a old patient or a chronic illness, frail patients having a low systolic or a diastolic blood pressure, having an increased mortality has been seen over a period of Time. It has been seen that a patients who have a low diastolic pressure, there is 1.7% uh, 
increase in the overall mortality, 1.5% increase in the cardiovascular mortality, and 1.4% there is increase in the cardiovascular events. And the third and the most important and relevant to us is the arterial stiffness. This, as the patient goes ill, elderly, there is the arterial stiffness, there is an increase in the systolic blood pressure, which is called the isolated systolic blood pressure, and the diastolic blood pressure is low. There is an increase in the pulse pressure, and there is a, this leads to the increased cardiovascular events. From this particular slide, we can see that uh, uh, actually the autoregulation of a blood flow in the myocardial markers between 45 to 120 millimeter of mercury. And in the patients with the coronary artery disease, this autoregulation is somewhat disturbed and this leads to the low myocardial perfusion. And here we can also see that the coronary blood flow and heavy mass meter square is maximum between 80 to 90 millimeter of mercury of a diastolic blood pressure. So this is how the blood pressure we can see here. Important. Here also the same, this slide indicates that how this elastic arteries and difference between the elastic arteries and the stiff arteries, the pulse pressure in the stiff artery is more, uh, and this leads to the increased cardiovascular events. Here also we can see that the difference between uh, systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure, if it is systolic blood pressure is more than 160 millimeter of mercury and the diastolic blood pressure is less than 80 millimeter of mercury, the mortality is around 6%. So uh, the, we can see that J curve of the diastolic BP is restricted with those with concomitant elevated pulse pressure or systolic blood pressure. And it has been seen that in Elderly patient, if it and coronary artery disease patient, if we concomitant decrease the systolic blood pressure, and if we uh, and along with the diastolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure is around 55 to 60 millimeter of mercury, and the pulse pressure is within the normal range, the mortality is less, a little less as compared to the patients who have got an increased pulse pressure. So the major clinical studies, I won't go into detail of uh, major clinical studies. These are the few other trials, invest trials, value trial, and on-target trial. In the invest trial, it has been seen that a patients between a uh, systolic blood pressure of 120 to 130, uh, 130 to 140 were having a less mortality and the diastolic blood pressure also between 80 to 89 millimeter of mercury were having a less Mortality. Same with the on-target trial. Also, the systolic blood pressure who are having uh, blood pressure in the Olmi Sarton group having a blood pressure of less than 120 millimeter of mercury were showing a J curve. We can see in the left panel all these uh, were showing the J curve, but in the right panel, uh, WHS, PHS, and the CHS study, uh, they were not consistent with the J curve. These are the demerits of uh, uh, J curve also we see here. But the most important thing what is seen in this uh, invest trial was that the patients who were revascular coronary artery disease, who were revascularized, were showing the less you know, J curve phenomenon as compared to the patients who were not revascularized. So the incidence of uh, uh, this particular thing was uh, closely related with the coronary artery disease. And he, and one of the also most important things is J curve phenomenon is mostly associated with the, the myocardium. It's not associated with the cerebral and the renal. This is why I will come in the, here in this particular diagram. We can see that uh, the stroke is consistent with this one. So coronary perfusion occurs in the diastole, whereas the cerebral perfusion mainly occurs in the systole. Cerebral perfusion is capable of autoregulation in the range of 40 to 125 millimeter or so. It is resistant to the low blood pressure. As a result, the J-curve phenomenon does not hold proof for the incidence of a stroke. And for the renal perfusion, same phenomenon also occurs. So what should be the realistic approach? Realistic approach should be that since the appearance of J-curve in a patient with a clinically severe left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary artery disease, or vascular disease is highly probable, concerns should be taken to maintain the diastolic blood pressure minimum of 70 millimeter of mercury and possibly 
between 80 to 85 millimeter of mercury. And systolic blood pressure is suggested to be between 130 to 39 millimeter of mercury, as it is given in European guidelines on hypertensive management 2009. Here also we can see that uh, if you see this particular uh, curve, the minimum blood pressure of 138.5 millimeter shows less cardiovascular events, and the diastolic blood pressure also shows a to less cardiac events, sorry. So uh, in conclusion, I can say that elevated pulse pressure is independently associated with the increased cardiovascular risk, but however, elevated pulse pressure is a not major determinant of increased risk associated with the low diastolic blood pressure in last cohort of the patients. And the current national and the international antihypertensive treatment guidelines recommend BP goal of 140 by 90 millimeter of mercury in the patients, other patients, and 130 by 80 millimeter of mercury in the patients of renal disease and diabetic patients. And however, recent clinical studies have shown Jacob phenomenon in diastolic blood pressure of less than 80 and systolic blood pressure of less than 130, we should try to keep the blood pressure above that particular range because there was no significant difference in the risk of cardiovascular complication we are seeing between aggressive antihypertensive management and the standard therapy. And obviously, the J curve does not appear for the stroke patients. And this, in the stroke patient, there is a relationship is consistent with the principle the lower is the better. If we decrease the blood pressure to the lower level, we have do have a decreased cerebral stroke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pankaj Singh, for giving an excellent deliberation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Silanjan Rai, are you there? Dr. Silanjan Rai? Dr. Silanjan Rai? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor is there. Uh, doctor, kindly unmute yourself. I have sent a request. Dr. Sinaljan, can you start your deliverance, please? Dr. Sinaljan, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Please, please go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you very much for the organizers for giving me a chance to deliver my uh, lecture in uh, CSA update this year. Uh, my topic will be CVT prevention beyond conventional risk uh, factors. Firstly, uh, an introduction, I'd like to say that cardiovascular disease, as we all know, is the leading cause of death globally. And the incidence of cardiovascular disease is strongly associated with the traditional risk factors, that is smoking, hypertension, dyslipidemia, particularly raised LDL cholesterol and diabetes, which is already established. And uh, these factors has been used, combined using multivariable risk assessment tools like the Framingham uh, risk score or the ACVD risk calculator or the uh, Q risk score or the JBS calculator to, or the score calculator to estimate an individual risk for having cardiovascular event. But beyond these traditional risk factors also, uh, there are some risk factors uh, that are used to guide or estimate preventive therapy such as aspirin or statins. And these conventional risk tools can underestimate or overestimate the CVD risk. That is a big problem. So here lies the inclusion of some non-traditional biologic or physiologic risk factors which might improve uh, the performance of the tools. So non-conventional risk markers, as we all know, that despite the importance of the blood lipids and LDL lowering half of all the heart attacks occurs in person without any overt hyperlipidemia, and almost one quarter occurs in absence of any major cardiovascular risk factors. Okay, this, I, you cannot see your slides. Can you okay. share your slides? Can you share your slides? One second. Please, one second. Please, I please want to share screen. Yes, yes, yes. Share screen. The button, there's a green button. Yes, yes, yes. Is it visible now? Yes, yes, sir. yes, yes thank you. Thank you. Sorry. It is not working. Yes, I've gone. So, uh, regarding the non conventional risk markers and associated interventions, as I was telling, that half of all the heart attacks occurs in the persons without any overt hyperlipidemia, and almost 25% occurs in the absence of any major classic vascular risk factors. So, this fact challenges 
very basic issues related to the current screening programs for risk detection and the disease prevention. And it is not surprising that much of the recent research, it has focused on the identification and evaluation of this novel atherosclerotic risk markers, which might be behind these uh, factors. So when evaluating a novel risk markers as a potential new screening tool, clinicians need to consider certain questions. That is, first question that need to answer is that whether there is a standardized and reproducible assay for the biomarker of interest. Secondly, whether there is a consistent series of any prospective studies that demonstrate that a given parameter predicts truly a future risk, whether this novel marker adds to the predictive value of lipid screening, whether there is evidence that the novel marker adds to the global risk prediction rate, such as the Framingham Heart Study, and whether the knowledge of the biomarker would lead to a proven intervention to reduce the risk that the patient otherwise would not have received. Now, first is the high sensitivity CRP that received a uh, huge popularity because inflammation uh, is a core or a critical pathophysiologic link between the plaque formation and the acute rupture leading to occlusion and infarction. In clinical practice, it was seen that HSCRP uh, in more than 50 randomized clinical studies it, that it independently predicts the development of peripheral and uh, coronary artery disease, MI, stroke, sudden cardiac death among apparently healthy persons, even when the LDL cholesterol levels are low or in the normal range. In the comprehensive meta-analysis, also the multivariable hazard associated with HSCRP exceeded that associated with either BP or cholesterol separately, and HSCRP yielded an increment in the statistical value in terms of predicting future cardiovascular events, which is almost identical in magnitude to that of total or HDL cholesterol. So as a separate discrete marker, HSCRP uh, derived an important place. And if you see that the uh, levels of the HSCRP and the increasing uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease and the cardiovascular death and its statistically clinical significant level, uh, HSCRP can be treated as an important biomarker in addition to the uh, I mean, traditional markers. AHA and CDC issued the first guidance for use of HSCRP levels in 2003 and briefly stated HSCRP levels less than 1, 1 to 3 and or higher than 3 has been classified as lower, moderate, or higher relative vascular risk, respectively, when considered with traditional risk markers. And screening of HSCRP should be, should be done at the discretion of the physician as a part of global risk evaluation. Though HSCRP predicts the risk across the entire population spectrum, it is likely to be greatest, the value, in the patients having in the intermediate risk category, that is having ASCVD risk uh, between 7.5 to 20% 10-year event risk. And current SSEHA guidelines recommend the use of HSCRP when decision-making regarding statin therapy, however, is uncertain. There are certain tips and tricks while interpreting or, uh, I mean, giving patient uh, ordering for a HSCRP test that values of HSCRP in excess of 8, eight milligram per liter usually represents an acute phase response that is caused by an underlying inflammatory disease or intercurrent infection, and it should lead to repeat testing in approximately two to three weeks after the infection of the inflammation has subsided to get the exact baseline value. And HSCRP levels has got an equivalent stability over long periods to that, that of the traditional risk factors. It exhibits minimal circadian variation, does not depend on the prandial state, so the blood sample can be taken at any time of the day. And outpatients can undergo screening even at the time of cholesterol, routine cholesterol evaluation also. In clinical practice, many physicians now use both HSCRP as well as the family history of coronary artery disease as a part of global risk prediction and freely available renal risk score for men and women facilitate this process which incorporates H HSCRP along with the traditional risk factors. So the renal score has uh, proved to be having superior discrimination and calibration than the uh, I mean, conservative Framingham risk score and the current SCCHA pool cohort equations. Levels of HSCRP more than three also predicts recurrent coronary event thrombotic complications, I mean uh, complications after angioplasty and poor uh, outcome in the setting of unstable angina. HSCRP has got its broadening horizon in terms of prognostic usefulness in case of acute ischemia, even without elevated troponin level. It suggests that enhanced inflammation at hospital admission can determine the subsequent plaque rupture and, uh, I mean, severity of the disease also. These findings help to explain that why patients with elevated HSCRP levels may accrue greater benefit from aggressive interventions. HSCRP can be a serum surrogate of plaque vulnerability also. Because levels of HSCRP correlate only modestly with un underlying atherosclerotic disease process as measured by carotid intima media thickness or calcification. But the observation simply does not reflect the presence of subclinical disease. But elevated HSCRP indicates an increased propensity for plaque disruption and thrombosis also. 
and hscrp is also backed by a gravity of jupiter data as we all know that even in patients with normal ldlc cholesterol patients with elevated hscrp of more than 2 and reduction of hscrp to less than 1 resulted a astounding uh, 44% reduction in the all primary trial endpoints 54% reduction in mi and 48% reduction in the stroke events even in the low risk who were stratified initially as a road, low risk population like women non smokers and those without metabolic syndrome uh, reduction in the H, uh, hscrp uh, resulted in significant benefit with statin therapy so this is the arm in prove it and improve it that also shows that patient who had uh, received the targets of ldl less than 70 and hscrp less than 2 dual well the dual goals were achieved they uh, i mean received the maximum benefit in comparison to patients who achieved either of ldl goals or either of the hscrp goals so other biomarkers showing promise uh, promise includes the uh, uh, markers of inflammation and uh, that includes the interleukin 1 6 the other intracellular adhesion molecules as well as the markers of leukocyte uh, activation like myeloperoxidase pregnancy associated plasma protein a or the other interleukin family molecules fibrinogen level is also associated positively with age obesity smoking diabetes and ldl cholesterol level and given this relationship fibrinogen was among the first novel risk factors evaluated though all these risk markers and the biomarkers are not much in clinical use lpa is also a strong contender regarding the novel biomarker use some investigators advocated that lpa assessment in certain patient groups such as those those with established coronary artery disease or renal factor uh, renal failure particularly it was shown that in children having recurrent ischemic stroke they have got elevated lipoprotein a levels that supports the potential use of biomarkers in this unusual high risk settings and interventions to reduce lipoprotein a initially uh, with the use of niacin though it was not much beneficial but the newer molecules like the pcsk9 inhibitors or the anti strength oligonucleotide like the inclisiran had uh, is now undergoing and may show benefits in the uh, future homocysteine lost its way Uh, though there was an initial promise with using homocysteine but the big trials like the visp trial or the norvit trial all the vitamin uh, i mean supplementation trial they did not show any substantial benefit direct plaque imaging is also important which shifts the paradigm from biologic to anatomic risk assessment also so although several uh, novel imaging techniques are in development based on uh, data are mainly with carotid intima media thickness assessment and the ct score or the uh, ct scan to detect the coronary artery calcium score now regarding cimt a meta analysis of 14 population based studied it showed that uh, though it was seen that increase in the cimt by more than 0.1 mm increases the risk by nearly 10% same analysis found that cimt unlikely of any clinical importance once the risk estimate and reclassification adjustment for usual risk factors were done so once the confounding factor was removed removed the benefit of cimt uh, seemed to dwindle now regarding cac score which is a rising star in the assessment uh, of uh, i mean preventive uh, cardiology and as a novel biomarker and uh, biologic marker it has shown that cac predicts strongly the vascular risk and advocates the approach correctly uh, not unlike cimt cac can provide substantial reclassification in primary prevention also that is it can reclassify the patient from moderate to low risk or maybe from low to moderate risk category the hens nixford study or the mesa study have shown that coronary artery calcium score the ankle brachial index hscrp and the family history independently predict the incident vascular events among patients at intermediate risk category particularly the mesa study also the cacs also modestly improved the discrimination score when added to pooled cohort equations however there are some shortcomings of this cac scoring also that uh, cac scanning however causes radiation exposure that is a problem and results in increased downstream testing maybe from unanticipated false positive finding so a false positive finding can lead to unnecessary testing a uh, battery of testing in the patients and whether cac is a cost effectively improve prevention it remains controversial to to date the trials have that shown cac to have quite limited impact on changing patient or physician behavior that is also an important or uh, shortcomings of cac with regard to primary intervention so you have to use cac but with a pinch of salt and part of the difficulty with calcification as a uh, using biomarker is that 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 cac detects a plaque which are least likely to rupture because having high calcium content it does not detect the non calcified thin cap fibroatheroma that appear to cause the most clinical events that is a big shortcoming of, of with cac and although cac score provides a non invasive measure of atherosclerotic burden patients with low ca calcium score cannot be dismissed at having low risk so there is a dilemma of also using cac and major study with currently asymptomatic individuals also it was seen that 
41% of all future vascular events occurred in those with a CAC score of less than 100 and nearly 17% occurred in with the CAC score of 0. So a low CAC or CAC of 0 does not rule out future uh, cardiovascular event with certainty. In this study also high Framingham risk score but low coronary artery calcium scores remained at high risk. So we have to use CAC score but as a complementary to other conventional risk factor measurements. And another factor is that statin use increases CSE despite consistently reducing the cardiovascular events. Now regarding functional assessment of the plaque characteristic that is also an important paradigm uh, in the assessment as a novel biomarker. So potential new targets for this functional imaging includes measures of glucose uptake by the plaque. Uh, assessment of specific adhesion molecules and biomarkers of apoptosis and protein degradation. Magnetic resonance imaging, positron PET technique and contrast-induced ultrasonography, each which are linked to specific molecular targets in the atherosclerotic plaque, all are under investigation to assess the functional characteristics of the plaque and vascular reactivity like coronary flow reserve. So these are the markers or the imaging targets while uh, assessing the functional uh, functional assessment of the plaque or the vulnerability of the plaque. These are the important markers that can be studied by various advanced techniques. And interventions based on vascular imaging has also been instituted. Like in diet study, random allocation to ischemia screening with myocardi myocardial perfusion imaging was done, but it failed to reduce any incident MI vascular death or episodes of ischemia. So it was a setback. Furthermore, little evidence exists that imaging uh, alone improves the general preventive measures, like uh, noted in the ICNAR trial. I yes. Cannot, please conclude. yes, almost I'm finished, sir. Thank you. The knowledge of the CAC failed to improve the risk of smoking, improve the rates of smoking cessation or exercise. And lastly, is the genetic markers because heritability account for nearly half of the susceptibility to coronary artery disease and various genetic markers that uh, pertains to particular. Uh, risk categories like the LDL cholesterol uh, of atherosclerosis, the inflammation and the cellular proliferation that are now in study. So possibly gene sequencing is the future of preventive cardiology and genetic data provides strong suggestions that pathways related to LPA triglyceride may uh, be causal for atherosclerosis. Secondly, the observation that most of the genetic variants uh, may be associated with other therapeutically important decision makings like cholesterol, uh, clopidogrel resistance or statin-induced myopathy and warfarin dosing also. So these are the prominent examples of clinical applications of gene-based uh, thera uh, therapy. So genes translating into clinical benefit, genetic risk score is uh, possibly the future of assessment of cardiovascular risk category. And it has also been seen that in various trials, a patient having high genetic risk, uh, I mean, uh, achieves the maximum benefit with lipid lowering with statin. So this is uh, this should be the algorithm while using any traditional risk factor assessment. We should, uh, in every step, assess the harms of assessment or the benefits of assessment or maybe the harms of treatment based on non-traditional risk factor assessment only to reach a uh, health outcomes regarding hard outcomes of CVD events and mortality. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. That was an exceptionally good lecture by Dr. Silanjan Rai. I, and this we have uh, we are running short of time, but we still have uh, questions, a couple of questions from the chairpersons. Please, can you uh, chairpersons, Dr. Ghosh, Professor Mitro, uh, Dr. Ghosh, can you do you have any questions? With, uh, short questions, please. Dr. Sunil Banerjee, any questions, Dr. Ghosh? Yes, sir, kindly unmute, sir. Kindly unmute. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. So, it is a nice program to start with. It is a very important session. But then we really played a important question of cardiovascular And the issues are also a common thing in day to day practice. So, one thing in Jacob, the, actually, there is a controversy in Jacob in diastolic pressure. The mortality rate increase in the large scale trial, uh, meta, in meta, meta trials. It is shown that even after below 90, diastolic pressure is mortality increase. And in uh, another uh, comment is made by in textbook, it is below 70, is, it is where is actually the Jacob lies in the diastolic pressure. It is controversial, it should not yet solved, I think so. And systolic J curve is 130 around, and you have to observe, but it's just, we sometimes in, if we try with the screen trial, so there is the J curve does not come. So these are the issues not yet solved in practical problem. I think so. This is my little comment. And 
Thank you, Professor Ghosh. I have. Mitri, you yes. have observation? Yes. Uh, I want to have some comment. Uh, what is the role, current role of clonidine in resistant hypertension? Because uh, in many our practical scenario, we have seen that addition of clonidine has uh, brought the blood pressure under control. So this is uh, this drug should be revisited. Number one, number two, regarding the presence of J carb, that the real practice problem is uh, with the systolic hypertension, 180 by 60. What yes. should be the drug uh, uh, in this setting? So that is a very important practical issue. And lastly, for Dr. Silanjan Rai, the, our it is not the anatomy that is the calcium score. Nothing can predict, but it is the physiology of the plaque that is the activity of the plaque which is the main determinant of the cardiac events. So our future non-conventional risk factor should be aimed at to identify the vulnerable plaque or especially in our country where majority AMI patients have no risk factor. So this three comment I like. So can I make a comment? Chairperson, can I make a comment? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the resistant or the refractory hypertension, where the four drugs, including the diuretic, do not work, a recent development is the renal sympathetic denervation. This form of device therapy has been shown to improve the uh, control of the blood pressure and requirement of the number of drugs. So this may be one of the mode of therapy where the patient is declared as resistance or refractory hypertension to the medical therapy. And one has to see the further studies on renal sympathetic denervation in the future, how it gets succeeds over the conventional drug therapy. That is the government. Professor Banerjee, uh, we are now at the end of the session. Uh, uh, I thank all the participants, moderators and chairpersons uh, who have given an excellent starting to our CSI update 2021. Please stand by. Our next is a very important uh, session. Uh, Subhashish? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please call the session. Yeah. So now we have the inauguration session. We will begin with lamp lighting and Saraswati Bandhan. May I support the to start? <laughs> I request the chairman of the reception committee, Dr. M.K. Das, sir, for his welcome address. Namaskar. Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of Cardiological Society of India, West Bengal branch, I welcome you all to this update in cardiology, an annual event. And uh, this event is very, very important to all of us because we long for it for not only refurbishing our knowledge, but also to update ourselves with the latest techniques and um, informations. Now, I have the privilege to welcome all the dignitaries who are on the chairs, like Dr. A.L. Dr., who is the president of Cardiological Society of India, West Bengal branch. He happened to be the president of All India, CSI also. Next is Dr. P.S. Banerjee, who is the president-elect of Cardiological Society of India and also the scientific committee chairman. 
and uh, then is Lipika Odhikari, who is the scientific committee chairman of uh, CSI Update 2020, and Dr. D. Rai. Dr. D. Rai is the Se honorary general secretary of CSI. I, I, I have not seen whether he is present or not. If he's there, then definitely he's a very dynamic uh, uh, secretary and uh, doing all his efforts uh, for, uh, for upgrading the status of Cardiological Society of India. And uh, then we have also amongst ourselves the most important person today, that is the chief guest, Dr. Sushobhan Banerjee. Now, a few lines for about uh, Dr. Sushobhan Banerjee. Uh, is a very renowned person and he passed his MBBS in 1963 and thereafter he went to UK and had his DCP and was there for about four years. And thereafter, he happened to be the long, longest serving pro vice chancellor of Vishwabharati University almost for about 24 years. And he happened to be very well known as the one rupee doctor, and uh, he was uh, awarded gold medal by East West, uh, not Metro, East West uh, Society of India. And uh, uh, thereafter, he was also awarded the, the uh, Padma Sri. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, really, we are very proud to have him amongst ourselves, uh, especially in this inauguration program. And apart from all this, the people, the persons uh, who are off the chairs or off the uh, podium to so-called uh, so podium, uh, including the faculty, national and international faculty and delegates and all others who are participating today, I welcome you all to this uh, very cherished program. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next is address by the program coordinator, Dr. Devbrotha Roy. Sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, chairman of the reception committee, Dr. M. K. Dash, president of CSI West Bengal, Dr. A.L. Dr. Chairman of the organizing committee, Dr. P. S. Manaji, scientific chair, Dr. Lipika Odikari, and Organizing <coughs> Secretary, Dr. D.P. Sinha, and Lifetime Achievement Awardee, Dr. D.C. Kosh. We are having a great academic feast today in the occasion of CSI West Bengal Update 2021. And no word is sufficient to praise Dr. Lipika Odhikari, the scientific chair, and especially Dr. D.P. Sinha, the organizing secretary, who has assembled such a wonderful academic feast at such a short notice. We have several international faculties apart from our national and our own speakers from Bengal. And I believe they will enlighten us regarding the recent developments in the field of cardiology, both intervention and non-intervention through their lectures. I wish this program great success. Thank you. Jai Hind. Long live CSR. Thank you, sir. Now I like to request Dr. Anjan Lal Dotto, President of CSI West Bengal, for his address. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. I especially thank the organizing committee. Dr. D.P. Sina, Organizing Secretary, Dr. Lipika Odhikari, Chairman, Scientific Committee, Dr. M.K. Das, Chairman, Organizing Committee, 
and Dr. P. S. Benaji, Chairman Scientific Committee as well. Before we talk about the conference, let us first at the outset pay our tributes to the brave souls, doctors, sisters, frontline workers, paramedics who laid their life against fight of disease like corona, COVID infection. Coming back to the subject today, as Dr. Darshan others slightly pointed out, that ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of death all over the world as well as in India. Secondly, equally important is the fact going through proper lifestyle changes, taking proper measures to control the big five. What is the big five? Hypertension, diabetes, overweight, dyslipidemia, and smoking. If we can take care of these factors, as well as two other additional factors that now emerging in a great way, the distress and family history. Our speakers today from India, from Kolkata, and from abroad is going to highlight how effectively we can prevent ischemic heart disease or for that matter treat ischemic heart disease. I once again thank organizing committee and all for organizing such a meet against a difficult time and to see to it that awareness of prevention of ischemic heart disease reach out to all segments of populations. We have a very important legions of doctors, Dr. Shul, Shushol Anaji, Padrasi already with us. I thank him personally for agreeing with us to be the chief guest of this conference. Thank you all once again. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. P. S. Banerjee, our chairman of the organizing committee, to address the Good afternoon, everybody, especially the dignitaries on the meeting today. Dr. Sushoban Banerjee, Dr. Anjal Lal Dutto, Dr. M. K. Das, Dr. D. P. Sina, Dr. Lipika Udikari, Dr. Devamutu Rai, and all other my friends. This is really a prestigious meeting. Every year we celebrate on behalf of the Cardiological Society West Bengal branch, and we exchange our knowledge with the different speakers across the country as well as abroad. We all know we are passing through a very bad time that is COVID pandemic, and a lot of friends we have lost in this pandemic, and it has learned us how to do the prevention. So in prevention of the cardiovascular disease, the most important is to take prevention from the early part so as to prevent the disease to flourish where the prognosis becomes worse. And that is why the concept of digital technology have come into play. The CSI Central is also giving much importance for the application of digital technology in the healthcare system, especially for the prevention of the cardiovascular disease at the remote areas. Because we all know that people who are residing at the remote area, they don't get any advantage of the modern treatment of cardiovascular disease. So if we can extend this help to the remote areas, then there will be less number of cases at the tertiary care center, and that will be a great advantage on the economic burden on the family as well as on the society. So I believe that prevention strategy should be the topmost priority for our society, especially country like uh, us, like 135 billion population, where the poverty is a big challenge. So thereby we require more stress to give for the prevention of the cardiovascular disease, including the application of the digital technology and arranging series of webinars and other meetings on the medias as well as the electronic medias so that people get aware about the prevention of taking themselves so as to prevent the disease like we stop smoking, alcohol abuse, obesity, etc., and thereby we can also reduce the extent of the coronary artery disease, which is the main cause of death across the globe. So I think this meeting will give a highlight of all the aspects of the cardiovascular disease because the scientific committee has done a wonderful job to organize this meeting, keeping all these subjects for discussion. 
and i hope that when we go back at home with all good messages from this conference we will have a cherished memory to carry on so i again give a thanks to the organizer as well as the all the participants in this meeting long live csi thank you for your attention now i take my dr pika rodekari chairman of the scientific committee to address the session respected president chairman organizing secretary teachers and colleagues it is my proud privilege to be selected as chairman scientific committee for the prestigious conference organized by cardiological society of india west bengal branch for last couple of weeks we have worked hard for epic success of the program senior teachers and young stars from state country and abroad responded positively and passionately i must appreciate their response covid pandemic is far from over as daily number of cases are still high in many countries without their epidemic waves declining but in india covid transmission tra transition from epidemic phase to endemic prevalence are we out of woods yet probably no as pandemic is still raging in other nations we are a bit cautious about physical and real life meeting and opted for a virtual one we have faced the unrelenting toll of the covid-19 lost our teachers trains colleagues and family members but in spite of extreme physical and mental exhaustion we continued our cmes webinars and virtual conferences our last of learning intrusiveness and meddlesomeness make it possible to organize such conferences kobir bhashay monnontore morini amra maniniye ghor kori bachiya giyachi bidhi rashi she amrite ritika pori dhonnobad enjoy the conference thank you madam now we have our chief guest padmasri dr shushovan madam we are very glad to have him here may i may i now request dr shushovan manerji to address the audible yeah. yes sir yes sir thank you sir good afternoon to all my colleagues and teachers uh Sri Anjana, Dr. Anjana, Dr. the President of CSI West Bengal Division, Mr. B.P. Sina, the Organizing Secretary, Dr. P.S. Vanaji, Organizing Secretary, and Chairman of the uh, Scientific Committee, Lipika Madam, and all members of the Organizing Committee. Thank you very, very much for. inviting me for uh, as chief guest at this virtual csi meet west bengal up to uh, update meet csi established in 1948 and west bengal branch established on 1961 the society works towards prevention of cardiovascular disease and eradication of cardiovascular mortality to raise awareness among the people about cardiovascular disease and nutrition diet works towards increasing awareness about the correlation between cardiovascular disease and the environment and lifestyle the official journey of the csi the india heart journal had its modest beginning in 1949 in calcutta the cardiovascular cardiological society of india is an active member of the international society of federation of cardiology and asian specific society of cardiology and also sarc society of cardiology and jointly working with the european society of cardiology esc and american college of cardiology acc the present membership same to the society including overseas members 
is about 4,400. Every year, the World Heart Day is observed at CSI headquarters and all other branches of the CSI on 29th September. Present focus of CSI is research and prevention of CBD. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death, as other speakers said, globally as well as in India. CBD accounts for 17.7 million deaths globally per year, and India alone accounts for one-fifth CBD deaths world over. The characteristics of the coronary disease in India are, number one, early age. 50% of the myocardial infarction in India, Indian patients occur below 50 years of age. Two, multiple vehicle involvement, diffuse lesion. Number three, rapid progression of the disease. And four, poor outcome with high mortality. High incidence of CBD with high mortality call for aggressive preventive measures from early age. Preventive measures involve correlation of risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, smoking. Stress has now emerged as a major risk factor of CBD along with treatment of various risk factors. Adequate measures need to be adapted for therapeutic lifestyle changes. Public awareness program, public awareness of CBD diseases and the serious complications is of great importance so that it makes the acceptance of prevalence, preventive measures efficiently. I am sure that the CSI West Bengal branch, apart from its high academic discussion, will look into this preventive aspect. Also, I think CSI West Bengal to take an initiative to bring out an Indian guideline on prevention of ischemic heart disease. And this is, I think, very important in this very important meeting at the moment. We see the CSI West Bengal public to uh, 2021 a great success. Joy Hind. Long live CSI West Bengal. Long live CSI. Thank you very much once again for selecting me as your chief guest. I'm extremely grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we have the Dr. D.C. Ghosh. May I now request Dr. D.C. Ghosh, sir, to address the meeting. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Dr. Manan Sikha. I am the interim, uh, interim secretary of the Central Seaside. It is my proud privilege to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to none other than stalwart Professor D.C. Ghosh. Our teacher, mentor, and dear staff, CSI, during his long and last test career in cardiology. Because of him, we are here. So, I am humbled, sir, to present the Lifetime Achievement Award. And as the new generation, who are now taking over the mantle of CSI, you would like to thank you for what you have made for me. Thank you, sir, yes. Professor Disipos. So, we will present the okay, plaque sure. and the stall to him. Thank, thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you. 
It gives great pleasure in accepting this award from Cardiological Society of India and expressed my heartfelt thanks to the Executive Committee members of the Society. My relationship with Cardiological Society of India dates back to January 1963 when he became a life member of the Society. Now I feel proud to state that I have participated in various activities of CSI in the past and take and took a, and played an active role in the in framing the constitution of the society under the dynamic leadership of Dr. George Chevia. And I have also played an important role in taking position of the total plan from the CSI, from the CIT, on which the present headquarters of the Cardiological Society stands today. Now, I should also thank late Dr. D.P. Mahu, Dr. Ayan Mottachanti, and our evergreen Dr. Lacey Kundu for their efforts in allotting the plot, in getting this plot from CSI, uh, from CIT. Those who take pride in Bengal's past glory will be happy to know that Cardiological Society of Bengal was formed in 11th of April 1946, whereas the Cardiological Society of India was established in 1960. The official publication of Cardiological Society of India, that is the Indian Heart Journal had its modest beginning in, from Calcutta in the year 1949. Now, over the years, membership strength has increased exponentially and the scientific presentation, quality of scientific presentation has improved substantially. Friends, I look forward to your growing success. Thank you. So we have heard about the origins and the development of CSI and Sam has played a very active role in promoting and making the West Bengal CSI branch grow. So today we are very thankful to Sam for his wise words and kind words and so I think in future we will have a long association with Sam and as the West Bengal branch grows we will keep remembering. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we have a vote of thanks from Dr. D.P. Sinatra. Hello. Uh, this is the present duty of the organizing secretary to give a vote of thanks. My first thanks will go to Professor D.C. Ghosh, who has been our teacher, mentor, and a stalwart in the Cardiological Society of India, particularly in its West Bengal branch, since the inception. My sincere pronoun to you, sir, for having bear bore with us um, uh, over the years and have guiding us through the path of cardiology. Thanks to our chief guest, Dr. Susoban Banerjee, who has kindly consented to be present in this occasion and has enriched us with his words of wisdom. I must give thanks to our, our chairman and reception committee, Dr. M. K. Das, chairman organizing committee, Dr. P. S. Banerjee, and special thanks to Dr. Anjanal Dr. who is our president of West Bengal Bank CSI for words of encouragement. I am particularly thankful to Dr. Devabhutta Rai for giving extending me all the support I needed. And I might, must give my thanks to Dr. Lipika Odhikari for creating an exceptionally good scientific program in such a short notice. In any program, we have to have some support from the industry and I give the thanks to the industry partners, Boston Scientific, Lupin Pharma, Sun Pharma, Weringers, Intas, 
about and will be pharmaceuticals for giving an unrestricted support to our scientific program. Uh, you know, this, uh, this must be uh, stated that we have to do this program in a very short time as because one of our colleagues has fell ill and I had to do this program in a short time. But that is not an excuse. All the blame, all the short term is that are present and will happen lies squarely with me. But however, we have tried our best and uh, we promise to give you a better uh, program in the coming days. Thank you, everybody. And best of, of the days. Please enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So let's begin the next session. Our next session will be on heart failure. For the next session, we have some beautiful speakers. Dr. K.K. Mitra, Dr. Vinit Gupta, Dr. Shubha Agitra, Dr. M.K. Das, and Dr. Mayur Kaur. Our persons for this session are Dr. Amit Ray, Dr. Anand Bhatti, Dr. Afghan, Dr. Shubhan Chandra De, and Dr. Vinay Krishna Parkar. The session will be moderated by Dr. Kajan Ganguly, Dr. Anil Mishra, and Dr. P.P. Sina. Over to the third person's first. Yeah. Uh, Let me start the session. Yeah, please. Let me start the session here, a very important session of the heart failure, about uh, the 26 to 27 million people are suffering around the world, 8 million in America and the rest of the country is suffering, our country about 2.3. So here is the heart failure that is uh, just an enigmatic problem, be it a vascular or a valvular, or rather cardiomyopathic, heart failure the enigma of today. So we want to start the discussion regarding this number of glasses therapy, number of drug therapy, and what is new in the frontier that we first discussed by Dr. Kalak Kumar Mitchell to start the clock, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, chairpersons, panelists, and uh, Dr. D.P. Sinha, our organizing secretary, and Dr. Lipi Kaurikari, the chairman, chairperson, scientific association for giving me this opportunity to talk on this a very old topic of heart failure. But I will have to confine with the, the newer aspect of heart failure as far as management and definition. So over the last uh, decades, uh, we are burdened with various definitions uh, like textbook definition, Birmingham, NYHA definition, uh, definition based on ejection fraction, definition based on progression of disease, A, B, C, D, definition on etiology, Moses definition of phenotype, genotype, and intermax. But all these definitions have uh, in common some lacuna that they are all based on symptoms and they are very much, sometimes they are very subjective. Stage A heart failure is a rather a debatable entity because uh, it has no failure symptoms, no structural heart disease, so its entity is uh, rather debatable. So no place for heart failure to reach ejection fraction who have improved their LVEF. Cardiac biomarkers of heart failure were not incorporated in the previous classification. So there is a need for clinical pathological diagnostic and management oriented definition. So with this uh, uh, aim in mind, the universal definition of heart failure in 2020 was proposed by Heart Failure Society of America, Heart Failure Association, ESC, and Japanese uh, Heart Failure Society. They proposed a universal definition that heart failure is now a clinical syndrome with a current or prior history of symptoms and or signs of heart failure caused by a structural or functional cardiac abnormalities corroborated by at least one of the following that is elevated natriuretic peptide level or objective evidence of cardiologic or pulmonary systemic condition by the term structural and functional cardiac abnormality, it has been defined that LVF should be less than 50%, abnormal cardiac chamber and chamber enlargement, EY, EDAST uh, more than 15, 
moderate to severe ventricular hypertrophy, moderate to severe obstructive or resultant lesion. And by the term, objective evidence of cardiac pulmonary system congestion means evidence by chest X-ray, elevated filling pressure by echo, hemodynamic measurement of right heart catheterization, pulmonary artery catheterization at rest, and by provocation. So, with this base, so we have a four classification of heart failure with reduced rejection fraction less than 40%. Mildly reduced rejection fraction, 41 to 49 percent, with preserved rejection fraction more than 50 percent, and a newer entity that heart failure with improved rejection fraction, where the baseline was less than 40, and there is the increment of 10 point increase from baseline and a second measurement more than 40. So, what is the advantage? It's based on Symptoms, biomarkers, and objective evidence of pulmonary and systemic congestion, utilization of provocative diagnostic tests for hep, hep evaluation of right sided heart failure, and cut up value of the biomarkers like this. So, but still, this universal has some limitations that only LVF, but no other indices like chamber volume, etc., considered. LVF may decline even after recovery. So, disease is not cured even after normalization of the EF and genetic markers are not included. So with this, the newer aspect, we will go to the newer aspect of management. So with this newer classification, the stages of A, B, C, D has been revised, that risk factor intervention, incorporation of the biomarkers, differentiation of heart pull remission from persistent heart pull radiations, and planning of MC um, uh, mechanical circulatory uh, support for stage D heart failure. So with this current uh, up till now, we have four pillars of medical management. That is uh, RAS blocker, beta blocker, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, and SGLT inhibitors, and devices like ICD and CRT. So this makes, as evidence in the SC heart failure 2021 guidelines, it is the current uh, mainstay of the treatment of heart failure, but still, there is one year mortality of 20 to 20, 30 percent, and five year mortality 45 to 60 percent. So, there is a need for newer therapeutic targets. So, besides these four uh, drugs, there are uh, few drugs which have come recently. That is, number one is the evaporating, is the IF channel blocker. These have a special benefit in HEPREP with COPD and intolerant to beta blockers with LVF less than. 35% and patients should be in the sinus rhythm with a heart rate more than 70. There is a significant risk reduction for composite outcomes of CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization or MI. So another newer target is the molecular level, the soluble gonadal cyclic stimulators and enhancers of the cyclic GMP, that is the very sure gut. It is a novel vasodilators as observed in the Victoria trial, 10 milligram, very sure gut, along with the GDMT versus placebo has a less primary outcome events of death or from heart failure or less hospitalization from with very sugar. And it was approved by FDA on the January 21 for use in heart failure to reduce CV death. Next drug is the omicamptip mecarbil. This is a novel anotrope, a cardiac myotrope, activates cardiac myosin, prolonged acting myosin binding, increases the systolic ejection time without affecting the LVDPDT. So in chronic heart failure, it reduces the LB size and anti pro VNP level as evidence in the cosmic heart failure trial and galactic heart failure trial. The next drug is the nitroxyl uh, in the evaluation is the second generation nitric oxide donor, 48 hours infusion of this ionovasodilator in decompensated heart failure with HEPREP is in the phase two trial. Another is the process of gene therapy like sarca 2 a regulates the myocardial relaxation and contraction through free calcium reuptake in sarcopenic reticulum, as evidenced in the QP trial. The other drug is the staroxime. This is a dual mechanism. Inhibition of the sodium potassium ATPase increases the contractility, stimulates the sarca 2 a improved lucitropic function. In acute heart failure, it reduced and with reduced EF, it lowers the pulmonary capillary waste pressure, heart, heart rate, increases the systolic blood pressure, and reduces the LVDP. Recombinant human neuroglin, potassium binder, these are all in the horizon. So, next is the IV iron therapy. Iron deficiency with or without anemia is a very effective uh, found in some, at least there are four trials now ongoing, which shows that 
IV, only IV, not the oral. IV ferric carboxymaltase reduces the heart failure hospitalization. Other molecules have tried that, uh, elamid uh, peptide that increases the ADP, anti-inflammatory anakinra, that uh, is the anti interleukin inhibitors and phosphodiesterase inhibitors uh, 1 and 9, which increase through cyclic GMP. It is as a positive ionotropic, lucidotropic, and uh, other uh, uh, beneficial effect on the cardiac function. These are all under evaluation. So there are some new surgical targets uh, that uh, there is the advanced uh, ventricular acid device. These have a thermogenic potential, which has been eliminated by addition of the magnet that is found in the heart metry. So uh, another tandem heart, centimag Henry, and the devices under evaluation is the cardiac contralective modulator as evidence uh, found beneficial in the QRS duration less than 130 with LVF 25 to 45. The other modalities has been tried, that is the baroreflex activation therapy, matriclip, renal innervation, and atrial fibrillation ablation. So uh, to be to summarize this various, um, various broad aspect of future strategy, we can divide as a pharmacological uh, approaches like uh, nepolysin SGL2, which has already been established, anakinra, we have told, and novel monitoring, that's cardiac uh, telemonitoring, and surgical approaches like mechanical assist devices, cardiac contralective modulators, mitra clip, and atrial septostomy, which uh, reduces the left ventricular uh, endastolic pressure and wedge pressure, and renal denervation. Some are targeting that molecular level that is uh, omnicaptive and there is uh, ATP level that is the uh, elementary type. And another is the biological approach that is the gene therapy, the SARCA 2A and adrenal cyclase 2 and stem cell therapies, the dream heart failure trial and the BAMI trial are emerging, are addressing these issues. So among these various newer targets, we have some novel like his bundle pacing. This can obviate the technical difficulties of CRT, yet achieving the uh, hemodynamic result of CRT by single lead pacing through RV, the his bundle pacing. Another is the implantable pulmonary artery pressure sensor, which is also under evaluation by constantly monitoring the pulmonary artery pressure. Atrial fibrillation ablation we have described, then the renal artery denervation and magnetically levitated left ventricular assist device and SGL2 inhibitors and the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and obviously the last one is the IV IV iron therapy. So to conclude, in the future we have to face more heart failure due to increased survival. We have some large unmet need for additional therapy to induce remission, reverse remodeling, improve myocardial function for refractory heart failure. The main caveats are undiagnosed heart failure, especially heart failure with preserve ejection fraction. Emerging pharmacological device and biological therapies have future potential. We are often burdened with several protocols and guidelines, and probably the experienced clinicians are more wiser than guidelines they ask to follow. So they are the best judge to which one should be picked up from the newer modalities of therapy and newer modalities of therapy. Thank you. Uh, um, definitely. Dr. Pasir Mitro. So thank you for your, thank you for your presence here. Uh, thank you, Dr. May I call on next Dr. Vivek Gupta? Please, uh, to start his deliberation. And uh, at this point, may I remind all uh, presenters that we are limited by time. Please stick within your time. Dr. Vivek Gupta, are you there? Dr. Vivek Gupta, are you there? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Okay. Then, Dr. Subhadito, you are requested to be present and start a deliberation, please.
प्लीज स्टार्ट हेलो डॉक्टर शुभ्रादित्य इज विजिबल डॉक्टर शुभ्रादित्य मैडम हेलो हेलो सुनम्यूट फर्स्ट अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ हेलो अनम्यूटेड यस यस यू आर ऑडिबल नाउ शेयर योर स्क्रीन यू आर ऑडिबल नाउ शेयर योर स्क्रीन In the bottom, you see the one green point is there. Just share your skin. Screen. Madam, already tried, so I'll. You can you can see, madam, bottom center share screen. Come on. And you can see bottom center share screen. Share screen. Ah, uh, Shubhas is sir kindly. No, there is a lot of disturbance from your side background. Some. Yeah, some noise are coming, but why? This is you. You are visible. Suppose you are visible as well as audible. Your slides has to be shared. Your slides has to be shared. Yeah, it's so loading, madam. Loading, it's, loading. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is audible and visible. Clearly Ma visible and audible. Kindly make it full screen. Kindly audible. make it full screen. Oh. Okay. I think you, it's are, you are visible. Your slides are also visible. Should I start? start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start. So you are not in. Full screen, madam. Madam, make it full screen. Since there are thirty-six slides, Subra, you try to cut down your slides. Go so fast. Already you have. Large slides. No, we need not to be started completely. Should I start or it's? Yeah, you can start from here itself. Start. You start. You start. It will take time. Okay. Respect. teachers my seniors and colleagues now i will discuss heart failure and mitral valve interventions current status so as we all know heart failure is a disease with various etiopathogenesis mitral regurgitation is one of the most important cause as well as nowadays we are finding that modifying regurgitation with devices modifies the prognosis of this disease so if you consider the types it has degenerative mr and functional mr functional mr in functional mr main pathology is in, within the lv whereas in degenerative mr it is the mitral valve itself so functional mr is one of the many components of the heart failure syndrome it was kiasinito pathophysiology it is regional or global dysfunction papillary muscle displacement annular flattening and leaflet tearing so presence of secondary mr significantly increases the mortality and the morbidity if we consider the history we have crossed the palliative drugs neurohormonal drugs and till date they are the latest one and so many devices has come to help these poor patients if we consider the natural history of the disease it is gradually progressive with intermittent episodes of acute heart failure which ultimately leads to a state of decompensation so this knowledge of natural history is important when we choose the implement of devices consideration of mitral valve interventions in heart failure we must remember that patient should be should get guidelines directed medical therapy at optimally we consider icd crt as per their indications and we consider mitral valve repair as per guidelines it was first with the primary mr those symptomatic patients near class 3 or 4 who have favorable anatomy for the repair procedure and a reasonable life expectancy but who have a prohibitive surgical risk because of severe comorbidities and remain 
severely symptomatic despite optimal GTMT. Latest guideline also says that TER, that is transcatheter, age to age repair of mitral valve may be considered in symptomatic patients who fulfill the echocardiographic criteria of eligibility, are judged inoperable or at high surgical risk by the heart team, and for whom the procedure is not considered futile. So we, move your slides, move your slides. Your slides are not moving. Put the downward arrow just below okay. sheet. But I am seeing that some slides are moving. You have selected a full screen and uh, sharing. Uh, kindly, I'll, I'll stop share. Kindly share it again. Don't select, don't make it a full screen again before uh, you are sharing, madam. So select your PPT. Not in full screen. Yeah, now go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yes, madam. Okay, some devices of R are now withdrawn and some are still growing with new hope. Kindly click on your slide and move. Just click. It's not moving. Kindly double click, madam. You can click anywhere, anywhere. Just click, double click with your mouse. Not moving. Okay. Yeah. So with the Everest trial, the interest begins. The Everest trial concluded that percutaneous repair with mitral clip system can be accomplished with low rates of morbidity and mortality with acute MR reduction in the majority of patients and with sustained freedom from death, surgery, or recurrent MR in a substantial proportion of patients. It showed improvement in mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, functional class improvement, and left ventricular volume reduction. So when we consider mitra clip, the optimal valve morphology is central pathology in segment two, no leaflet calcification, mitral valve opening area more than four centimeters square, mobile length of the posterior leaflet more than 10 millimeter, coaptation depth less than 11 millimeter, normal leaflet strength and mobility, and flail width less than 15 millimeter, flail gap less than 10 millimeter. So in 2018, two trials came with lots of hope. The mitra EFR and QUAPT. A priori, these two trials targeted the same patient population with the same disease using the same device. But the results of these trials were diametrically opposed. Mitra EFR being neutral, it failed to show any improvement with the device. And QUAPT showed the metric lip procedure to be very effective. If we consider the QUAPT trial, it was a parallel controlled open nipple multicellular trial, randomized one is to one in fashion, good number of patients with good follow up, primary endpoints quite significant, recurrent heart failure, hospitalization through 24 months, and primary safety considerations. Secondary endpoints are well selected. Secondary safety endpoints are composite of death, stroke, MI, non-elective CT surgery for de uh, device-related complications in device group at 30 days and all-cause mortality at 12 months. When the results come, the all hospitalization for heart failure within 24 months, it showed very much statistically significant improvement. Yes, there is improvement in the device-related complications are acceptable, acceptably good. And there is a secondary endpoint. Every endpoint almost showed significant improvement. So the trial concluded in patients with heart failure and moderate to severe or severe secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite maximally tolerated GTMT, transcatheter mitral valve approximation with the mitral field was safe, durable reduction in mitral regurgitation, hospitalization, and improved survival. As such, the mitral is the first therapy which improved the prognosis of patients with heart failure by secondary MR due to LV dysfunction. 
So we can compare the two trials, each and every point. Very, many, various points are very similar. But the, yes, there are differences and these differences may be the cause why these results are just opposite. So these are the baseline characteristics of the study populations with respect to study outcome. And this is the ultimate results. But the important points or possible reasons why these two trials show different results, that is MR entry criteria. MR degree is severe enough in relation to LV volume is more with coap trials. So when we select patient for mitral clip insertion, these points is important. And with the coap trials patients, procedure complications, acute results as well as at 12 months follow-up is lesser degree. So these are the very important two points when we consider these two trials. So these this devices, these devices should be used very cautiously with a selected group of patients to get maximum benefit. These differences may explain the different outcomes and this ultimately dictate the outcomes of this device implantation. So when we consider, again consider the history of, uh, natural history of the patient and we consider the optimal time for mitral interventions that will get the exact benefit or expected benefit. Thank you for patient hearing. Dr. M.K. Das, the speaker is Dr. none other than Dr. M.K. Das, our past president of the uh, CSI All India chapter and uh, our past uh, secretary of the West Bengal chapter. Dr. M.K. Das, please. My slides visible? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Yes. Visible, visible. So my topic today is hemodynamic support in cardiogenic shock. And uh, this is a very, very important topic and uh, very important for especially the postgraduates who are very eager to know uh, about the hemodynamics, not only in normal patients, but also in heart failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really thankful to Dr. Lipika uh, Adhikari for giving me the opportunity to talk on this subject. That is a hemodynamic support in cardiogenic shock. Now, cardiogenic shock is a syndrome of low blood flow characterized by decreased tissue perfusion and impaired cellular metabolism. And almost 7% of acute Myocardial infarction cases are affected by these, and uh, there are several other causes are apart from acute myocardial infarction. To some extent, uh, my previous speaker has already highlighted some of them, like dilated cardiomyopathy and several other secondary causes, which uh, I'm not going uh, in detail about all these things, but definitely I'll talk the acute management of heart failure uh, when other methods fail, especially in the setup of acute market infarction. Very interestingly, in spite of so many advances, incidence has not changed much over the past 15 years and is associated with 40 to 60 percent 30 day mortality. Just uh, it's a mind boggling number even today. Now, there are certain broad hemodynamic spectrum. Uh, which is very common to all of you, like cold and wet, warm and wet, and then cold and normal, and of course the normal hemodynamics. And uh, in the uh, the most uh, important emphasis will be given on the cold and wet, that is the congestion with the low BP. What is meant by low BP? When it is less than or equal to 90 millimeter mercury, and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the baseline pressure is very low, and of course the cardiac index may be very low, 
and that is almost uh, less than or equal to 2.1 or 2.1. Now, this uh, one I will be emphasizing. Now, there are certain profiles of cardiogenic shock that have been highlighted by Sky, and uh, these uh, are uh, based on the risks and the different stages, like A, B, C, D, E. A means uh, who are the patients at risk, and which B is who are the patients uh, 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 who has clinical evidence of relative hypertension or tachycardia without hypoperfusion. C is classic one, that is patient with hypoperfusion and also requiring various support, deteriorating. A D, a patient who fails to respond to initial intervention similar to stage C and uh, getting worse. And extreme patients are E and uh, they are requiring multiple interventions. And, uh, and uh, it has been shown that uh, the, the cardiac intensive care facility as compared to hospital mortality is definitely in favor of the intensive management of the patients in the intensive care. This is, in short, the physiology of the cardiogenic shock. I'm not, again, going into the detail of it. You know all of this. But what is more important at the later stage, there can be systemic inflammation resulting in uh, a surge of the inflammatory cytokines and which may perpetuate the process of shock and may not be, re may not be responding to all the measures which, I, which we are going to take. And uh, that's the end stage uh, heart failure, and there possibly only the rehabilitation uh, are, are to be uh, uh, taken care of. Now, this is a very, very common uh, graph or cartoon, which shows the LV volume versus the pressure, uh, pressure, uh, and uh, this is uh, this uh, one is responsible for the the endastolic volume and ultimately the isovolumic contraction, then ejection when the when the uh, aortic valve is open and uh, left ventricle is contracting or right ventricle is also contracting. And then, and again, it comes down to D. So this is a cycle and this goes on. Now, it, it, the, the pressure that is ahead of the left ventricle is known as the afterload, that is the aortic pressure. And similarly, the preload, which comes into the ventricle, and uh, that's the uh, preload. And there is also another factor as uh, 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 important like the afterload and preload, that is the energetics of the heart muscles. And this uh, actually results in a contractility and ultimately may give rise to the uh, raised left ventricular pressure. And if the aortic valve is open, then the left ventricle, the aortic pressure. And apart from this, the diastole is also important where the endastolic volume is related with the contractility as well as the uh, preload as well as the afterload and thereby uh, the diastolic function of the heart is also very important and uh, as you know that the, uh, the the lucitropic function as well as the contractility is very much associated with the uh, with the with the uh, myocardial oxygen consumption and uh, the that's why the, we must take care of not only the preload afterload but also the energetics now there are certain important uh, uh, important issues like pressure volume relations in shock due to acute LV failure, where there is abrupt reduction in LV contractility, PCWP is increased, CVP can be normal or increased, baroreceptor activation occurs and resulting in high heart rate and systemic venous resistance. And uh, similarly, the pressure volume relations in shock due to isolated RV failure there is abrupt reduction in RV contractility. CVP increases. PCWP can, can be normal or can be decreased even. LV underfilling leads to decom, decom, uh, decrease cardiac output and low BP. And baroreceptor uh, mechanism uh, uh, gets uh, enhanced in this condition also. And there can be pressure volume relations in shock due to acute biventricular failure, where both the left ventricle and uh, right ventricle are failing, and there can be abrupt reductions in both the LV and RV contractilities. CVP increases, specific WP may be normal, may be increased based on the RV function, and baroreceptor mechanism uh, uh, gets enhanced or activated with, with all these. Now, this pattern of congestion could be left-sided congestion uh, based on the left-sided heart failure, combined uh, left and right-sided congestion based on the biventricular uh, failure and right-sided congestion based on this isolated right ventricular failure. And of course, the normal uh, uh, condition can be there 
in, in very uh, very uh, uh, limited number of patients. And the congestion profile uh, is uh, very much uh, related to the increased mortality. It is more so with the left ventricular, biventricular failure as compared to the left ventricular failure and the right ventricular failure. Now to intervene these, actually you have the pharmacological measures and you have the device measures. Now pharmacological measures are well known to you that dobutamin, mildenone, noradrenaline, and all these, they have got certain advantages in the form of administration and they can reduce the uh, LV, EDP and may certainly increase the cardiac output to some extent, but there are many cons like dysrhythmias and may not be effective very much at, the, at some point of time. And they are, these are the patients which may require the mechanical support in the form of IBP, then uh, ECMO, tandem heart, impella. And uh, uh, these are uh, on the, on the right-hand panel, you can see the various uh, uh, hemodynamic changes that can occur with the IBP, then uh, tandem heart, uh, then also the ECMO. And you can see that the, with the ECMO, there can be rise in preload and increase in afterload, increase in LV stress, increase in LV walk, and increase in cardiac output. So ECMO, though, hears very well, but there are certain problems. And that can actually uh, warrant a use of the other devices along with the, the uh, that is the combination therapy with the other device like left ventricular assist device in the form of Impella and which uh, can help in reduction of the preload, then uh, uh, the reduction of the LV wall stress, reduction of the LV walk, reduction of the myocardial oxygen consumption. So that these are some of the things which can occur uh, with the impella, that is left ventricular assist device, which can also be used in the right ventricular, uh, right ventricular failure, isolated right ventricular failure itself. And this is the algorithm-based management of cardiogenic shock with AMI and uh, assess the patient and classify the shock, stable BP, perfusion status, stable respiratory status, generally stage A, and myocardial uh, moribund patient, then palliative care is uh, required. If after stabilization, low BP uh, malperfusion still continues, consider vasopressor inotrop. And if hypoxemia acidosis, consider intubation and ventilation. If still persists, then diagnose cause of shock and decline and define hemodynamic, hemodynamics and mechanical complications are there, then surgical consultation or mechanical repair like mitra clip or all these things can be done in acute setup. Consider early MCS when the uh, conditions are really not favorable and not improving with the with the with the uh, with the various uh, uh, measures that have been taken and with the uh, supportive devices that I have already mentioned. And last but not the least is the revascularization strategy, which might have to be taken in the in the in the in this uh, particular setup where there is failure of uh, all the devices as well. Now I'm giving, putting some uh, uh, profile like uh, profile of the patients, like patient one, which has got left-sided uh, or biventricular failure with left and right-sided congestion put on uh, LVAD, and ultimately the left ventricular congestion was uh, uh, was taken care of, and he became normalized. Now same way, the patient two, the LVAD was as uh, given. But uh, there was no marked uh, market improvement in the form of uh, PC uh, WP lowering, and there the patient was given uh, diuresis, and ultimately the patient was uh, was uh, getting the help of both as, uh, LVAD assisted by diuretic therapy. The patient to two, the patient two may have to be again. The, the patient three is again on LVAD but has not improved. He has developed right-sided failure uh, because of the suction of the uh, left ventricle and ultimately the right ventricular assist device was given. And in this patient, the, the uh, PCWP did not improve, rather it got deteriorated and ultimately the diuresis was uh, given and this patient ultimately got the improvement. So you might have to use uh, different, uh, different kinds of uh, therapeutic measures all in the same patient. And uh, these are some of the guidelines where uh, the IABP is not of uh, uh, not being of very much useful, especially in lowering the afterload as well as the uh, preload, and they're not giving much benefit. It is not commonly used, 
and uh, is uh, is uh, rather contraindicated uh, in in uh, setup like cardiogenic shock with uh, with uh, you know the uh, acute myocardial infarction and uh, in those cases actually ECMO LVAD uh, alone or in combination may may give uh, uh, the salutary results. So just uh, the last slide take home message. The acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock is a complex clinical entity that remains prevalent and the major cause of death after AMI. Early invasive management by way of revascularization influences the outcome, progression, and mortality in very, very uh, uh, morbid patients where the uh, other measures fail. Optimization of therapy, multidisciplinary team, inter-hospital transfers to units specializing in cardiogenic shock management, including providing early mechanical support in high-risk patients are the keys. Approaches to multi-vessel coronary artery disease, including criteria for selected application and timing of multi-vessel PCI and consideration of CABG is important to improve the survival uh, of uh, the cardiogenic patients, especially in the background of acute myocardial infarction or for that matter, all other conditions. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Manal Das, giving a brief but excellent overview of the management of cardiogenic shock and hemodynamic support in cardiogenic shock. I am uh, pleased to announce that Dr. Vivek Gupta has joined our meets and request Dr. Vivek Gupta to yes, give can a, you hear me? Can yeah, you hear me? we can. So please start your slides. Share. Can you hear me? It's okay? We can hear you. Please share your slides. Okay. Can you? Is it okay? My voice is okay? Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Is okay. Okay, Everything okay. is okay. Now start sharing. Just a minute. Is it visible now? Yeah, it is visible. Just a reminder. Please uh, be brief. We are running behind. Yeah, I know. Okay, so thank you very much for the CSI uh, West Bengal and the organizing committee and Dr. M.K. Das for giving this opportunity to talk about the uh, GL2 inhibitor, uh, especially uh, the role in the new subset, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I'm cardiologist in Apollo Hospital Delhi and also course chairman for ICR. So I will take another 10 minutes to discuss about this uh, news. The salt, which has got a very high evidence in reduction of hospitalization and cardiovascular overall mortality in patients who have a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Give me just an example, a 65-year-old female patient, increased breathlessness or routine activity, history of hypertension, BMI, 32 a little high. He was currently receiving chlorothiazone, amylopine, and amylosartan. Clinically, uh, jibular venous pressure was raised, raised to pulse, heart rate almost normal, blood pressure normal, ECG no active fibrillation, but anti level is a little high, and this is creatine is normal. Echocardio finding shows that LV longitudinal, although ejection fraction was maintained, patient is in heart failure. Global longitudinal strain of 17% left atrial volume index of 35 ml per square meter and tricuspid resistance velocity of 2.6. So regarding the left atrial volume index, this is an example of a patient who we are likely to treat uh, and we get uh, such patients quite common. On echocardiography, this one of the following options to what this patient, LV, LAVI of 35 ml per minute suggests acute elevation of left ventricular filling pressure, which leads to condition of heart failure in the absence of atrial fibrillation of viral disease. LAVI of more than 32 is a major criteria for diagnosis of heart failure in preserved ejection fraction. And this is made by echocardiography as per the H HFA and the PEF logarithm. Evidence suggests that left atrial functional parameters like LA strain may possibly have prognostic value independent of LAVI. In patients who have atrial fibrillation, LAVI of more than 34 is a threshold to support diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So patients who have a normal systolic function but they have elevated LAVI, that means the left atrial volume index on echocardiography, are actually the patients who are in heart failure, and this is a problem, has also a prognostic value. So what are the definitions? Let us uh, just revise universal definition and classification of heart failure. A report of the Heart Failure Society of America, Heart Failure Association of American Society of Cardiology, a Japanese Heart Failure Society and Writing Committee Universal Definition of Heart Failure. They shows 
that ejection fraction, which is measured by echocardiography, less than 40%, they put the patient into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is 41 to 49, patients are known as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And if they are more than 40%, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is the basically definition. The mortality outcomes of heart failure phenotypes in Indian patients, which is a Trivandrum heart study published in Veganpati in 2018, and they showed although the mortality overall over a period of follow up period of 30 to 40 months, uh, the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction was a little higher mortality, but heart failure with preserved ejection fraction also have a significant mortality. And not only that, if you see the mortality by heart failure readmissions, uh, when the patient has admitted for one time, and while the patient is admitted for more than one time, it has a higher prognostic and higher mortality if the patients have recurrent hospitalization for heart failure. And therefore, we have to choose this patient and treat them very judicially in order to reduce the mortality and cardiovascular outcome. This is objective evidence of cardiac structural function and serological abnormalities consistent with the presence of LV diastolic dysfunction or raised filling pressure. The most important part in diagnostic criteria for the patients of heart failure with, with preserved ejection fraction is raised LV filling pressures. I'm little deleting this, uh, skipping this slide in, in, for the time. So what is the cardiovascular relevance of HGLT2 inhibition prior to Emperor Preserve? So my topic of presentation will be basically on the Emperor Preserve trial, but before the publication of that, that means as, as early as June 29, 2021, that means this year only, the heart failure, the indication by ESC was that in individuals with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we're talking of reduced ejection fraction with or without diabetes, risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure is reduced by DAPA gain. DAPA or EMPA, both. And in individuals with type 2 diabetes recently hospitalized for heart failure, the risk of CV death or hospitalization for heart failure is reduced by SOTA gain. This is also SGL2. This was, this was the indications which was prior to the Emperor Preserve trial. And this was before, prior to the Emperor Preserve trial. So coming on to the main topic, which is preserved ejection fraction. So we have an artificial intelligence, the data which was published by Genesis et al. in Science and Representative in 2021, in June 8. They said decoding EMPA molecular mechanism of action in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction using artificial. So they are trying to find out how this salt, the EMPA glyphosate, which is SGLT2 inhibitor, is actually helping the patients of heart failure. What are the mechanisms? The key mechanism from the artificial intelligence which they found was actually upstream effect, which is a reduction in cardiomyocyte oxidative stress and systemic inflammation, which is induced by EMPA, and also uh, the downstream effects of cardiomyocyte stiffness, extracellular matrix rebounding, and concentric hypertrophy. So these were the uh, three, five points which was helped by EMPA to reverse 59% of protein alteration relevant to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction pathology. So emperor preserved the study design. Let us come to the emperor preserved the study design. The patients of 6,000 patients, 6,000 patients were actually uh, randomized for EMPA 10 mg and placebo uh, without, without the technique placebo. And composite primary endpoint was time to first event of educated CV death or educated heart, uh, hospital for heart failure. The primary point was time to the first event of CV death or hospitalization for heart failure. And the secondary endpoint was first and recurrent and uh, heart failure, uh, hospitalization for heart failure, rec recurrence, this means second hospitalization or slope of change of EGFR, that was the kidney, we are not talking about kidney. So these were the primary and secondary endpoints, 6,000 patients, EMPA-10 and placebo, other than other medicines, other than this. And they were type 2 type and non-type of age more than 18 years, chronic heart failure and EGFR was more than 220 ml. So EMPA demonstrated a clinically meaningful 21% reduction in composite primary endpoint. And I want to revise again. The primary endpoint was time to first CV death and or first heart hospitalization for heart failure. And uh, this was a result which was there for which shows that significant benefit evidence from day 18 onwards. If you see the curve of placebo and EMPA, so there was a 21% reduction in composite entry point this of TB death or heart failure. Uh, Emperor Preserve demonstrated consistent and meaningful benefit with empagrophism across all previous five species of group. That means across male or female or regions of North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia. So there was a huge number of patients, that was 6,000 number of patients, which was followed up for 21 months is a, is a, a very 
meaningful and of course statistically significant study. Uh, this preserve demonstrate consistent meaningful benefit with all three specified patient groups and history of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, uh, no or yes, despite that there was significant reduction. Uh, this is again the same thing, 27% rejection in the first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization by 27% by confirmatory secondary endpoint. If you see the secondary endpoint, the second or recurrent hospitalization was reduced by 27%, which is again a statistically significant as far as uh, preserved heart failure patients concerned. So MPAR protected the kidney by significantly slowing the decline in kidney functions, although I have to skip this slide, it's not a topic, but still I want to tell you that not only that, they also had protected the kidney by slowly, significantly slowing the decline in kidney functions. So overall causes of in Emperor Preserve trial, overall causes of death was cardiovascular death, sudden cardiac death, heart failure, stroke, and undetermined cause of death. And non-cardiovascular was infection, malignancy, and gastrointestinal. So if you see, there was significant reduction in the mortality in overall sudden cardiac death. Uh, early and significant improvement in symptom improvement also was seen. Increased likelihood of improvement in NYHA class from week 12 onward. That means if you start the patient after three months, the patient will also start having symptom improvement. And this is irrespective of other treatment. This is just adjudicated to actually given for the SGLT2 inhibitor, especially MPA. So MPA preserved selected adverse events of interest, uh, hypotension, system and hyperacute renal failure. This was not significantly uh, uh, statistically significant. So coming on to the, uh, uh, the comparison with the other trials, with the other UCC, EMPA represents first therapy with conclusively proven benefits in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, regardless of type 2 diabetes malignant. This is important. And if you see this EMPA versus placebo CV death, heart failure, this was 21% disreduction. If you compare with Sacubitrin and Valsartan combination versus Valsartan alone, this was 13% reduction with Paragon heart failure. And if you see the spinal lecture versus placebo, 11%. If you see the RB sartan, which is the ACE, which is the ARB, or parenteroprene or candy sartan, they do not have that much of reduction in mortality. This is very intriguing. Yeah? Actually, that is why I would like to revise the slide, which I showed you. That was computer analysis, artificial intelligence related. How this molecule is helping the patient with heart failure with the digestion fraction by reversing 59% of protein alterations relevant to Artificial pathogenesis, cardiomyocyte oxidative stress, systemic inflammation, cardiomyocyte stiffness, extracellular backlist modeling, remodeling, and concentric hypertrophy. So these are the five factors which is reversed in the positive direction. That is why the overall emperor preserve, which is recently three months old data, has shown a much larger risk reduction compared to sacubitril and valsartan combination, which is Vimida. And other combinations, Paralacto and Saturn, which is ARP. So, why the salt is having more risk reduction and more mortality benefit is because of those artificial induced scripts. So, EMPA considers the lowest risk of CBT and heart failure patient across the spectrum of heart failure. If you see, I uh, just to compare, the emperor reduced, there was a data which from the emperor reduced, which is that means reduced means rejection fraction less than 40 percent. They found the risk reduction was a little higher in that group by, as compared to this one. So coming on to the last slide of my presentation, which is a CV death or hospitalization for heart failure, 59% risk reduction if the patient is a type 2 diabetes mellitus with no medium cardiovascular risk, type 2 diabetes mellitus with, with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease without MMI or stroke. This is 31%. What we are talking about is heart failure with preserved ejection friction with or without diabetes mellitus, which is emperor preserved, which is 21% risk reduction. And type 2 diabetes related with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with prior MI or stroke, EMPA reg outcome has shown 36%. So this is uh, this salt is causing SGLT inhibitor, especially EMPA glyphosate, is, is do, uh, giving a benefit across all the spectrum. So I think I have just in the last one minute, I'll tell you again this slide that type 2 diabetes related with low medium cardiovascular risk, phase 3 beta trial has shown. 59% risk reduction in overall mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization, while type 2 diabetes mellitus with, with atherosclerosis uh, cardiovascular disease without MI, that means unstable angina or stable angina or without MI or stroke, 31%. Type 2 diabetes mellitus with cardiovascular atherosclerosis CAD with prior MI or stroke, with prior MI, 36% reduction. And if you see, 
heart failure with preserved ejection picture pressure without with or without emperor preserve has shown 21% risk reduction and this heart failure with reduced ejection fraction this is 25% so the mortality benefit is there in both reduced as well as uh, with preserved ejection fraction but more in the patient maximum with the patients who do not have a cad but uh, overall there is a definite advantage of adding the salt uh, in uh, heart failure patients uh, with or without diabetes mellitus and this will be difficult uh, scenario because in a diabetic mellitus patient it is easy to add the salt in a non diabetic patients uh, Uh, whether we all the clinicians will be completely satisfied to add the salt in the overall armamentarium of the treatment for the heart failure or not will be a question to be answered by the panelists or the people but we have to see if we follow the, the, the data it will be useful to add the salt keeping watch because there's not for hypoglycemia can't to compensate the blood sugar level thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, important topic and uh, and uh, i am happy to be a part of csi west bengal thank you very much uh, thank you dr gupta that was an excellent presentation of sgt2 inhibitors uh, in the heart failure uh, there is an announcement i have to make the, that this particular session was sponsored by this particular session was sponsored by thank you so much sir thank you for the warm words of welcome and this opportunity to be a part of this august uh, gathering so i will uh, take about 10 minutes i hope uh, you enjoy the slides and uh, just give me two moments to start yes uh, so so i think we've been talking about the heart failure problem i think we've we've seen the slides already dr das as well as dr vivek they've already touched upon the fact that we understand it's a huge problem it's a huge burden not just in india but uh, globally and it is something that is responsible for almost 50% of our hospital admissions this is the inter chf data stratified by region and if you see that uh, uh, we are definitely leading at mortality is concerned as far as heart failure as well as cardiac death is concerned so that is something that is uh, to be concerned about and definitely china is better off If you look at data from the uh, Trivandrum Heart Failure Registry, which of course is one of the best registries available from India, which looks at Indian data, what is really very very surprising to look at is is this number out here, which means that at three years, most of our heart failure patients, uh, depending on the current standard of care that we are able to provide them with, forty four point eight percent patients have died. So, which means a huge amount of patients are actually transiting to advanced heart failure, and probably we are not able to. deliver advanced heart failure therapies or they are refractory to standard guideline directed medical therapy of course these are the common etiologies of heart failure of which in the uh, order of preference these are uh, the ones which are most commonly encountered as far as our clinical practice is concerned uh, i think we've spoken about therapeutic factors in stage a b c now of course there is the stage d heart failure where nothing really works where uh, as uh, dr mk das has already spoken about we've talked about mechanical circulatory support we've talked about inotropes we've talked about hospice but what we really need to talk about is what is end stage heart failure therapies and that includes or or the two options that we have in in india currently is uh, ventricular assist devices which are which tend to be extremely expensive and the other option which is generally more durable and is a gold standard of care is cardiac transplant of course you see these are the standards of care as far as guideline directed medical therapy is concerned we've looked at this slide very often and we understand what this drug does the important to note is that this drug is actually so beautiful that it has actually pulled quite a few of our patients off the transplant list uh so this is what's more important so we understand that uh, the idea of putting this picture across is to understand that heart failure starts as a mild benign disease then gradually develops decompensations and gradually ends up in end stage heart failure with pump failure 
So it is important to pick up patients who require advanced heart failure therapies early in order to have them counseled, in order to have them mentally prepared for advanced heart failure. History of cardiac transplant. So I won't bore you with that slide, but let's come to something more interesting. So this is the first heart transplant to put. Uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Christian Barnard at Grootshoot Hospital, South Africa. This is uh, subsequently after the transplant, he went off to US and this is in Face the Nation. He's with Adnan Kantrowitz. And if you see out here in this slide, it was first transplant was by Christian Barnard, followed by Adran Kantrowitz in 1967. Back-to-back -back transplants, one in December, one in January. And uh, so this, as I told you, important is to remember is this was 3rd December 1967. The first cardiac transplant, as most of us know, is the first successful cardiac transplant by Dr. P. Venugopal in Ames. But actually, the first cardiac transplant was the result of the efforts of one of the best Indian surgeons at that point of time, after whom actually the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery in KEM is named, is Dr. Prafulla Kumar Kumarsen. And after actually uh, doing 100 dog transplants at KEM, he decided to go ahead with the first cardiac transplant. And that was on 16 February 1968, barely two months after the first cardiac transplant done worldwide. So actually, the patient who underwent the first cardiac transplant was already hospitalized when Dr. Christian Barnard was actually preparing or doing his first transplant at a Gucciur Hospital in South Africa. Important fact, first donor was a 20-year-old uh, trained accident victim, a female. First recipient was a 27-year-old dilated cardiomyopathy in end-stage heart failure. He did a successful grafting. 15 minutes after bypass, the RV blows. It was vented and we lose the patient after three hours. Yeah. Second cardiac transplant, again by Dr. P. K. Sen. This is 13 September 1968. Remember, at that point of time, we did not have laws which uh, mandate for brain dead declaration. Hence, he had to do these uh, transplants on patients who were declared dead. So he actually had to wait for the patient to die on table. And then only he was able to actually put these patients on pump and actually harvest their hearts. Again, 25 years old, the difference in the second cardiac transplant was he used hydrocortisone as the immunosuppression because he was already doing a lot of studies on immunosuppression on the 100 dogs that he had prepped on. This patient surprisingly lasted 14 hours but was lost to anuria. Hence, they were known as the transplant buccaneers, the reason being. Buccaneers are mostly known as pirates but they're often known as reckless people. Important is this very interesting picture. I think this is archived in certain journals. And important to note is this person is Christian Barnard, and he actually convened a conference of one of the first few transplant surgeons to ever meet in South Africa. Then, of course, the man at the back, tall gentleman, is Denton Cooley. I'm sure you're aware of him. And this person is Prafulla Kumar Sen. So let's, let's celebrate it. This gentleman actually set India on its map for cardiac transplant. 28 years down the line, not a single transplant was done in India. So what are we looking at? You look at the heart transplant scenario in, in, uh, in USA. It starts off in 1982. Fairly much more neat, uh, naive programs. Start, this, these are the three tertials or rather three decades of cardiac transplant in the US. And you see that the mortality becomes better. So three-year survival rates have now increased to 90% depending on good immunosuppression. What changed in 1994? The Transplant of Human Organ Act comes into play. Legalization of the concept of brain death, something that is very, very important. And we have finally a framework for certifying brain death in place. That resulted in the first cardiac transplant, as we all know. This is by Dr. P. Venugopal. This was at All India Institute of, AIM, uh, of Medical Sciences, August 1994. Subsequently, the first transplant in private hospital was by Dr. K. M. Cherian. Very interesting to notice this patient out here, Mahmuda Bibi, is actually a Muslim uh, recipient. She was given a heart by a Hindu donor, Saundar Rajan, and uh, this was a Kerala Christian doctor. It exactly talks about the social fabric of our country and something that is extremely interesting. So 2008 was when we actually started out on the path of recurrent transplant, and this is known as the Hitendran effect. This was after the multiple organ harvesting aid network was established in China, in Chennai. This is more often known as the Mohan Foundation, which actually uh, spearheads most of our transplant work, counseling of all our social workers. And of course, it also resulted in the cadaver transplant program. So which is why you will see the rest is actually history. So if you look at the fallout of the Hitendran effect, this is uh, from Chennai. This is from Dr. Bala's uh, papers. 
And you will see from the year 2008 to 2018, both donors as well as heart transplants, they go hand in hand. So as organ donation became more and more popular, you had more and more cardiac transplants. And these are the annual transplant rates in, in Chennai beyond that. And this is heart transplants in, uh, in this is from AIMS. And so this was from 2014 to 2017. They have 25 transplants happening, but don't get carried away by these numbers yet. So if you look at the numbers and apply it, you will see that all of our transplant or rather a subscribing, um, a surprising majority actually happens south of uh, in the south of India. That is 95% of our transplants happen in India. The reason being these, these huge donor rates. So you see per million, per, uh, per million population, the donor rate in Tamil Nadu is 1.9, whereas West Bengal doesn't even feature on this list. And that is something that, that our government is actually trying to improve a lot. Of course, this is 2014 statistics. As far as I am concerned, uh, I think this has improved a lot and we are actually getting much more donors than before. What is important is survival estimates. So a lot of people, is that actually a durable option? Do people after cardiac transplants actually survive in India? So you look at the uh, best durable registry that we have, that is from Chennai, and you see the first five-year survival estimates are 68% and they are getting better. Of course, quality of life post-transplant is ex excellent. Important part to know is when to transplant. So, of course, we have the Intermax registry, which guide us as to how sick these patients are. So, it is important for patients who are crashing on inotropes or sliding on inotropes, that is one and two, are definitely not good uh, patients for transplant. But who are these ideal patients? So, the ideal patients are typically Intermax 3 plus or 4 plus patients who are actually capable. So, you will see that uh, similar on the kaplan meier estimate curves out here. The ones in black and red are actually the Intermax 1 and 2. And you see that their survival is very poor compared to Intermax 3+. plus. So the scenario in Kolkata, I'm happy to be a part of a program which actually has done uh, five transplants between three of our major hospitals located within the precinct of Calcutta. Since 2018, of course, these are rough estimates. I do not have original data. We've done 13 transplants. The government set up three, private set up about 10. Organ donations have really improved. Government-backed campaigns are very, very helpful. A short experience at NH, of course, this is one of our first transplants from 2018. She is now three years post-transplant doing very well. Only issue being that she's developed transplant mediated by uh, diabetes mellitus. These are other three transplants. This is from the NSH group of hospitals uh, spearheaded by uh, Dr. Devashis Das. And uh, they are also doing a very great job. And uh, we uh, co uh, collaborate a lot on all of our programs. Of course, uh, it is essential that when we have such a, a kind of a program, it is important to have a huge team in the hospital. So this is the Institute Heart Team. We have a huge team which includes five cardiothoracic surgeons, four cardiologists, four cardiac anesthetists, and a multidisciplinary <laughs> team which meets every Tuesday at 8.30. <laughs> Uh, what what is holding us back is actually the poor awareness. We have some social bottlenecks which we still need to get uh, uh, ahead of. We of course there's an issue with cost, which means a lot of transplants are not covered by insurance. It is important that state back programs actually cover transplants. Of course, there's an issue about uh, continued immunosuppression post transplant, which is tends to be expensive, and of course post cardiac transplant immunosuppression monitoring for which we need to have regional labs of excellence. So what is the take-home message? We need to increase awareness about organ donations. Hospitals have mechanisms to certify brain dead. Trust me, it is, it is not as easy as said and done. Of course, it is something that needs to be practiced, something that needs to be uh, professed and done on a regular basis. We need a lot of coordination between our national, state, regional, and uh, organ transplant authorities. Uh, we need to bring transplant funding under the umbrella of insurance companies, set up state-of-the-art regional labs for processing and making investigations and immunological workup affordable. And of course, lastly, it is important that to all my clinician friends is that you need to identify these patients early. Remember, patients who are sinking, who are very sick, are actually very poor candidates for transplant. Only those patients who have actually come out and are stable actually do well after a cardiac transplant. Thank you so much. That was, that was an excellent lecture, Dr. Kukar. Thank this, you, sir. This session of heart failure comes to a close. But please don't deviate um, to all the delegates who are now coming up with a very important session of a presidential complaint. The presidential oration will be given by Dr. A. L. Dato, our president of Bengal 
chapter of the academic associate of India and chairpersons will be Dr. P.K. Dev, Dr. Ashok Kaur and Dr. Mantas Panja. Huh. Uh, Am I audible and visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Paja, you are visible or audible. Visible. Yeah. इसमें <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, previous week was uh, shown, sir. Your PPT was uh, visible. Can you kindly share it again? Yeah, now yes, sir. Visible now. Visible now. Please continue. Okay. Yeah. Is it all, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes, sir. You're audible. Yes. So, the doctor, welcome to the afternoon. And it is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Dutta. He is a past president, Cardiological Society of India, and current president, Cardiological Society, West Bengal branch. He is a dynamic interventional cardiology, and he has a special interest in clinical cardiology as well. So, I think he is the right man to talk on the subject of management of hypertension journey down the memory. So, Dr. Dr. Please, Dr. Kaur with me. Okay. And as well as the Dr. Dash. Das. Dr. Minal Das and Dr. Ashok Kaur. Okay. Please Thank join you very us. much. This respected chairperson, Dr. Mantas Palya, Dr. M.K. Das, and Dr. Kaur. <clears throat> and I thank the scientific committee for being. So, when in the subject, and also to overcome So little bit of technical hitch, the uh, inter internet got disconnected. That's why you are getting a sort of uh, this thing, the, the interruption in the program.
coming back to the subject i once again thank dr panja dr kaur and with their permission i am starting my deliberations okay you are welcome management of hypertension journey down the memory lane we have been treating hypertensive patients for a long time and it has undergone several almost radical changes both in terms of treatment as well as in terms of definition in terms of reaching the target sir uh, slides are not moving sir if you can kindly click on the slide and oh, yeah moving yeah okay yeah so you would be surprised to know we were back in 1974 not very much in the past picking the leading cardiovascular physician at that time was of the opinion that nothing like hypertension exists it is just a in any a given population arterial pressure is a continuous variation of shows and an uniform distribution so it is a variation according to age and structure of the person there is nothing called hypertension and roosevelt you remember when he was 54 years in 1937 He was detected to have a BP 162 by 98. According to that old concept of that time, he was not treated. Three years later, he was BP was found to be 180 over 84. Again, not considered to be high blood pressure. It was not treated. He fell ill soon. After G. Bruen, his physicians went to check him and found over his neck and chest a pulse. vibrations at what finding he thought it is to be a congestive heart failure the patient had pulmonary edema in addition to reducing alcohol and cigarettes he was reduced to 4 hours of bed rest only that patient remained 180 to 230 over 110 by 140 no treatment given because the treatment concept was not very much popular or effective at that time <clears throat> sympathectomy is all the only effective blood pressure lowering drug or blood pressure lowering agent or for that matter method was not done blood pressure remained 180 to 30 over 110 and 40 rudwell died in 1945 at the age of 60 and obviously because of cerebral hemorrhage debate continued about the benefit of antihypertensive even following the results of first vision administration guideline The first JNC one, 1977, not made it in the past, suggested that no treatment for hypertension unless the diastolic blood pressure is more than 105 or above 105. At this point of time, most of the physicians and cardiologists was of the opinion that diastolic blood pressure is the only pressure which is harmful, and if we are to treat the patients, we must target the blood diastolic blood pressure. accordingly the historical milestone was that 1940 mild benign hypertension is called when systolic is less than 200 and diastolic less than 100 no antihypertensive drug recommended 1948 bp is considered to be raised when systolic blood pressure is 180 and diastolic 110 look at the diastolic blood pressure stress is only every time when it is more than 100 or 110 not nothing beyond that nothing before that in presence of clinical radiological and cardiac of it that means end organ damage for the change students our heart am i audible Yes, yes. 
Borderline hypertension is known as 140 over 90. Definite hypertension 160 over 95. And then stages were made on the basis of diastolic blood pressure. Mild 95 to 104. Moderate 105 to 114. Severe hypertension is more than 115 diastolic blood pressure. From 1980 onwards, the two important facts emerged. And these two important facts was very much of great need, was the force behind uh, considering ourselves that the solution is not taking blood pressure this way and that way. Hypertension should be defined as 140 over 90 by large consensus opinion. And systolic blood pressure is now considered more important than diastolic blood pressure. And predicted end organ damage, including coronary artery, is because of that. So these two important facts emerged and changed the entire scenario of importance and treatment of blood pressure. If you look at the hypertension burden in India, we find that only 33% Only 33% patients and 25% of rural Indians are hypertensive. About 33 and 25. This is the two areas, urban and rural are hypertensive. And only one by 10 of rural and one by five, that means 10% or 20% of urban and rural populations have their blood pressure under control. That means rest of them, 60 to 70 or 70 to 80, it didn't have any control of blood pressure. The incidence was about 25% in rural and 38% in urban area. That is when, that is in 2014, after getting treatment quite for some time, even then our concept was slightly different and that so many people who remain in the danger zone. If we look at a global scenario, it is not very much different from Indians. It is a leading cause of death, severe death, more than 1.28 billion suffering from hypertension at the age of 30 to 70 years. 42 persons are diagnosed and treated. That means 60, 58 persons are not diagnosed. Only one, 21 persons have blood pressure control. So by and large, both Bal and Indian scenario point out that the blood pressure control ratio number is around 15 to 20 percent, not beyond that. So that brought us to the situation. How do we go for the effective blood pressure control? Effective blood pressure control is a big family. You cannot consider a blood pressure effectively treated unless you know what is blood pressure by definition at that point of time when treating, what is the blood pressure target, what is the therapeutic lifestyle changes, how does it affect or help, and then therapeutic pharmacological approach. So you have to keep into mind all these factors in ready when you are treating a patient of blood pressure and if you want to bring the blood pressure down to the normal level. Now look at this. I'm not going to details about the guideline difference, but basic of two differences is that ESC by definition 140 to 90 blood pressure high, SEC by definition 130 to 80 blood pressure high, but treatment target is same. Your objective would be to bring the blood pressure down to below 130 and 80. So that is, this is the common factor between the two guidelines, although there is slight difference in terms of definition of the guideline. India is under a long stretch of escalating incidence of hypertension mediated disease, which is battering and destroying the health of its citizens. So hypertension remains very much a problem for us. Therapeutic pharmacological approach. Now, if you look at the pharmacological approach, we know about the body lifestyle modifications and other things. Beyond that, when you are coming for the drug treatment, initially, the people used to go for what is known as step-up approach. Different monotherapies and their increasing doses, substitute one with another monotherapy. If one monotherapy is not working, substitute it with other monotherapy. Substitute it, that means replace it after reaching the minimum, maximum increasing dose. This approach of treatment resulted in various side effects because one particular drug we are increasing the dose, increasing the dose, increasing the dose to the maximum, but you are not adding any, anything. Only when the maximum dose is not working, you go for another monotherapy. And again, you just increase the doses. The result is side effects more, efficacy poor. Then came JNC3. They call what is known as step care approach. 
initial treatment with one monotherapy and you sequentially add another monotherapy onto that drug, not just stopping the monotherapy first one and doing the second monotherapy with the second drug. You are just adding drug of another antihypertensive sequentially. That is step care approach. Now, this monotherapy was not enough in controlling the blood pressure. You can see the Buckley's et al. from America, USA, um, Association of Hypertension, US trial, Covins trial, al trials, IDNT, DINAL trials, UKPDS trial, ABCD trial, all these trials had shown that there should there is at least two tablets is needed to bring the blood pressure control, maybe two to three tablets in many of the cases, more than two tablets, in some cases even more than three tablets. The number of tablets required to keep the blood pressure control was studied to be two to three or two to four. Again, that brought us to the question that if the one drug is not working, increasing the dose or giving so many drugs at a time, what do I choose? Obviously, my choice would be to giving so many drugs, three or four drugs, because if we give number of drugs, then we don't use one particular drug to the highest level or high doses. So there is, in the end, treatment is quite effective and side effect is less. But how do we increase the adherence? It has been shown that in the case of patient asked to take three pills, the adherence is only 40%. When a patient is taking two pills, the adherence is about 20%. And when the patient is taking one pill, adherence is less than 10%. And this is important because even by going the modern treatment, our achievement of blood pressure control is only 35% as studied by pure cellimuso. The other four factors which are responsible for increased drug adherence or drug compliance are logistics. Number of pills more, the adherence is poor. Cost, if it is costly, then adherence is poor. Efficacy of treatment, obviously, if you are not giving good combinations or not going to the high dose, efficacy also becomes poor and side effects increases. So what do we actually need? If you one first two factors are more important. If you ask a patient to take not three or four medications, but one or two, he or she will accept it and do that. Again, if the cost is less, they will continue with the medications. If these are not taken care of, we cannot treat a patient indefinitely with antihypertensive drugs. At some point or others, he or she will give it up. So we must look at these particular points to see that whether drug adherence or compliance is okay or not. Just to give you an example about Combination therapy. If we use that three or four drugs in one single pill, then not only the efficacy, when side effectless, and obviously patients' adherence and compliance is good. Say for dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, it reduces BP significantly, it reduces central aortic pressure quite significantly, it reduces blood pressure variability. These are known facts. But if you increase the dose or if you just give a moderate amount of dose also, pedal edema is there, negative point. It stimulates even RAS system and heart rate is increased. Now, if you add calcium tunnel blocker with AC inhibitors or ARV, pedal edema is less, RAS activity is reduced. And if there is a beta blocker added, heart rate is also taken care of. So this is just to give an example of how multiple drugs can be applied to a patient with hypertension. Each of them will take care of one particular frontier, and finally the result will be much more increased adherence or compliance. On the basis of this, before ESC 2019, the Indian guideline of hypertension was more or less like this. But the younger patients start with um, SEOARB, but the older patients above say 55 start with calcium channel blocker or diuretics. And then you can add one with another or increase the dose, and finally you can add all the three drugs together. The ESC guideline says, again, which we are now following, one pill combination therapy. Combination therapy under one roof. AC or ARB plus CCB or diuretics for initial therapy, 
but at this point of time, we should remember that consider monotherapy in low risk grade one hypertensive patients who is very old and frail. So for patients who is not having very high pressure, who is aged and frail in structure, probably on the first point of time, we will not go for dual, dual drugs. Let's see, we try to treat the patient with monotherapy. Step two, if the blood pressure is not controlled, then you add three. SERB plus CCB or diuretics. And finally, you can add mineralocorticoid receptor blocker MRA along with these drugs. Other drugs that can be added are alpha blocker, beta blocker, or other diuretics. Consider beta blocker at any time treatment step when there is specific indication for that use, not because of blood pressure lowering effect only. You can use beta blocker if the patient is in heart failure, if the patient has angina, post MI, atrial fibrillation, or younger women planning for childbearing or pregnancy. Hypertension with coronary artery disease. Again, the combination are the same. We are using instead of ARB, CCB, and diuretics first, we are using ARB plus beta blocker or CCB, also, or CCB plus diuretics or beta blocker. So, beta blocker is coming up is the first choice in the presence of coronary artery disease, whether it is present angina or past MI. The rest of the guidelines are the same. So this is about hypertension and chronic kidney disease. You'll be surprised to know that if there is not hyperkalemia, if there is no rise of creatinine gradually and gradually, then even in early stage of CKD, we can use ARB or SCR and then calcium channel blocker or diuretics as before. For reduced ejection fraction, the same things, except the diuretics should be loose, loose, loop diuretics. Because if the EGFR is less than 30, loop diuretics or torsimide works better. Thiazide type of diuretic doesn't work at this stage. Or you can use indivamide also. Step two, again, you just combine all them together, but take care of to look for serum potassium level very carefully and frequently. This is the guideline for atrial fibrillation. Again, there is stress on beta blockers. So we find that in the current scenario, ESC 2018, even SEC 2017, and Indian Guide Data Hypertension 2019, all are of the opinion that if we combine antihypertensive drug together under one roof, they will have a better efficacy, less side effects. They will have better compliance and adherence because the number needed is one or two tablets, and cost is also within reach. At least cost is reduced, unlike when you are using separately drugs. So to sum up, ladies and gentlemen, it seems the world is thinking to the same. What I mean by that, before the 18 and 2018, 2019 guidelines came up and suggested combination therapy, Many of us are physicians who used to combine the drugs are beta blocker with calcium channel blocker to take care of tachycardia, calcium channel blocker with diuretics to take care of pedal edema, or AC or ARB taking care of calcium channel blockers. Similarly, all these combinations were being used. Although we did not have enough document to justify this use, but we had used it because of, we found this type of medication combination is beneficial to the patient in terms of reducing blood pressure as well as in terms of increasing the compliance. Much before the guidelines for combination therapy came into being, combination therapy for blood pressure treatment was practiced by the Indian physicians because of better efficacy, adherence, and compliance. But at the same time, we should remember, that along with the BP control, therapeutic lifestyle changes and cardiovascular risk factors should be addressed as well. These are equally important to get the maximum benefit or fight the CV button effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Doctor, for excellent presentation. Uh, just I request Dr. Das or Dr. Ashokar final comment on these lectures, though there are no questions on the presidential oration, they can give comment on the subject. Dr. Das or Dr. Ashokar. Dr. Khadis, there? Dr. Kaur? You're not there. Okay, you can 
comment okay. anything if he is not there then just uh, i would uh, like to offer my heartfelt thanks to uh, do, uh, dr anjanla datta who is a erudite lecturer and in fact uh, i have been listening to his lecture since 1987 88 and uh, he has been a master in the uh, in the field of uh, resistant hypertension and he has uh, described a flow sheet of the treatment of hypertension in a, in a very very lucid way and thank you dr anjalal datta but what uh, i would like to emphasize that single pill therapy is the mainstay of mainstay of uh, therapy in hypertension because of the fact that uh, it uh, not only increases the compliance and adherence but also reduces the chance of failure of therapy and failure of tra- take uh, failure of uh, taking uh, uh, the medicines and uh, we we know many stories about this that how the patients fail how the clinicians fail but a single pill ultimately uh, will be the will be the uh, future of management of hypertension with this few lines i uh, give back uh, the phone to uh, dr m panja please so thank you very much dr dr for excellent presentation and brilliant exposition exposition of work in the field of hypertension only preventive aspect you see in the the western countries and the people are aware of 70% of people are aware of the hypertension what is hypertension what is the treatment what are the complex hyper they know is but in our country some study from jaipur and this among the uh, particularly bombay and delhi this shows the only 20 to 30% of people just reverse of the western country they are aware of the hypertension and is consequent that is the very important issue so once again i thanks thank dr dotta for excellent presentation thank you very much so uh, our next uh, dr dr mulinder mehta lorenson okay we'll proceed to the next next subject Mojundar, a very senior member of CSI, and two sons, one of them Dr. Alok Mojundar, an active CSI member, cardiologist of Bihar Singh Hospital, Eastern Railway, Kolkata. She was associated with many social and spiritual activities. She was an active member of the Red Cross Society of India. is dr ashok dhar and the chief person for the session dr or uh, dr a dr ks fanad dr ms mojundar the topic is intervention beyond the coronary may now for sir take over the session how is breaking down dr subhash sir kindly can you change your device sir there is a lot of disturbance from your device yeah bring it down of the sound Hello, am I yeah, audible? Kind, yeah, you're audible, sir. But with a lot of disturbance, uh, kindly change the device. You can join to another device. You can join with another device. Hi. Okay. So let the session begin. I will be joining by the next. Sure, session. sure, sure, sure. What are you talking about? Bar bar washroom? What is it? Doesn't happen. It's Chaluk, sir. Chaluk's voice doesn't happen. Tell us. People say that you change the channel. Sir, what happened? क्या टेक्निक डिफिकल्टीज हो रहा है ये प्रोजेक्ट में 
सर उनका टेक सपोर्ट उन्होंने ऑन किया है आपका वॉइस वही पे चल रहा है सर उन्होंने उनका वॉइस जब हमारे पास ठीक नहीं आ गया उसके लिए कि उन्होंने पे कंप्यूटर दाई यहां कर दाई कभी रिस्पोंस म्यूट करके म्यूट करके म्यूट स्क्रीन सर हेलो हेलो एम आई ऑडिट थिंक डॉक्टर दत्तो यू कैन टेक द चेयर एंड स्टार्ट द मीटिंग because we are running short of time no yeah in the meantime yeah. ashokta you start uh, start sharing your screen it will it will take some more time yes over to dr datta please yes thank you good evening it's so nice and exciting moment for me personally to have dr ashok dhar present his presentation in front of me he has been presenting so many stories experiments very valuable paper in the international journals and performing interventional cardiology as one of the leaders in in the, in the country today he was one of the few who was responsible for bringing up interventional cardiology to the present level started his area from delhi and then it is good for us that he came down and settled in own back place kolkata he is one of the pioneers gunji club member he is now practicing more non coronary interventions and that is even more exciting for us so because of the time constraint i cannot talk about him for a longer because if i want to talk about ashok dhar the time will not stop anywhere thank you very much dr ashok please start your presentations thank you very much anjun my ex room at we lived uh, <laughs> medical college hostel in the same room for many years well i'm uh, grateful to the cardiological society of india west bengal for giving me the possibility of speaking oh, sir can you please can you be a little bit louder yeah <laughs> okay for juti ka mojumdar memorial oration thank you very much and so today uh, it is as i am uh, known for my work that is in the intervention and today we i would like to present uh, on non coronary that is in the other vessels the procedure they have taken two three important cases and i i would like to start with safe intervention starts with safe percutaneous entry into vascular system it can be different from different areas it can be from femoral it can be from radial it can be from axillary artery brachial artery 
popliteal artery, even posterior tibial arteries. You can take your entry from these places. Femoral and radial entries are most popular for coronary today. But beyond coronaries, when you have to go to the carotid or to the uh, mesenteric and other places, there you, uh, you may have to take different uh, uh, point of entry. So angioplasty with or without stenting are performed in vascular system of limbs, abdominal aorta, carotid, mesenteric, and vertebral arteries. When an artery bleeds, we need to stop it by embolization and by placing a stent graft at the site of bleeding. We have some other mode of intervention where we combine thrombolysis and dilatation to restore the lumen and reconstruction of AV fistula for patients of chronic renal failure. Now, critical stenosis of arteriovenous fistula reconstructed by PTA followed by treatment of drug-eluting stent or drug-eluting balloon. We are performing this since last two years and so far performed. Till yesterday, it was the 49th case and 49 cases still of, uh, actually till yesterday that we died, uh, did. So coming to the, what we do really. This is the first, on the left to right. First, you can see the severe stenosis of the venous arm of the AV fistula. And we, go, we have specially manufactured guiding catheter. This is 125 centimeters long, which can, with which I can reach from the femoral up to the radial artery after crossing the, uh, the subclavian and brachial artery. And there we cross it with a guide, coronary guide wire. The, you can see the second uh, picture. We start with the coronary guide wire and the balloon dilatation, typical denting in the middle. And after balloon dilatation, we after opening the thing, we come to the third. Here you can see the a much longer balloon that is the drug eluting balloon and dilate it with the drug eluting balloon. And last one is the uh, picture for AV, uh, I mean, after the uh, final dilatation and uh, the restoring the circulation. In another case, we can see here, initially when we started, we started with placing with drug eluting coronary balloon. Size is more almost same of the radial artery. And, uh, and placing stent. First, after crossing it with the guide, coronary guide wire, the balloon dilatation is uh, being done, performed. Yes, it has opened now. Now we are placing stent. It is a drug eluting coronary stent. It, it is a long segment stenosis, so we needed a second stent. And this is after the stent placement. It is an excellent flow, as you can see. And the venous side, we can see that the flow is going up to the subclavian vein without any problem. Shabda, could you be a bit louder? Yeah, I, I, I am very much near the machine. <clears throat> Next is the, I would like to give, show you another case, a thrombolite, thrombo, uh, thrombosis, thrombotic occlusion. And uh, it is on the left subclavian artery. This patient had an implant injury. 
and after the blunt injury, he just developed a complete occlusion of the left subclavian artery, followed by nullifying the arterial circulation of the arm totally. When we do the uh, first angio, you can see very nicely the, the subclavian artery filled with thrombi. One, two, three thrombi. And the circulation again stops at the brachial artery, axillary artery. We go for the further work to cross the lesion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we are through. First, after placing the back, back up from the diagnostic catheter or guiding catheter, and you cross the lesion. After crossing the lesion, I have placed the guide wear into the brachial artery. I cannot go beyond that. That means beyond this, again, for there are further uh, uh, thrombi, and my guide wear is not allowed to traverse further. So, we, uh, we first did again a dilatation of the, uh, of the subclavian artery that we have already crossed. But it is still loaded with thrombi. And below this, in the axillary artery and the brachial artery, we can reach here up to the lower part of the uh, brachial artery. But nothing more than that. We discussed how to go ahead. Okay, let us, it is a case five days old. So you are not very sure whether thrombolytic therapy will function. But even then, we had to try with this, with the tenectopis uh, infusion inside the artery over 24 hours. This is after 24 hours. You can see now today, we can see the thrombi in the brachial, uh, in the radial and ulnar arteries. Then we decided to continue for further 24 hours. That means 48 hours. Sorry. Yeah. And here we can see the flow in the brachial artery is complete and it is also coming faintly here in the uh, radial and ulnar artery. So this is the sec second 24 hours, that is, that means 48 hours to, uh, injection of tenectopolis. This is after 48 hours, the radial artery is open nicely and we can see the arch feeling of the arch and retrograde feeling of the ulnar And today we see that the subclavian artery is more or less clean. Some thrombi are there. So we decided to place a stent there, self-expanding stent, peripheral stent. And thus, the whole circulation is restored and the pulse, the radial voice pulse is not audible. Pardon? Oh. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Very, very <laughs> low volume. Now we can hear you, sir. Okay. So now we can see the subclavian artery and the flow down up to the radial artery, including the internal mammary artery. That is not occluded. He is a young man. If the surgeon needs his internal mammary artery later, he can take it and do it. So this is how the circulation in the uh, left arm is restored and the patient would be discharged. Now, I am coming with another point, that is with the uh, with the AV fistula uh, working. It is the Parma Parma cap. We know Parma cap used for dialysis is a helpful but a short-term solution. 
when the AV fistula is getting matured for dialysis or being reconstructed by intervention technique. One may never take it for long-term use. It is very much prone to help creating thrombosis of the superior vena cava or brachiocephalic vein or subclavian vein, thus obstructing return of blood from upper part of the body. We get up, we get up to half a dozen sometimes in a month, these types of these patients who come for its solution. If they are not sent early, it becomes very difficult or fail to restore the circulation by recanalization and angioplasty. I'd just like to show you one um, example and warn you not to uh, use this palma cap for a very long time. You can see the first picture on the left side, the, it is a, a severely stenosed uh, uh, brachiocephalic vein through which you have crossed the guide wire. Next second is the one is the, uh, uh, the dilatation with balloon at the lower pressure, the denting is there. Now the higher pressure balloon dilatation and the fourth one, the last one is the, the restoration of restoring the uh, lumen and flow of uh, venous flow from upper part of the body. Subtotally occluded brachiocephalic vein following thrombosis indulged by palm cap for too long and lack of care for using for too long and lack of care. Tightly stenosed segment requiring high pressure balloon to restore the lumen. And satisfactory result is to restore the circulation and mobilize and normalizing the venous return. Reconstruction of stenosed AV fistula technique is now modified. In October 2018, we started reconstruction of stenosed or occluded arteriovenous fistula by balloon angioplasty, followed by implantation of drug eluting coronary stent with the aim of long-term patency, sorry, the spelling mistake. First 39 cases performed successfully with satisfactory patency in the follow-up. However, invasion of corona, that means our COVID infection, that disrupted the procedure and follow-up. We have started the technique using drug eluting balloon instead of using stent, thus avoiding presence of foreign metal body, which may cause fracture and instant stenosis. This could be possible with easy availability of drug eluting balloon at a reasonable price now. Documented here, 99% stenosed venous arm of the AVF. Mostly affected is the venous arm. Arterial arm is not affected so much, disrupting the dialysis. Initial dilatation of stenosis segment dilatation with drug eluting balloon and restoration of lumen of whole, uh, instead, uh, the whole disease segment with excellent flow. Dialysis could be started in the next 24 hours using AVF when uh, we uh, use this drug eluting balloon, but we may have to wait for seven days when we uh, use drug eluting stent. I believe this was my short information about the thing that we are doing at our institute at the uh, at Fortis Hospital, cat lab team, and this drug eluting, uh, this AV fistula, uh, we are doing with the help association of the nephrology department. So that is a nephrocardio work. And I'm again, convey my gratitude, convey my uh, many, many thanks for allowing me to speak in front of this highly educated and very senior audience of uh, Cardiological Society of India, Bengal branch. Thank you very much.
थैंक यू सर सो आवर नेक्स्ट सेशन डॉक्टर सुशीला बाला कुंडू मेमोरियल ओरेशन एंड टेक्निकल टीम आई टेक्निकल टीम टू प्लीज प्ले द स्लाइड Mrs. Sushila Bala Kundu, the mother of Dr. S. C. Kundu, and uh, she had uh, passed away in August 1992 at the age of 80 years. And this lecture has been instituted by Dr. S. C. Kundu in the year 2000 and dedicated in memory of his mother. So, to speak, uh, the speaker of this session is Dr. Monotosh Paja, and the session will be chaired by Dr. A. L. Dutto, Dr. Kajol Ganguly. and dr sc kundu may i now hand over the session to the chair persons thank you uh thank you very much it is really great pleasure for me to introduce dr mantosh paja officially and formally dr paja has been doing intervention for quite some time when he was in the ssk hospital now in private sector is one of the excellent performer in terms of particular the coronary artery intervention dr professor paja as you all know is a very important famous person for us he was the president of the cardiological society of india and also of the api holding two post is not a matter of joke is tenacity focus attention and determination to perform has inspired a lot of young postgraduate students to go ahead without wasting any further time let me request dr panja to start his proceedings Hello. Uh, sir, kindly unmute, sir. Kindly unmute from your side. I just sent a request. I just sent a request. Kindly unmute. Now is okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please okay, go. Thank you. So it is my proud privilege uh, to give the oration on the name of Sushila Bala Kundu, who is the mother of from Dr. Ishi Kundu. so for his memory this uh, oration is established i am very thankful to dr ishi kundu who is one of the uh, dynamic senior most cardiologist in west bengal next to professor mk chetri i my talk today is early detection and treatment of vulnerable plaque is it possible to prevent the card acute coronary syndrome so that question arise my talk on the divided the past i define the vulnerable plaque how will detect by by marker and then non invasive technique invasive technique and treatment like systemic treatment and local treatment then i can conclude ekuri phola hocche na ha chitra lorai korchhe ekhane okay ekhane to three forward hocche na just a moment hocche hocche Yes, sir. So you can click on slide. You can just click okay, on. Okay, I'm, I'm clicking. Double click, sir. Double click two times. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank okay. you very much. What is a plaque? Plaque is a combination of cholesterol, other fatty material, and calcium and blood component which stick to the wall, and it is a hard cell or scar covered the plaque. And here is the plaque. You see, the lumen is the uh the orange color and in just cap you see the thin cap here is the 
diameter, the particle uh, fibrous cap is very thin, less than 65 micron, which is infiltrated by the macrophages. By definition, is really is the uh, uh, thin fiber atheroma. And just inside, that is the lipid core, and there's some which contains some calcium and some uh, spotty calcium, and outside it in intima, some new vascularization is there, which coming from vesicosora. This is the, all about the plaque. But the of the vulnerable plaque is a term that represents the susceptibility of the plaque to ruptures. And then postmortem study is done when the underlying plaque morphology, which was first uh, ruptures and observed it is a thin cap fibroatheroma and superimposed thrombosis. Actually, ultimately, goal to identify the, the vulnerable plaque Ultimate goal for preventing the vulnerable plaque, thereby averting the marked infarction and sudden cardiac death, is the plaque is the inside the lipid core, within the uh, just outside the lumen and the fibrous cap here thick. Within these all these things, fibrous cap, intima, lipid within the intima, just outside intima, there is the media is there. Now the vulnerable plaque is a non-obstructive, silent lesion that suddenly become obstructive and symptomatic, leading to the marker infarction and sudden cardiac death. That is the patient is the vulnerable plaque, is nothing but, but the unsealed plaque. And the yellow color, the soft exudate, and covered by the thin vulnerable plaque, which is inflated by the monocyte, as well as the macrophages. Now, vulnerable plaque means future culprit plaque. What is culprit plaque? Plaque is responsible for the coronary occlusion and death. And basic things of culprit lesion is the rapture plaque is the 70% cases, stenotic plaque 20%, non-stenotic 50%, non-rapture 50%, erosion is there. Now the schematic diagram, again I want to show you that the thin cup, which infiltrate in monocyte, lymphocyte, monocyte, particularly macrophages inside the lipid core, and ultimately the intima uh, neogenesis, the new vascular budding of the new vessel coming from the, the neogenesis. Now, criteria for defining the vulnerable plaque, major criteria, the active inflammation must be there on the cap, monocyte, macrophages, sometimes T cell in the monocyte. Thin cap with the large lipid core, we already demonstrated. And endothelial, particularly in endothelium, sometimes become denudation, which is causing the erosion. And we addition to the and the platelet adhered to that uh, endothelium and plaque fissure and stenosis. Minor plaque means the superficial nodule, minor cardiac glistening yellow color, intra plaque hemorrhage, endothelial dysfunction, and positive outward remodeling. Now, how will detect the plaque? First is non invasive detection, a plasma, biocarb, biomarker of vulnerability, high sensitivity C reactive protein. Lipoprotein associated lip lipase, WC, interleukin 18, and in the tumor necrosis factors this is very important issue. Now, biomarker in and inflammation plaque formation. Plaque formation and related biomarker that means primary messenger inflammatory cytokines, that means interleukin 1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 6, interleukin 18. Sometimes the cellular molecules ICOM become selective and flux destabilization, particularly assessed by the matrix metalloproteinase and flux rupture, and sometimes acute phase reactant uh, is diagnosed by the high CRP and fibrinogen. Now, based on the fiber, what is the next thing, the optic. So, very important, the op we have to, the uh, important, you have to observe the flux, optic, Transmission of visible light come from the angioscopy. And angioscopy is very important that permit the visualization of the plaque. And when there is a white color, then means thick plaque. When light color, intermediate size of thin cap. But yellow color means is the thinner. And when there is a glistening yellow color, the thinnest cap, 10 to 20 microgram dash, glistening yellow color is a strong predictor of the thick. Uh, and that is a thin uh, cap hyperatheroma and we responsible acute coronary syndrome. And is the patients on the endoscopy 
and the glistening yellow color really is beautiful on the endoscopy and you can predict the vulnerable plant. Next thing, important finding for the other technique, the but the IFAS study. IFAS is very important. Uh, IFAS histology is important, then OCT and needs. And manual plaque on the IFAS study, that is the virtual histology study, that means remodeling, outward expansion of the arterial wall, that is remodeling. And lipid code can be detected, plaque rapture can be detected, sometimes spotty calcification in the IFAS. But but the OCT is very important for detection of the lipid core and the plaque ruptures, as well as thin fibers cap, and as well as the macrophage infiltration and new vascularization and spotty calcium. OCT is more important than the IFAS and needs definitely very important for detection of lipid core. Now, angiogram is every day we are doing the angiogram, that is nothing but the luminography. The multiple complex lesion in the angio shows. Nothing but the active systemic inflammation that produce numerous vulnerable plaque. When the complex lesion, 30 uh, microns, very thin plaque, vulnerable rupture, and C is the neovascularization. Again, D1 is the rupture of the plaque. Again, there is inviting E1, the three arrows there is nothing but the detection of macrophages. Now, needs very important. So, therefore, a need is the color coded chemogram is created. And here is the yellow color, the lipid core burden, very important diagnosis of the uh, annual plaque by the needs. Now, non-invasive technique, important that, you, that is the coronary, uh, particularly the coronary computed tomography, angiography. Here, very important, remodeling can be detected, lipid core can be detected, and the spotty calcium can be detected by the uh, particular coronary angiography OCT. Uh, sorry, coronary computer tomography angio. And again, only the inflammation detected by FDG fits. That is a fluorodeoxy glucose fits, very important for detection on the inflammation. And sodium fluoride also detected only one thing, the microcalcification. And MRI can detect the lipid cores and also interplaque hemorrhage. Now here is the patient after uh, CT angio. You see red color is lumen and high intensity, first A, the white color is calcium. Again, B1, you see, the, the, the uh, low attenuation is black color and circled by the green color, that is the lipid course, and surrounded by white, high intensity attenuation, that is the fibrous tissue, which is called napkin flat, very important. And C1, multiple lipid course, and D1, particularly the remodeling adverse, that is the uh, outward expansion of the arterial wall, that is positive remodeling can be diagnosed by the CT and you. Electron beam tomography is very important, is a quick and easy for detection of calcium imaging. And nowadays it is on evolution science, potential target for nuclear imaging, the, ang the angiogenesis, cell recruitment and patient metabolic activity, Thromogenicity can be detected where the platelet, glycoprene 2B3 inhibitor, collagen, and uh, the fibronectin can be detected, and proteolysis flux, destabilization, apoptosis, lipoprotein, oxidized LDL and LDL, it can there be important potential nuclear imaging. Now it is very helpful diagnosis of unknown flux. Now, anyhow, by so many methods there, using a combination, the morphological functional image can be done, IVAS, OCT, and Doppler study. Now, here is the important. Now, I'm going to the treatment part, the systemic treatment for vulnerable plaque, that is the statin. You see, we by statin reduce the, increase the fiber scap, the fiber scap thin, we give the statin. So, by OCT, you see, we can evaluate after statin that fiber scap become thickest. So, ultimately, major, major cardiac advance reduced. Azitimide is very important that assess by the IVAS. And here is the plug button is reduced by agitamide. And the fibrous cap thickness also increase. So in not raptures. And alericumab and ivalocumab, the PCSK9 inhibition and the IVAS derived plaque also reduced. And major cardiac events are reduced. And now anti-inflammatory drug, paraplatib, para very important. <coughs> they reduce the and the core, which can be guided by the IVAS. 
<coughs> methotrexate, important drug, and cogesin, also important drug, anti-inflammatory, and can as marriage implement drug, that reduce the major cardiac event. <coughs> Systemic therapy, invasive statin therapy, demonstrated significant reduction of coronary event in cases of the stable angina, which can diagnose with TNK and ideal trap and reduce the cardiovascular event in acute coronary syndrome. That is the proven TB2 trial, very important. And rosevastatin, very important. Absolute reduction of thermal volume is astral trial. And the hybrid demonstrated the plaque stabilization also. How does act the study? Improve the endothelial dependent vessel dilatation, stabilize the atherosomal plaque, particularly non respiratory abdominal plaque, reduction of inflammation, and prevents and slow the progression, regression, atherosclerotic lesion. Now, therefore, despite the improvement in output of animal plaque by systemic therapy, patients still become calm, recurrent by 22% cases in during the two years collapse. Therefore, to prove to be resistance, which is proved by the Proved trial. And research was going on regarding the newer potential target for systemic therapy, and that is particularly VCAM and lipoprotein and lipase, and ultimately the reverse cholesterol transport system is going work is going on. Local therapy defined as intravascular treatment of animal plaque with a pharmacological agent and physicochemical agent, with photodynamic therapy, endonumeral therapy, and cryotherapy, but it does require the randomized trial long run. But the role of angioplasty and stenting, plaque sealing for vernonic plaque, particularly intermediate lesion, very important. And stenting for no flow, limiting intermediate lesions, was the compared with medical therapy. Still speaking, the deferred trial, no significant difference whether it is stained or whether it is medical therapy. But in animal experiment, use of drug eluting stain in vanillin plug showed encouraging results, but needs to be proven by randomized trial. Now, therefore, regarding the important trial of the angioplasty, the prospect absorbed trial, and this trial is presented by TCT 2020 by uh, Grace Stone, it showed it is the futile, no advantage by this uh, ab uh, the absorbed BMS. And the PECTAS trial is very useful. And the, the whole the fibrous plaque assessed by the OCT only thin fibrous plaque and is treated by, again, it is a BBS absorbed, which compared to the medical therapy. The source, the all cause of motility, non vital MI, unplanned reverse collision due to one of follow up clinical improvement is there. Another the prevent trial is very important trial assessed by the whole plaque, assessed by the IVAS, needs, and OCT, and particularly. This is also again PCI by the BBS placement compared with the medical therapy. It is all advantage position and reduce the MI and reduce the unstable angina in future. Now, finally, so few trials that there is illuminant OCT trial which is compared to the uh, IVAS is only OCT may be used. And paradigm trial, we study the natural history of the plaque by the CT angio and easy trial. Unstable angina with high intensity statin provide a greater increased fiber scap, there is no doubt at all. And Odyssey trial, PCSKI, along with the statin, that is result a better maze free survival. SIDS trial, the methotroxate, you also prevent the future coronary event marked infarction. And Lodico trial, colchicin is already established, prevent the uh, treatment of plaque, prevent of the acute coronary syndrome. Cantor's trial showed the aniclicoma, 150 milligram. Compared to placebo, preventing the adverse cardiac event made after MI. The so final, ladies and gentlemen, invasive and non invasive modalities for early and accurate identification and prognosis value of vulnerable plaque. And these IVAS and OCT definitely needs very useful for detection of the vulnerable plaque. But not only that, for evaluation of therapeutic agents to reduce the vulnerable plaque, that can also assess. But non invasive modality is now it is very important for detection, treatment of the vulnerable plaque for the large and low risk population. Anyhow, the local treatment, prospect absorbed trial, vectors and prevent, and particularly prospect absorbed is futile and, and prevent, and vectors is with some encouraging result clinically by this absorbed trial. And finally, statin therapy induced plaque stabilization to reduce the cardiovascular event and acute coronary syndrome, anti inflammatory agent to reduce the cardiovascular outcome, particularly in MI, to prevent future acute coronary syndrome.
therefore ladies and gentlemen personality in men of cardiovascular disease particularly stable angina with vanilla flock both in is recurrent both inevitable and it is indispensable thank you very much for patient hearing <clears throat> thank you dr paja for your excellent detailed deliberation with valuable inputs in terms of plaque characteristics We discussed about both invasive and non-invasive thank you very much if any of co chairs want to ask any questions or comments you can be welcome to do that can i ask one question dr dutta you are dr paja will answer yes okay no problem doctor welcome uh, professor paja is a great man in our society and we know him for last 40 years so my question to dr paja as you have nicely described the diagnosis and management of the valvular plaque now we all know that in our hospitals majority we don't have the support of ivas or oct but still we are doing intervention in very critical situation as well so what is your take home message that and which are the coronary lesions where the intervention should not be performed without ivas or oct guidance so really still speaking when the case is non obstructive lesion and no flow limiting lesion and the stable coronary artery is definitely invasive non invasive thing we indicate particularly if day to day active with the low risk even large population at least we can do the cto that the coronary computed tomography is very very useful the finding i already mentioned so atheroma can be detected and the, and the expansion outer bulging that the positive remodeling can be detected calcium can be detected sometimes thrombus can be detected this is very that is routine we can do it if there is some manual particular when suspecting the manual plaque and your high risk factors associated risk factor diabetes hypertension and intermittent chest pain definitely ct and is very very useful detect the manual plaque prior to the hospital admission but do you perform the bifurcating lesion or very lm disease without oct or no definitely the- yes definitely particularly particularly lmca we have to use the ivas very very blood vessels very very important detect the ivas in particularly in the valvular plaque is the non obstructive lesion of the lmca that case is very useful ivas and and the oct not too much useful but in cases of bifurcated lesion the oct information diagnosis valvular plaque very important and oct is the gold standard because it detect the thinness of the cap it detect the macrophages within the plaque malleability it detect the 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 the, uh, the thrombus burden and three important finding was it more important than the IVAS? Yeah, thank you. OCT OCT is better to look for the sub intimal deep areas, but IVAS does not go that deep. Yes. Secondly, OCT cannot in osteal left main. OCT you cannot use that OCT in osteal left main because. it cannot give that sala in order and that is correct so oct is not too much uh, particularly in lemmen stem and ostm is not too much useful but the ivas is the ideal can be used for the lemmen stem our intention we have to detect the vanilla plaque if we detect 40 to 70% intermediate lesion you will give the stain 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 around the stain but is so many work in there i put with three important work the absorbed study prospect study it is total futile which presented at the 2020 tct by greystone mm-hmm. but the factor style and preventive mm-hmm. trial is very some information mm-hmm. prevent the sudden cardiac death mm-hmm. means is also encouraging but no when more question more, no more question please because it is a guest lecture and it is a uh, that is why i accepted one or two questions out of curiosity thank you very much dr paja thank you very much thank you indeed thank you sir that was a wonderful lecture so now we proceed to our next session that will be on imaging in cardiology for this session may i now request the chairpersons dr ak kor dr amol khan dr bikas bhattacharya and dr kn siddiqui to be on the screen the moderator for the session will be dr konok kumar mitra dr amit rai dr alok mojundar and dr lipika udikari the speak the, the speakers are dr devdatt bhattacharya dr subhajit das dr siddhartho mani dr somitra de and dr muha roy over to the chair persons Thank you.
शेयर कर दो उसको हेलो हेलो क्या मैडम यस हेलो यस मैडम योर ऑडिबल ओके नाउ लेट अस स्टार्ट द स्टेशन डॉक्टर देवदत्त भट्टाचार्य इज रिक्वेस्टेड टू शेयर हिज स्क्रीन प्लीज हेलो या Yes, I'm. 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 Sorry, sir. Yeah, sir. Um, visible, sir. Kindly switch to PPT. Okay. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. It is visible. Visible and even audible also. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Start. Okay. So my talk is on uh, which is better, OCT or IVAS? Is orange the new grey? So. you can see uh, an ivas image and an oct image side by side so the ivas image comes in gray and the oct is in orange so the question to answer is uh, orange the new gray uh, is oct better than ivas and should we replace uh, ivas as a modality by oct for intravascular coronary imaging so angiogram is uh, not the gold standard for pci optimization this is a little provocative uh, but if you look at it uh, in a cool rational way uh, you will agree uh, that uh, angiogram is just being a luminogram it has certain uh, limitations uh, especially in complex lesions for which uh, intravascular imaging uh, until now ivas was the optimal for pci guidance Uh, we are all also agreed that FFR is the best for assessing intermediate lesions. OCT, uh, which is a later uh, day intravascular imaging tool, it is best for lumen analysis, much better than IVAS because it has much better near field vision. IVAS and OCT both can be used for PCI optimization, and we'll talk on that. Uh, imaging uh, plays a vital role in complex angioplasty not maybe in routine angioplasty blood but complex and i will uh, maybe we can discuss at the end what we mean by really complex angioplasty there is clinical data that has repeatedly shown that uh, it helps in improving clinical outcomes and utilization of imaging in clinical scenario in india unfortunately is not that high it is less than 10% of total pci Uh, interpretation in the clinical setting is the major concern team time and cost are also major challenges and uh, there is a uh, lack of clarity on on what to use and where to use it so is ivas uh, and oct complementary to each other or are they competitors uh, so we are uh, looking at uh, vessel lumen and plaque imaging ivas has a lot of evidence oct is evolving guide to pci it is catching up uh, important to know the advantage of uh, advantages and limitations of both techniques rarely should we use both as routine it is very rare except in uh, during research clinical trials and exceptional cases if you look at the technology ivas you know uses ultrasound where oct uses infrared light waves and uh, the transducers are different the axial and longitudinal reconstruction is uh, possible in both uh, there is gray scale display in ivas and gray scale and golden scale in oct and the technical specifications i think <coughs> it is important to appreciate difference in resolution between oct and ivas so the resolution both axial and lateral resolution is uh, much better for oct uh, than ivas and the near field vision is better but the tissue penetration is better for ivas uh, than for oct uh, there is angio code registration available for oct there is uh, it is also available for ivas though in not all the varieties you need blood clearing in oct which you do not need in uh, ivas so you need contrast uh, mostly that is what is used to flush it in ivas you do not need a flushing uh, uh, device and that is important because it has bearing on renal function in complex angioplasty so the renal dysfunction is is a concern and if you have a triple vessel disease patient or a left main complex left main uh, bifurcation that you want to do uh, with a creatinine that is 
1.5 or over, then you should consider whether you should use IVAS instead of OCT because IVAS does not involve the use of contrast clearing. There is also a problem with aorto visualization for uh, OCT, uh, which is not a problem with uh, IVAS. Uh, the luminal vis visualization, however, OCT is much, much better than IVAS. Positive remodeling, on the other hand, is better picked up by IVAS. And 3D stenting enhancement and side branch crossing uh, OCT uh, is far, far better than IVAS. And uh, I'll show you some images based on that. An acquisition of image based on contrast injection, and uh, but on IVAS, there is nothing required. So there are various types of plug. You have been listening to uh, Dr. Paja's excellent deliberations, and uh, you saw what lipid-rich plug looked like, what was TIGFA. Uh, lipid-rich plug and TIGFA are better seen by OCT compared to IVAS. Uh, fibrotic plug, more or less the same, although OCT gives better near-field resolution. For calcific plug, and this is very, very important because uh, calcium is a major uh, problem uh, in angioplasty, and you need to understand uh, the thickness of the calcium, uh, the distribution of the calcium, the nature of the calcium. And here, uh, OCT uh, beats uh, IVAS by a big distance. Uh, for thrombus, again, OCT, if you want to visualize thrombus, OCT is a better tool than IVAS. Uh, if you are looking at uh, structures near to the lumen, if you want to measure the lumen area, if you look, want to look at dissection, and if you want to look at stent optimization, OCT is better than IVAS. But if you if you are looking at instant restenosis, thrombus, lesion cap thickness, neointimal coverage, again OCT is better than IVAS. But if you are doing a patient with a diffuse disease, if you are want to if you are wanting to look at plaque characteristics and plaque burden, then IVAS is better than OCT because it has a better tissue penetrability. These are the pullback modes. I'll uh, quickly go to the more interesting part. Uh, so before that, let's just look once more, revise what is the utility of imaging in PCI, in lesion, lesion location, plaque morphology characterization, lesion preparation, device selection, whether you want rotablator, cutting balloon, modified scoring balloon. Stent sizing and placement decisions, this is of utmost important. You do not want to undersize your stents and you do not want to place your stent in an area where there is a, a, a plug burden of greater than 50%, either proximally or distally, because we know that it involves worse outcomes. Then there are optimal approaches to bifurcation stenting and placement and apposition evaluations and post dilatation decisions. All these are important. And that is why uh, we need PCI for optimization of our angioplasty results. So this is uh, a simple image. Uh, on the left is uh, OCT, and you can see uh, the imaging catheter here. Uh, on the uh, inside, uh, what you see is the intima. Then this black rope against uh, this circular black rope is the media. And beyond, beyond this is the adventitia. If you go to the... Uh, uh, go to IVAS, you can see lumen, but you can see that the lumen is much better visualized uh, by OCT. And remember, the nearer structures are better visualized. This is the plaque, and you can see the you can see the uh, media as well, though not as well as here. But you must remember that when you are using the IVAS to actually look at the uh, look at the lumen, you have the facility of dynamic review, which gives you a better understanding of where the media is uh, than a still picture, which you do not have in uh, OCT. And in OCT, what you sometimes have a problem is if there is a big plug burden, you cannot trace the EEL all around. So plug burden calculation can be a problem with OCT, and it is easier to do with IVAS. This is calcium and fibrous plaque. Uh, you can see on this side, you can see this uh, calcium uh, calcific plaque here. But if you look at the OCT image, you can immediately see that what OCT shows you is actually the thickness of the calcium. Whereas in this case, you cannot see anything beyond this bright layer here. So this is a better tool. You, it is important to know the thickness of the calcium because the thicker it is, the more difficult it is to expand your stents. 
If you look at the fibrous layer on the right side and compare to the intravascular image, you can see again, a near, uh, near to the lumen, these structures, the definition is much, much better with OCT. Again, this is calcium, uh, lesion interpretation. And here you can see, as I showed you previously, OCT decidedly scores over IVAS. The full thickness, this is so important, the full thickness can be seen and the distribution, it can be seen. You, you know that there is calcium all around up to here, maybe also up to here, but you are not sure about the thickness and the, and the uh, tomographic location. So how much of the diameter is, uh, uh, how much of the circumference is uh, occupied uh, by uh, calcium is also better visualized by OCT. So what is the impact of calcium? It results in suboptimal stent expansion. It can uh, prevent you from delivering the device across a lesion. It increases complications and procedural times. So all sorts of complications can happen. And any operator who has done uh, more than a few hundred angioplasties would have faced this and uh, uh, regretted the absence of intravascular imaging uh, that would have guided him better. So identification of calcium OCT is far, far better than angio. We don't need to discuss that. I would like you to look at this uh, picture. Uh, again, this shows you, uh, in. You, you can see the depth of the calcium here. Uh, and you can see that there is a thick fibrotic cap beyond which there is calcium. Here you can see that there is a minimal to no fibrotic layer and depth of calcium is usually measurable. And here you can see nodular calcium. Uh, this is also of particular Im uh, importance because if you have nodular calcium, uh, there is uh, now a consensus that you should not be stenting these lesions and try, should be doing, trying to do something else, which we can discuss later. Again, uh, this is another calcific lesion where you can see the calcium thickness. So what is the impact of calcium? If the calcium score is greater than four, there is higher risk of stent uh, under expansion. Lesion preparation strategy is needed to facilitate block modification and calcium fracture before stenting. Use either intravascular lithotripsy or vital atherectomy or rotational atherectomy with or without cutting balloons. So the takeaways about uh, from calcium is that imaging is important. It guides you for lesion preparation and it also uh, helps you to understand whether you have optimized uh, your stent expansion at the end of the procedure. Lipidic plug, Dr. Panja has told you enough about li lipidic plug. Uh, there is this uh, appearance. Uh, these plugs are highly attenuated compared to calcium. They do not have that borders. If you have diffuse shadowy edges, there is high backscatter. Uh, on the surface and low backscatter deeper. So this is a, a very typical appearance of uh, lipidic plaque. And the problem with lipidic plaque uh, is here you can appreciate, and this is different from IVAS. I can trace you the uh, medial layer here uh, externally and where the lipid comes in, you are no, no longer able to trace it. So this is a problem uh, which is not discussed. Uh, you can uh, look at uh, near field structures, but if you have this difficult to trace uh, the media. Again, uh, this is a uh, uh, case where you can see that uh, there is this thrombus here. Uh, this is a, a thin cap fibroatheroma here. And you can see that there is uh, the poor uh, visibility beyond this uh, red thrombus. White thrombus, on the other hand, uh, you can uh, see beyond it, uh, and it is uh, different uh, from red thrombus. Dissections, uh, much, much better visualized. Anything near to the lumen, OCT will tell you much better uh, than intravascular ultrasound. Though all, although also in intravascular ultrasound, if you are experienced, you will be able to pick up dissections. What OCT does is it, it picks up much, much smaller dissections which you cannot pick up by intravascular ultrasound. And there is guidelines about what to do with these. Uh, this is post-PCI long-term. And if you are looking at a stent uh, after a long uh, duration of time, 
uh, it is different. Uh, OCT and IVAS are, is different because it, whether the struts are well covered or not, uh, you understand much better uh, with with OCT uh, compared with IVAS. Uh, and if whether there has been positive remodeling of the vessel, if you look at this longitudinal uh, uh, section of the vessel on both sides, you will see because the deep penetration of IVAS is much better. The positive remodeling comes up much better with IVAS compared to OCT. So OCT advantages versus IVAS is superior resolution. And the other thing is the speed. So OCT speed offers cath lab efficiencies versus IVAS. It has a uh, segment can be imaged uh, in less than three seconds. And it has a 3D reconstruction almost immediately. And for bifurcations, if you are looking where the, if you are wanting to see where the wire has crossed into the side branch through which strut, OCT beats IVAS every time. Uh, so these 3D reconstructions uh, and your understanding of where the wire crosses in a bifurcation, if you are having trouble dilating the side branch, you should be having, you should be using OCT. The IVAS guidelines are uh, for uh, LMCA are well known. Uh, so this is the Kang criteria, five, six, seven, eight, and uh, we should uh, all be knowing this. Uh, OCT uh, gu guidelines are not there for left men, but they follow uh, the CAN criteria. There are multiple trials. This is the CLI OPCI uh, key conclusions uh, comparison between OCT and angiography. And you can see death, cardiac death, and myocardial infarctions are lesser in the OCT group uh, compared to the angiographic group. Uh, it is marked on the top. The Illumian 3 result summary is this, that uh, the, if you use OCT, it results in significantly greater stent expansion than uh, angiography. It is comparable uh, to IVAS, uh, so far as stent expansion is concerned, and it is superior to IVAS at detecting certain predictors of major uh, adverse events like dissections and malappositions. So late instant new atherosclerosis is another area where OCT scores over IVAS because again the near field uh, the near field uh, definition is uh, so much better. I think I might be ending uh, coming to the end of my uh, time, so I'll just skip these slides quickly, and I would come to the conclusion: it is not about which imaging is best; it is about what to use and where. Aim is to increase the success rate and reduce the complications. To understand the advantages of and limitations of either OCT or IVAS, share our imaging knowledge with each other and reduce the imaging time. So in conclusion, there are some interventions where you should always be thinking of intravascular imaging. And I would uh, highlight calcified lesions, bifurcations, CTOs, left main PCI, and instant restenosis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, for your lucid and informative deliberation. Uh, because of the time constraint, we would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Shubhajit Das, who will be telling on CT coronary angiography mystify or demystify. Shubhajit Das, please. Dr. Shubhajit Das, unmute yourself. First, unmute yourself and then share your slide. Unmute yourself. Uh, sir, you can you can see uh, top. You yeah, can yeah. somewhere you can see uh, menu bar. You can unmute. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I, I'll be speaking on CT corner angiography, uh, mystify or demystify. So for the next few minutes, uh, let's see if I can remove the myths associated with CT corner angiography. So in uh, last 10 years, there has been a great revolution in the cardiac CT. 
it initially started with the dual source scanners and uh, it went on to the initially started with the 64 slice scanners it went on to the dual source ct scanners as a result there has been a very huge improvement in image quality and post processing now in today's market the dedicated uh, cardiac cts are the one which are the dual source or the 256 or the 320 slice scanners so why it is important because when you will be referring your outpatients to the facilities, you should be aware that which machines or which scanners uh, you are dealing with. So if you are looking for a dedicated cardiac CT, the first choice should be the dual source scanners or a higher slice uh, like the 256 or the 320 slice scanners. So as a result, uh, there we are able to achieve a very good quality scan even in patients with arrhythmia, uh, tachycardia or very poor breath hold. Now, this is how we started. Uh, it's a 16-slice scanner, a very degraded image of the RCC. Uh, moving on to the 64-slice scanners, where you can see a relatively good anatomy of the RCC and the latest generation uh, dual source or the higher slice thickness scanners, which, which, where you can see a very uh, high-resolution, crystal clear images of the RCC. Now, along with the improvement in the scanners, there also has been an improvement in the protocol of reporting. And we have come up with the cadrets. The cadrets is nothing but uh, it uh, quantifies the severity of the stenosis in the coronaries, ranging from zero to five. Anything less than two is a non obstructive disease, and uh, three, four, five are obstructive disease, depending upon the severity. Now, lately, the few modifiers has been added to the cadrets category, which includes the S for stents, uh, G for coronary artery bypass grafts, or the V, which is the most important vulnerable plague. Suppose uh, we have a patient with a stent in a lady and we see there's a 70% stenosis, we would write it as cadres 3 followed by S. Now I'll be discussing the next few slides will be on the vulnerable plague. The reason is very simple, that vulnerable plague in many studies has been associated with the adverse uh, cardiovascular outcome. Now, in CT, uh, there is something, there are three, four features which uh, suggest uh, if the plaque is vulnerable, like in this, you can see a very high potent plaque. Uh, the attenuation is usually less than 30, or you can see a ventricular remodeling as uh, the previous speakers were discussing. Uh, you can see that actually the luminal diameter is uh, increased in comparison uh, to the amount of stenosis. So this is ventricular remodeling. And this is the another the more important the napkin ring sign where we you can see that high potent score followed by a high potent outer layer. So uh, this uh, low attenuation plaque and these uh, napkin ring signs are very important features of vulnerable plaque, and they are usually associated with adverse outcomes. So this is one study in the American uh, Journal of, of Heart Association which studies the vulnerability of the plaques, and it is. What he says is quite uh, striking that in the absence of CAD, the uh, reported MACE rates are 0.6%, uh, which jumps to 14.9 or 15% in patients with vulnerable plaques in a four-year follow-up. So from 0.6% in patients with no CAD to 15% in patients with a vulnerable plaque. So this is again another study which uh, says that uh, vulnerable plaque is the new imaging risk factor. Uh, it has uh, like CDCA has emerged as the best non-invasive imaging modality in terms of lumen area and plaque composition. And it is also, its accuracy is also in detecting vulnerable plaque is also non-inferior to IVAS or even to OCT, fibrostin uh, atheroma in OCT. <clears throat> now CTCA versus CAG, uh, there are a lot of comparative studies which uh, studies the efficacy of CTCA in comparison to the coronary uh, angiography and all has to say one thing that uh, the CTCA has a very high sensitivity and the specificity and in comparison to the uh, selective cat NGO and one thing that is even more important is the negative uh, predictive value which is approaching almost 100% which implies that if we say that you don't have a coronary disease, that means you're 100% sure that the patient does not have a coronary disease. Uh, so these are just a, a case where you can see a discrete uh, subtotal plaque in the RCA uh, correlated with the 
uh, uh, cap and beautifully stented later. Now, <clears throat> there are a few of the studies which uh, compares the efficacy of CT coronary angiography with the uh, cath in therapeutic decision making in CAD, and they also had to say that uh, CTCA is a uh, is similar to cat cat angiogram in deciding or selection of revascularization strategy. Uh, this is another study which uh, in the European Heart Journal of Radiology, and it says that CTCA with ultra high resolution CT demonstrates an excellent correlation and agreement with ICA in quantification of uh, coronary artery stenosis. Now CTCA and high risk patient uh, high risk by High risk, I mean the imaging wise uh, high risk. Uh, those are the patient with uh, high atherosclerotic burden or stents. Now, this is very important for us because if you see all the studies in the uh, 2000 or the late 90s, they, they, at the end, they come up to the one conclusion that CT is inferior in patients with high atherosclerotic burden, CT is inferior in patients with stents, but not anymore as this is uh, not anymore as this is one uh, study in published in RSNA, which says that uh, ultra high resolution CT may be as effective, uh, it may be very effective in overcoming the limitation of conventional CT for accurately determining the coronary artery stenosis. Now, this is stent imaging. You can see the very patent stent in this patient and uh, some distal occlusion, distal to the stent, very nicely correlated with CAT. Again, the different patient where you can see the stent is totally thrombosed some strand fracture along with distal occlusion, uh, distal to the stent and nicely correlated with the cath image. Now CTC in stable chest pain patients. The updated NICE guidelines, that is the National Institute of Care, Healthcare and Excellence in UK says that cardiac CT should be the first line test for coronary artery diseases. Now, does every patient with a stable chest pain need a coronary CT? The, this million dollar question has been answered by the more recently concluded the Scott Heart trial, which was a large uh, randomized trial in Scotland. So what they did basically, they divided the entire group into entire uh, population into two groups, one group receiving the standard care alone uh, and other group receiving standard care along with CTCA. All the patient present, presented with chest pain, uh, maybe stable or non-specific chest pain. And uh, what the they had to, they found that that was very striking that uh, the cardiovascular death and non non fatal myocardial infarction the rate was reduced by 41 percent after five years in patient randomized to CTC. So this is a very uh, this is the most recently concluded uh, study which uh, puts CTCA as the gatekeeper of cardiac catheterization. Now, this is another study which says that CTCA leads to a greater uptake of preventive patient, uh, measures than usual care among patients with chest stable chest pain syndrome. So this is one algorithm you can apply to your patients in your uh, chest pain clinic. If you have an unstable chest pain, uh, you no need to go for a, a CT directly. You can go for a cat and take uh, measures. If it's a stable chest pain, you do a CTCA if you find out to be an obstructive plague, do the standard ischemia-guided intervention or stenting or whatever. If you find a non-obstructive plague, there is a role of enhanced use of medical pharmacotherapy, which definitely improves the cardiovascular outcomes. Now, I'll not be discussing much about CABG. It's uh, done for a long time. Uh, CT is seen, uh, used to see the patency of the graphs and also now is uh, done to do the CABG planning. The coronary, coronary artery calcium score, the, according to the current ESC guidelines, the coronary artery calcium scores is an indication for cardiovascular risk screening in asymptomatic low or intermediate risk population. So anything more than 40, there's increased chance of myocardial, sorry, 400, there's increased chance of myocardial ischemia. And anything more than uh, 400 to more than 1,000, there's a significant risk of cardiovascular events. Now, CTC in asymptomatic patients. This is the area of debate, and uh, as we all uh, have seen uh, about the incidence of uh, cardiovascular deaths or cardiovascular arrest in uh, asymptomatic healthy individuals, even in athletes. So this brings uh, the larger debate into questions that 
do we need to do a CT coronary angiogram in all asymptomatic patients? And if you have to wait, then what is the logical explanation? So the debate will still continue. So currently the ESC guidelines for asymptomatic patients are not very clear. According to the ESC guidelines, the CTCA in low risk non-diabetic population is not recommended, but it is recommended for risk assessment in asymptomatic population with peripheral vascular disease, CVA, multiple risk factors, or congenital heart disease. So if in asymptomatic patient, no risk factors, till now there is no recommendation to do a CTCA. In asymptomatic patient with risk factors, the CTCA should be done to rule out or establish CAD. Now, does uh, CTCA improve risk stratification? Uh, the answer, uh, there has been a lot of trials, like the CAP trial, which uh, the, which is the cardiac CT for assessment of pain and plague, the Crescent trial, or the most recently concluded uh, heart, uh, Scott Heart trial, which says that there's a direct evidence of CTCA uh, in reducing the risk of heart attacks in stable symptomatic patients. And these are a few of the studies which says that uh, the increased uh, prognostic value of uh, CTCA even in asymptomatic patients and also in patients with coronary artery calcium scores of zero, that they have an increased uh, prevalence of uh, CAD from CTCA. Like in this case, you can see a very negligible coronary artery calcium, but when you do a CTCA, you can see some vulnerable plaque, which will definitely uh, affect the prognosis. Now the future trends. Uh, Future trends, uh, the FFR CT is definitely something which needs to be considered. FFR is something which we see to uh, note the hemodynamic disturbance or hemodynamic uh, consequences of a moderate stenosis. Uh, so, so incorporating FFR CT into our protocol, uh, if you have uh, intermediate stenosis on CTCA or CAP, you can directly go for an FFR CT where you get an FFR of 0. Point, greater of 0. 0.8, though no additional testing is required. Uh, when you get an FFR of less than 0. 0.75, 0. 0.75, you consider invasive angiography. So these are a few representational images. You can see the moderate stenosis in LAD and distal to the stenosis, you can get, uh, get, you get, you see that FFR has come down to 0. 0.69, which, in, uh, which indicates an hemodynamic stenosis. And a similar scenario on, uh, again, in different patient, you can see a moderate stenosis in LAD, but the FFR distal to it, distal to it is 0 0.81, which does not indif indicate any significant stenosis. Now, coronary artery shear stress is also a predictor of heart attack, and this is also done by an FFR study. Uh, another important... Another... Uh, Important is the fat attenuation index, which is the recently developed method to non-invasively detect coronary artery inflammation. Uh, in uh, we basically see about the perivascular fat around the coronary arteries, and increased FAI is uh, is uh, a marker of coronary inflammation, and this uh, is the risk factors. So the take-home message, uh, the, there has been a vast improvement in the scanners and the reporting protocol uh, should be the first line investigation for stable chest pain in asymptomatic high-risk patient. Uh, uh, the CTCA is now the gatekeeper for cardiac catheterization. It is an important and strong predictor of adverse cardiovascular events. So it uh, brings down to one thing that CT coronary angiogram is no longer a puzzle, but it's a gift. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Shugajit. Our next speaker is Dr. Siddhartha Mani, who will be speaking on FFR. Siddhartha Mani, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening to all of you. Let me share my screen first. It's feasible, right? Yes, sir. Perfect. 
Okay, thank you. So, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Today, I, in the next 10 12 minutes, I will be talking about a very important topic FFR, RFR, or IFR, uh, which is used for uh, physiological assessment of intermediate coronary lesions. And it has uh, really become a part and parcel of our daily coronary interventions. <clears throat> so, we, uh, we have been trained from the very early days of cardiology that we need to intervene into a coronary artery when there is, there is evidence of ischemia and viability. And the benefit goes by reduction of ischemia. And we all know that only plain coronary angiography frequently fails to identify the accurate hemodynamic significance, particularly when the diameter stenosis is between 30 to 90%, 90% that is intermediate lesions. And in such cases, FFR is or it has really become a gold standard. Uh, decision making during PCI guided by FFR has uh, also shown favorable clinical outcomes in terms of reducing mace and uh, other CV events I will be discussing in a nutshell later. And it is also very easy to perform in the cat lab. And it, uh, on an average, it takes additional seven minutes to perform with a cost of uh, a minimal extra radiation of 2.8 milli SV. And uh, the dose of uh, contrast, which in addition goes uh, for that particular case is 35 ml. But uh, overall, uh, if you can reduce the uh, number of stents, as I will show in my subsequent slides, you can reduce the dose of radiation and contrast also uh, in total. So uh, FFR uh, just mm -hmm. the diagnostic accuracy. Now, what is FFR? It is the maximum achievable flow in stenotic coronary artery divided by the maximal flow in the same artery without stenosis, which is considered to be equal as the aortic uh, pressure. Now, if the ratio of flow, then why are you considering or why are you measuring the pressure difference? What we do is we introduce a pressure sensor where distal to the stenosis, we measure the pressure, we measure the pressure proximal to the stenosis and we make a ratio. So why it is that we are measuring flow by pressure? That is based on two assumptions. Number one assumption is during maximal vasodilatation, the ratio of the stenotic flow to normal flow becomes directly proportional to their respective driving pressure. So this is the first assumption we are making when we are measuring FFR. And the second assumption is the venous pressure, we are considering it to be very minimal, that is zero. So which is not actually the case in, in, in all situations. So based on these two assumptions, we are, we are making the PD by PA ratio as a surrogate of this FFR. Now FFR, how it is extra informative than uh, normal coronary angiography. Because in coronary angiography, we can see the only the diameter stenosis. And though the diameter stenosis can look same in two different cases, the physiological significance or the ischemia it is producing depends on a lot many factors. Important of this is the perfusion area. What is the area of the myocardium being supplied by that artery? And accordingly, you can see that with the same diameter stenosis, the FFR will be different. It also takes into account the scar or the non-viable tissue in that myocardium bed, which is being supplied by the artery. It takes into account the collateral supply arising out of the distal vasculature of that coronary artery. So if, if you have lot many collaterals arising from that artery supplying to a viable myocardium, then obviously the, the supply bed increases and the FFR reduces. So these are certain situations. So this is just an example. You can see that the upper and the lower panel, the left main ostium is looking almost similar. Rather, the lower panel is uh, looking rather more stenotic. But if you, uh, if you look into the FFR, you can see that the upper panel is significant rather than the lower panel. So this is how our angiographic interpretation is changed. And sometimes even with radio pressure uptake, we are also confused because if you can look into this LED, which is looking intermediate in coronary angiography, if you look into the radio pressure uptake image, there also it is, it is confusing because the radio pressure uptake is so low in the LCX territory that it is falsely looking high in the LED territory. But if you do a FFR, you can clearly delineate that the FFR is 0.67, which is, which is significant hemodynamically. So what are the unique features of FFR? Number one is it is one or it, is, it has a value of uh, uh, one for every patient and every artery. Very importantly, it is not influenced by heart rate, blood pressure, contractility. And 
uh, the FFR relates the influence of the epicardial stenosis to the myocardial perfusion area and blood flow. As I showed you, the myocardial perfusion bed, the collateral, it takes into account all those things. So that is why it is it is so so physiological and so very relevant for our intervention. Uh, the cutoff value uh, that has been considered is 0.8 to induce ischemia, indicate ischemia. And this is extremely reproducible. Now, in the previous validator, validatory studies, uh, uh, when we were about to set a cutoff, uh, the cutoff was decided as 0.75. And in if the FFR was more than 0.75, ischemia is really unlikely. The sensitivity is around 90%. If the FFR is less than 0.75, the ischemia is very likely and the specificity is 100%. However, in the later prognostic studies, the cutoff set was 0.8 which we currently follow as the as the uh, demarcation uh, as to defer the PCI or not. Uh, if you look into the validation studies, this FFR 0.75 has been validated with the other gold standard non-invasive test. And it is very important, you, you can see that if the FFR is less than 0.75, signs of myocardial ischemia will be induced by at least one non-invasive test out of exercise test, TMT, thallium scan, stress echo. So, so it, it is very much valid. It is very, very much reproducible. You can see if you make two separate FFR measurements in the same artery in the same patient, you will find extremely high correlation in the values. So uh, this is not something <coughs> that, that can be erroneous. So starting from the introduction of the 0 0.018 words, pressure words, now we have 0.014 also, pressure words. In 1991, we have come up a long way. We had so many landmark trials and it led to the incorporation of FFR as a class one indication for intermediate lesions in 2010. These were the main uh, landmark trials that DEFAR, FEM, FEM2, DEFAR study showed that uh, the, uh, there is no additional benefit in revascularizing an artery if the FFR is more than 0.75. FEM showed that it reduces the mass if you use FFR and, uh, in your guided PCIs. And FEM2 also was halted prematurely due to significant reduction of the urgent revascularization in the FFR guided arm. So obviously, FFR improves outcome. It reduces mace by 28%. It reduces the risk of death and MI by 34%. And obviously, there are economic benefits uh, overall on the society because there is use of 30% fewer stents with FFR. And obviously, then the reduction of total contrast usage, as I was discussing in my first slide. So now FFR is a class one recommendation in the European guidelines and a class two in USA guidelines for intermediate lesions. Now, uh, there are certain situations where uh, FFR uh, may be a little bit doubtful and uh, there are some questions like is post-intervention FFR valid? Now, if FFR value uh, after stand becomes more than 0.9, then obviously we expect or it is correlated with a better outcome and reduce need for repeat revascularization. But on the contrary, if, if there is... Uh, if the uh, FFR is still low after stent implantation, then what should be done in those suboptimal post-intervention cases is not very clear. Maybe we should go for other modalities of imaging for OCTs or IVAS and look for stent under expansion or ML apposition and uh, the other factors that may be positive. So uh, now this is a very important subset, the acute coronary syndrome. Is FFR valid for acute coronary syndrome? It has been said that in the in STEMI, just after STEMI, when we are going for a primary PCI, there is severe microvascular impairment. There is no reflow, stunning, inflammation. And accordingly, the hemodynamic significance is a little bit altered. And if we have a high FFR value, it, it does not necessarily exclude. Uh, and, and it's not that the FFR is high, so we need not put in a stent. So in post STEMI, STEMI situations, uh, in within the first five days, if it is less than five days, then pressure derived FFR should not be used. But uh, uh, in case of unstable angina or NSTEMI, you, you can use this, 
particularly if you have non culprit lesions or you have lesions in multiple vessels in case of primary pci also it has been said if you have non culprit lesions in other vessels you can use ffr for the assessment of physiological significance of those non culprit lesions and if the uh, the duration of mi is more than 5 days then classical 0.75 or 0.8 threshold of ffr is what that is applicable so this is a very important thing to understand obviously there are certain controversies and challenges i have already discussed about the assumptions that we assume the microvascular resistance to be minimal and zero and constant and we assume that during maximal vasodilatation the flow is directly proportional to the driving pressure which is not always the same we assume the venous pressure to be zero but in situations like lv dysfunction the venous pressure may be elevated and that can lead to errors in the ffr management and obviously there remains a gray zone between 0.75 and 0.8 as the different set of studies have said different cutoffs and because physiology consists of continuous variables it is very difficult uh, for all cases to impose a particular dichotomous value of 0.8 and and uh, accordingly uh, uh, plan your stenting or intervention in all such patients so obviously these uh, these fallacies will be there a very important thing is it tandem lesions because the normal simple cal calculation of pd by pa distal pressure by proximal pressure is not applicable in tandem lesions and we have to go through complex calculations because there is pressure building up in between two tandem lesions and uh, and the error, there is a erroneous result if we measure by simple uh, <coughs> equation so what we should do in such cases of tandem lesion we should pass the ffr wire beyond the distal lesion achieve maximal vasodilatation then gradually we will pull back if the value is less than 0.8 then we will do a second pull back and we will this time not calculate ffr across lesions we will just look at the pressure gradients across lesions and the the lesion which will have the more pressure gradient ideally more than 10 mm that lesion should be stented or opened first and then again we have to reassess the ffr and then assess the remaining second lesion whether we should uh, intervene in that also so this is a example that there are two lesions and you can see the different pressure gradients during the pull back so measure the pressure gradients here the distal lesion seems to have a more pressure gradient so open the distal lesion first then reassess the proximal lesion so uh, because uh, we have to use hypermic agents we have to use vasodilatation that can lead to side effects patient discomfort increase procedural time so nowadays we are gradually shifting or we are thinking of other physiology running running yeah. need the place okay just 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 one or two minutes okay so we are going for non hypermic pressure ratios so i i'll be running through the slides i don't have time so we have the resting uh, pressure the resting flow ratio uh, resting full cycle ratio which measures the minimum pdpa during the average of the whole wave like this it is it measures the lowest value Uh, this has certain advantages it is independent of ecg we do not we do not uh, need a, a waveform landmark and the cutoff is 0.89 for rfr uh, these are the studies which show that rfr and ifr they have extreme high correlation between them and they are accurate sensitive specific and have a high positive predictive value when compared with the gold standard ffr so these are some of the landmark measure trials where Uh, the defined flair the ifr switch said hart which showed that ifr is non inferior to ffr while guiding pci there are 20% cases where ifr and ffr there is discordance between these two and this is the most important example in diffuse lesions or multiple tandem lesions the ffr can be negative where ifr can be positive and in case of discrete lesions there can be ffr positive or ifr negative so this is the concluding slide so emerging data supports the transition from angiographic to physiologic guided treatment and is now ffr is now a class 1 recommendation ifr and other non hypermic ratios uh, will contribute to further adoption of wire based technologies and ifr guided revascularization appears to be non inferior to ffr whereas rfr is diagnostically equivalent to ifr but clinical benefits of rfr has not been fully investigated thank you thank you thank you dr mani uh, because of time constraint no discussion our next speaker is somitra dev he will be speaking on molecular imaging in cardiovascular disease somitra dev please
want to uh, cannot share my slides share your slides they are visible yes, as well you can you can you can share sir you can see bottom center share screen sir share screen option so, okay uh for this oh okay yeah it's loading sir okay yeah uh, you can you can kindly make it full screen we can see your screen okay perfect am i audible yes sir go ahead please go ahead okay uh good evening dear person and the, uh, my teachers and uh, i have i have given a talk by the csi west bengal chapter to talk on the molecular imaging in cardiovascular diseases uh, first of all i would like to uh, discuss this topic on the different headings that is the principle of molecular imaging scopes molecular targets along with the different uh, difference between the molecular imaging and the conventional imaging with the advanced clinical application of molecular imaging cardiovascular diseases there are few challenges and finally that take home message so what is molecular imaging molecular imaging is a going biomedical research discipline that enables us to quantification of the biological processes taking place at the cellular and the subcellular level within the intact living subject including the patient Uh, the basic principle of molecular imaging is that there is a molecule of interest that is uh, that is present in the disease cell which is stacked with the signaling component and the targeting component that will be detected by the imaging devices and uh, it gives us a, a picture non invasively that the patient is suffering from some disorder so the it is a uh, that is like the pet ct and the mri so what is the probes molecular targets in the molecular imaging probes is an agent used to visualize characterize and quantify the biological processes in the living subject that are tracers or contrast agent or molecular beacon the molecular targets are the basically the cellular or tissue structure that are intended to be the visualized by means of molecular imaging just like the molecular imaging by the pet scan we use the 18 fluoro flu uh, deoxy glucose as the glucose re reduce pressure and in case of spect imaging we use the 131 iron mib scan in case of angiogenesis we use the vascular endothelial growth factor that is a copper 64 copper 120 integral factor and in case of sarcoidosis detection we use again the 18 fluoro deoxy glucose like that uh, Uh, so what is the potential load why we are discussing this topic today because the molecular imaging help us from the all basic research that is the uncovering the pathophysiology to early diagnosis with a more definitive diagnosis to the customized therapy and monitoring the disease and progression or the prognosis so the molecular imaging what is the difference between the conventional imaging conventional imaging is basically with the disease is suffering from the anatomical structure to the how the it's head uh, different from the functionally uh, the physiologically it different then how the disease is different from the metabolic metabolically and the protein and the and the genetic structure so the molecular imaging is basically the it's visualizing the body function what is happening at the cellular and the molecular level and the imaging molecules of the medical interest within the living patients for the early detection beta therapy selection and the patients monitoring and disease progression and the re occurrence of the disease so uh, if, if we use the, 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 this technique but though is in the, we are discussing about the cardiovascular disease but the mammography and the ultrasound the so hypoechoic hypo mass the there, there is a post contrast mri shows that there is a large carcinoma and less an extreme more than 7.3 cm that suggests that the, the molecular imaging has a very in, important role to detect the whole amount of the diseases uh, though in, in the also in the cardiovascular system so cardiovascular diseases there are various tools in the molecular imaging modality one is the one is the uh, 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 contrast ultrasound there is magnetic resonance imaging there is radio tracer imaging among the radio tracer imaging there is a spect there is a positron emission tomography there are pet and along with that there is a hybrid spect ct and the pet ct and the pet mri scan is also for the detection of the diseases 
So molecular imaging across the cardiovascular continuum is that we are we uh, basically uh, most of the diseases of the cardiovascular the most important burden is the coronary atherosclerosis. We detect the coronary atherosclerosis by different non-invasive imaging from the coronary calcium score to the plaque burden to the uh, to the perfusion LP function by the echocardiography. But the, if we start this coronary atherosclerosis, we identify this, this disorder in the form of the very early stage from the early atherosclerosis, the endothelial dysfunction and vascular remodeling to the identify the progression of the disease by the LV remodeling to the guide therapy that is the molecular intervention. It will be very much useful to patients to prevent the patient to development of the myocardial ischemia and to get rid of the heart failure due to ischemia induced heart failure. So what are the imaging techniques in our hand to till now for the myocardial metabolism or uh, that is a PET scan or the neuroactivity activity in case of heart failure that is a PET scan to detect the atherosclerosis both early and late that is the MRI PET scan. The, after the AMI, that is the LV remodeling to detect that, that is the MRI PET scan. Angiogenesis after heart failure remodeling that is PET and SPEC. For the restrictive cardiomyopathy due to sarcoidosis and amyloidosis to detect that, there is a PET scan and aortic aneurysm, the aortic wall due to uh, aortic wall uh, atherosclerosis. So to detect that, we have the PET and the MRI and the infective endocarditis, to out the infective endocarditis, we have the PET scan by the, the respective ligand. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the various modalities? The PET scan, the, the, both the, the resolution is very high, the one to two millimeter, but advantage is that there is a, uh, there is a uh, attenuation algorithm, high sensitivity and high chemical affinity for the molecular targets. But the, the, the uh, disadvantage is that there is a local cyclotron required and that there is advanced radiochemistry. But SPEC scan, uh, SPEC scan is a also high sensitivity, but there is a disadvantage of ionizing radiation, the ultrasound, which is very universally available, but there is no definite sensitivity data till now in our hand and a limited penetration and absence of molecular probe. The CT scan is a high spatial resolution, but the contrast is nephrotoxic. We have to use this in the uh, CKD patient or the renal, renal compromised patient. But the MRI, there is a no chance of uh, radiation and there is a high spatial resolution, but there is low sensitivity of molecular imaging and there is a cluster but the, another important is the optical fluorescence. There is a poor in vivo resolution that is one of the important disadvantage. So how we can use this for the clinical application? The clinical application, high impact scenario in the molecular imaging from the atherosclerosis to the myocardial uh, ischemia to the angiogenesis to myocardial remodeling and the assessment of the new treatment. The molecular imaging targets in the disease, it starts from the intercellular targets to the intercellular target to the microRNA to the membrane target, that is the matrix metalloproteinase to the extracellular extra matrix to the integrin molecules to the vascular endothelial growth factor. And for the cytoplasmic targets, we need the intercellular proteins and the, from the genomic target, the nuclear target, the DNA or RNA targeting uh, uh, imaging that should be noted. The probes are used as the potential indicator reflects the development of the disease by corresponding molecular imaging modality. In the atherosclerosis, we use this from the early to the high risk vulnerable atherosclerosis by the measurement of the oxidative stress, by the measurement of the macrophage activity, protease activity, the T cell scavenger receptor to the pellet addition and the local myeloperoxidase production. So there are different molecular imaging strategies for the detection of the atherosclerosis, starting from the contrast enhanced ultrasound to the BCAM one imaging to the macrophage content by the spectral CT, by the BCAM one imaging by the PET CT to the uh, uh, near infrared uh, fluoroscopy uh, CT scan by the oxidative LDL imaging to the vascular. Uh, in, by the MRI, that is the vascular cell addition molecular one imaging, spectral CT by the ma matrix metal proteinase imaging. There is a distribution of the collagen and the elastin distribution by the hyophatic plaque, that is the uh, thin cap distribution, that is the Fourier uh, transform infrared spectroscopy to the Raman imaging to difference the calcified and the non calcified atherosclerotic plaque to the SARS spectroscopy. 
to detect the uh, uh, atherosclerosis, defined phases of atherosclerosis. So the technique are these, the contrast enhanced ultrasound, it detects the plaque morphology, thumb bath, and the ulcer detection and the stenosis severity. CT scan, it detects the plaque size, morphology, and the gauss composition, but the PET and, and, and SPECT CT scan, it detects the plaque inflammatory burden, which is very important because in the vulnerable plaque, the plaque is very much in the infant state and it, uh, it can give up the uh, plaque erosion and the rupture and lift the AMI. And MRI, there's a plaque inflammatory burden, morphology and stenosis severity, and the Raman effect. We know that is a diagnosis of disease associated changes to thrombocyte activity. So the consensus statement is that PET is the reference method for the standard for the quantification. SPECT is the most commonly used, and the MRI and CT is the least used for the detection of the myocardial ischemia. Next, the, for the uh, heart failure, you know, angiogenesis and the cardiac remodeling, angiogenesis, PET, SPECT, and, and MRI. The target or uh, molecule is a vascular endothelial growth factor or integrins. The myocardial remodeling after the uh, AMI, so the high bit spect or CT imaging by the matrix metal proteinase activation and the perfusion and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or AT1 antagonists have been reliable for the targeted molecular imaging of the RAS or infarction in animal model and in humans. So the MI for the assessing of the new treatment, the cardiac MRI, one of the nowadays, the gold standard in the study of the right ventricle and is postulated as a useful technique for the early diagnosis of the right ventricular damage in patients with pulmonary hypertension. We, we, from the left side of the left side, from the right side of the uh, uh, panel, we are seeing that the uh, myocardial resonance imaging scan in the myocardial infarction, the, by the T2 start uh, as a hyperintense region in the anterior septum. Now, what is the role under the hybrid technology? The hybrid technology is the it is a combination of the both physiological along with the uh, functional and anatomical technique. That is for the what is the advantage? Advantage how it is it acts. There is a spec and the CT. If we uh, uh, conjoin the spec and the CT scan with a PET and the CT scan and PET on the MRI, there's the advantage of each modality strain can integrate the molecular, anatomical, and physiological information in a single image. So this is an example of the hybrid imaging, the human myocardial angiosensitive 2 receptor after the PET CT imaging, the, with the, after the Olm, given the Olmi the, the there's a blockage of the blocking of the uh, myocardia by the angiosensitive the 2 this type 1 receptor ligand. Uh, so we can uh, go through about the, the uh, viability of the myocardium. So challenges in the molecular imaging in the cardiovascular disease. There are various challenges of the molecular imaging. The challenges are there is a tracer sensitivity. The blocking the study for the target specificity, test and retest the possibility of the window quickly, please. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 one or two slides. Therapeutic response, tracer sensitivity for therapeutic response, time course evaluation of therapeutic response. So what is the future perspective? The future perspective is that we need a new molecular probes are coming, new multimodality uh, scan is coming with the cellular regeneration of the failing heart for the stem cell for the heart failure. And uh, the, the FDG PET CT scan is also uh, for the detection of the, uh, the thrombosis in the suspected DVD in any parts of the, our body. So to conclude the slides, the treatment of patient with cardiovascular disease increasingly incorporates the molecular and cellular markers of the disease into management algorithm. For the further, uh, it is required the nanotechnology amplification scheme and the expansion of the high resolution imaging system for the nuclear and the CT MRI scan for the optical imaging should enable the molecular imaging to become an integral component of personalized medication. Thank you. Thank you for patience here. Thank you, Shomitru, for the lucid presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Mahu Arai, who will be speaking on emerging role of CMRI and CT in congenital heart disease. Dr. Mahu Arai, please.
sir is there any hercule hello? hello doctor hello doctor mohorai hello Or, uh, Dr. Mahore, sir was there. Mohu madam is there, but uh, Mohu madam is there in this uh, list. But yes, Mohu madam is there in the list. स्पीकर this is our this session will be over after his speech so we can if if he uh, if he cannot connect with us then we have to conclude the session yeah someone can call her i think someone should call her and confirm it yeah sir i have, 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 uh, sir, I have called madam um, there is some technical issue in uh, madam side uh, so madam mm-hmm. is telling so network is poor sir that's a yeah there is some technical issue in the side of the madam then 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 already you are late so we cannot wait for a prolonged time go to the next uh, session i think the, to the conclusion by the this we can conclude the session our next session is on acute coronary syndrome the next session is acute coronary syndrome Uh, the chair persons for the next session are Dr. Amol Kumar Banerjee, Dr. Shivanand Dutta, and Dr. N. K. Das. The moderators for the sessions are Dr. Shoura Mukherjee, Dr. P. K. Hajra, and Dr. Devashish Ghosh. Uh, may I now request the speakers, Dr. Pajol Ganguly, Dr. Shomit Dani, Dr. Dhiman Kahali, and Dr. P. C. Mondol to be on the screen, and I hand over the session to the moderators. I don't see anybody from moderator side as well as doctor person sir, side. Uh, sir, sir, you continue, please. Think, yeah, I think without uh, wasting much time, uh, we should uh, start the program immediately. It's a uh, session on acute coronary syndrome and. the masters will be speaking in this uh, particular session and uh, may i call upon dr kajal ganguly uh, to speak on dr kajal ganguly please sir please respond yes sir so let's audio flow yes yes sir uh, perfect sir you can can you can you yeah. yes sir yes sir Yes, yes. 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 suspected to result from a combination of endothelial damage platelet and fibrin disembolization vasospasm and tissue edema that overhangs the coronary microcirculation reperfusion related injury is hypothesized 
to contribute to the low reflow via infiltration of microcirculation with neutrophils and platelets. So incidence, uh, 0.6 to 2%, frequently seen when using stains, atherectomy, PCI, encephalus dendra. So uh, all in all PCI, it is 0.6 to 2%, primary PCI, 8.8 to 11.5%, SBT PCI, 8% to 15%, atherectomy is almost 16%. Etiology, as I have said, no reflow phenomenon is commonly with consequence of visceral embolization and reperfusion injury, such as thrombus containing lesions, oxygen free radicals, or cellular mediated endothelial injury, loss of microvascular component due to completed uh, myocardial infarction, cellular or interstitial edema, atherosclerotic debris, venous bypass graft, or rotational atherectomy, microvascular constriction or vasospasm. No reflow generally occurs immediately after PCI. 1 to 3% of PCI can arise in different clinical settings, like late presentation of ACS, large thrombus, venous bypass graft, rotational atherectomy, and cardiogenic shock. So types of no reflow sustained result from anatomically reversible changes in the coronary microcirculation, undergo unfavorable LVD modeling, reversible, result from functional and thus reversible changes in the microcirculation, maintain the left ventricular volumes unchanged over time. So there are Again, two types pathologically, there is reperfusion no reflow and interventional no reflow. If reperfusion no reflow occurs after PPCI, may be asymptomatic, may present clinically with continued chest pain and stimulation preceded by ischemic cell injury, confirmed by irreversibly damaged necrotic zone, may be exacerbated at the time of reperfusion. And independent predictor of adverse outcome like heart failure uh, uh, and mortality and ventricular tachycardia and particular fibrillation. The interventional low reflow follows non tuck PCI. Affects myocardium that was not subjected to prolonged ischemic injury for procedure. Clinically, it's typically seen in onset, presenting as acute ischemia with chest pain and seeing changes may resolve over the course of several minutes. Patients with interventional low reflow have higher rates of morbidity and mortality. Interventional low reflow is unpredictable and uncommonly recognized in clinical practice. So mechanisms, there are four basic mechanisms. That is one is distal embolization, ischemia related injury, repercussion uh, related injury, and individual susceptibility to microvascular injury. So the predictors of pathogenic components of no reflow. There is the distal embolization from burden, ischemia, ischemia duration, and ischemia extent is responsible for reperfusion. That is neutrophil count, and neutrophil count is a predictor. ET1 level, thromboxin A2 level, mean platelet volume and reactivity, individual susceptibility like diabetes, acute hyperglycemia, hypercholesterolemia, lack of preconditioning. Diagnosis is by con contrast media staining the myocardial artery not washed away. Persistent chest pain after plasty, residual of uh, increased ST elevation is so complete. Differential diagnosis, coronary spasm, coronary dissection, intercoronary occlusive thrombus, Diffusion of coronary hematoma, distal coronary stenosis from the diadoire catheter extension and CAG, and CAG microcatheter, thrombus aspiration catheter, visualization of the distal part of the coronary is precious, precious. So this is an example of no reflow management in a patient of 72 years old patient with anterior MI. No reflow after base implantation in the mid left to the coronary artery and which is which has been resolved by uh, therapeutic managements. So, how do you diagnose it? Timmy frame count is important. Timmy frame count is a quantitative index of calculating the number of frames between the two landmarks proximal and to the internal coronary artery. Frame count is different in different vessels of the coronary artery. LAT has got 36 frames frame count. LCX has 24, RCX is 22. And the difference between gives a diagnosis of no uh, uh, reflow. So, so Timmy flow grading. We know it, we will go into the detail. The myocardial blush, microcirculation evaluation is done by myocardial blush, corresponds to the densitometric method, assessing maximum intensity of contrast media in the microcirculation. So, myocardial blush grades 0, 1, 2, 3. So, definition of levels of uh, myocardial blush grade seen in angiography, as I have said, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Zero means absence of myocardial blast or contrast media. 
Three means normal mitochondrial blast of contrast density comparable that obtained during angiography of the contralateral or ipsilateral non infected artery. Now, management. Before, uh, prevention, optimal blood sugar control before prescription and statin. The statin reduces is due not to flow by 2% cardiotrophic effect, platelet addition inhibition, thrombosis prevention, and improvement of endothelial functions. So this idea whether the benefit of statin therapy is due to acute anti-inflammatory effect or long-term lipid lowering effect. It may be both, mostly due to acute, uh, acute anti-inflammatory effect. So the you know, treatment of this noriflow, noriflow is, uh, is diagnosed or defined as flow grade, flow less than 3 or flow 3 with myocardial blush 0 to 1. These are the two main points for the diagnosis of low reflow. So, a hemodynamic stabilization is to be done by mechanical epicardial obstructive vessels, either by distal coronary um, uh, insertion of macrocatheter over the air balloon and or thromboaspiration catheter. If it is failed, then we have to go for intracoronary drugs, coronary uh, calcium inhibitors and others which are complete. Prevention during the procedure, anticoagulation to be given early, Unfractionated hemoglobin 72, 100 microns intermission with parkage, intercoronary nitrates RD, optimal catheter selection to prevent damping and combus formation, regular catheter flushing, GP2B, CA inhibitor like terapivar, exosimab are helpful. Direct stenting in bulky atheroma to avoid dilatation is, is occasionally done. We do it in our uh, cases of primary um, PCI if it is possible. During rotational effect we perform short runs, 15 seconds, with a picking motion to preserve flow at a speed of 140,000 RPM. Avoid deceleration more than 5,000 RPM. In as graph PCI, more risky, more reflow occurs in almost 10% of the cases. Due to highly friable atherothrombotic debris of the venous graft lesion, use distal protection device with extended implantation. These are the common distal protection devices we use. One is angioguard by Cordis. Percussion wire guard by Vectronic, filter wire XC by Dostern. Pharmacological therapies. Recommendations of thromboaspiration is 2A by B, Axelsimac 2A by B, adenosine intravenous 2B by, 2B by B, adenosine intracoronary 2B by C, verapamil intracoronary bolus 0.5 to 1 microgram during PCI 2B by C. Suggested intracoronary drug administration regime during slow flow. As I have said, verapamil, adenosine, sodium nitroprusside bolus. 1000 microgram up to a total of 1000 microgram, 100 microgram per bolus, nitroglycerin, bolus of 100 to 200 microgram up to four doses, epinephrine, intracoronary, 50 to 200 microgram. So, why use adenosine to prevent no reflow? You have to use adenosine very liberally at a very high doses. The adenosine prevents platelet aggregation, prevents vasoconstriction, it prevents vascular plugging. Cellular calcium overload prevents oxygen free radical and thereby prevents low reflow and prevents cell death. So, sky definition of low reflow management first line adenosine, erapamil, nitro, prosite. Less, less strong evidence with this uh, cardiazem, that is the litiazem, tacogarine, licorendil, nicardipine, and epinephrine. That is summary of treatment. So, myocardial infarction etiology, thrombotic, optimal anticoagulation, consider thrombectomy. Balloon inflation to restore to free blood flow with minimal invasive strategy. And, and use liberal anti 2 TCA uh, antagonist and adenosine. Microvascular spasm, nitrates, rota bladder, optimal anticoagulation, nitrates, maintain stable hemodynamic temporary pacemaker, atropine in case of severe pedicardia, plus infusion with nitrates or calcium inhibitors. Intracoronary calcium inhibitors and adenosine is the treatment. Venus graft, crystal protection device, adenosine, intra graft. Nicardipine, intracraft calcium inhibitors, and adenosine also to be admitted, can be given. Hydrogenic, optimal anticoagulation is thrombotic in origin. Anticoagulation with ACT monitoring, heparin, and dp 2 3 inhibitors consider balloon inflation or thrombectomy. So, distal protection thrombectomy devices we commonly use are uh, export, pronto, NGOJ, and uh, this uh, rescue device by those terms. So, pathologically, pathophysiologically based management on low reflow, distal embolization, dp 2 3 inhibitors, vasodilators, adenosine nitroprusside, ischemic reperfusion, pharmacological strategies, adenosine nitroprusside, verapamil, picorendil. 
individual susceptibility management strategies, management of hyperglycemia statins, device based strategies, hyperoxemic reperfusion, where by a catheter they, 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 they infuse hyperbaric oxygen and that prevents microvascular obstruction and restores uh, the circulation. Intraortic balloon perversion uh, pump and post conditioning by uh, distal, the distal pressure bandage. Also, nowadays, uh, this is this uh, cyclosporin is tried for post conditioning. That, is, that helps in prevention of low reflow. Measurement of treatment outcome, residual ST elevation, independent predictor of microvascular injury. Eco contrasts myocardial eco, micro bubbles, micro bubble uptake is delayed in the areas of low reflow. So CMR, non-invasive gold standard to assess microvascular obstruction. Microvascular extent of uh, more than 2.5% LB was the strongest independent predictor of death and heart failure hospitalization. Intracoronary droplet. See, there is early deceleration and there is, uh, there, there is systolic flow reversal in the coronary artery when there is capillary obstruction. So thus current therapy for no reflow really work. I guess that there is still much more to do. Reasons for failure is the root of administration, IV or IC, uh, intercoronary, inadequate dosing, uh, uh, coexistence of multiple mechanisms, lack of stimulation of protective pathways, gradual increase of area of no reflow with time, irreversible manner of no reflow once it sets in. So future perspective, the understanding of prevailing pathogenic mechanisms of no reflow in the individual patients is probably important in the selection of most appropriate therapeutic approach, new drugs such as ET1 antagonist and thromboxin A2 antagonist, newer drugs are in combination of older drugs to be tested in large controlled randomized trial in patients at high risk of reperfusion injury. Also, the systemic conditioning and post systemic conditioning with drugs like cyclosporine has been tried nowadays. Optimal and prompt risk factor control and induction of preconditioning response additional therapeutic options that should be tested in large control and device trial. So in conclusion, no reflow phenomenon after PTCI still negates the benefit of coronary decanalization despite a more widespread use of thrombus aspiration and gp 2 3 inhibitors. Future studies should better address strategies for both no reflow prevention and treatment as well as could favorably affect no reflow evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kajal Ganguly for your beautiful presentation. In fact, uh, uh, no reflow phenomenon is uh, always to be prevented, prevented, and prevented. In, uh, in fact, it is said that uh, uh, the decision to incision is the most important criteria for preventing many complications uh, during PCI. And uh, what Dr. Ganguly has highlighted is, if, uh, is a detailed, uh, um, uh, detailed lecture on the, on the various mechanisms as well as drugs uh, for preventing this and also taking care of the no, no reflow phenomenon. Now, I uh, once again thank you, Dr. Ganguly. I am going to Dr. Samir Dhani. Dr. Samir Dhani, please. Sir, good evening. Good evening. Good evening to all the. Sir, please, sir, please, you stop yeah. your microphone. Stop, side talk. Please stop your microphone. Stop your microphone. He cannot hear. Please temporarily block him. Positive Why don't you block? Why don't you mute everyone other than the speaker? Sir, administration, administrators should block him, otherwise it will continue. <laughs> yes, Shamir, please continue. Yes, sir. 
So good evening, uh, the chairpersons and the August panelists, Dr. Das, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, you all. Uh, the topic today uh, for me for discussion is uh, plaque modification during PCI. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, visible, Samir, and audible okay. as well. Visible, go ahead. Why should we modify that it means basically changing the lesion compliance when you are treating the complex lesions? It us to create larger MEDs which uh, lead us to uh, more successful, more uh, durable outcomes. We know that coronary calcium is a predictor of worse prognosis after PCI with drug eluting stents. If you see this particular uh, meta-analysis, whenever the lesions were severely calcified, the MACE rates, death, death or MI or death MI or any revascularization was uh, statistically uh, higher with calcified lesions. And we also know that with uh, increasing popularity of PCI with a lot of new techniques being available. We have more and more complex PCIs in our, uh, uh, to, to our uh, uh, available to us. And the calcification of uh, uh, coronary arteries is much higher in PCI patients compared to previous years. So we are encountering more complex patients, more complex anatomy, more calcification than before. So balloon only pre preparation of these kind of calcified or severely fibrotic lesion is many times not sufficient. <coughs> of course, we have ultra low profile balloons. We have non-compliant balloons. We have high pressure balloons. But scoring balloons, cutting balloons, they modify the plaque rather than using the brute force. And we have rotational atherectomy, and now we have shock wave as well. We also have orbital atherectomy and ELCA available to us only recently. Many of us are still not exposed to these techniques. So how do you do it? Most of us use the balloon escalation strategy. We optimize the support, use low profile balloons. If the balloon is not crossable, we switch over to atherectomy especially rotational atherectomy. If the lesion is not dilatable, then we switch over to either rotational atherectomy or most of the time now with shockwave. If the stand does not cross, then also we post we pre-dilate adequately or switch to atherectomy or mainly preferably nowadays to shockwave. Sometimes cutting balloon and scoring balloons. <clears throat> cutting balloons are basically they have atherotomes which are affixed to the balloon. They expand radically as balloon is inflated to score or cut the arterial plaque. The advantage is that it produces controlled dissection. It has non-compliant balloon material. Its disadvantage is that it is almost uh, uh, six times costlier than uh, the routine balloon. It has slightly higher profile. It has limited lengths and it is so use is limited. And it is a stiff and bulky catheter. Sometimes you are not able to deliver it without pre-dilating the lesion. But having said all this, the cutting balloons are very important in mild to moderately calcific lesions or severely fibrotic lesions, especially osteal lesions and bifurcation lesions, where it modifies the plaque by cutting it. And it basically minimizes the vessel trauma and allows us to expand the vessel better. We have <clears throat> latest generation of cutting balloon, that is Wolverine cutting balloon. It has NC emerge platform. It has improved flexibility and reduced profiles. It doesn't need to be inflated very slowly and deflated very slowly. Its deliverability is much better. And it is 5F comp compatible also. Angioscalp is another scoring or cutting balloon. And it's a scoring balloon 
and it has a helical wire wrapped around it. It's a semi-compliant balloon, and this wire has cutting effect when the balloon is in inflated. So it produces cuts like this in the vessel wall or atheromatous plaque, and that allows good expansion of the vessel wall. The more important and more used uh, plaque modification technique is rotablator, and it is, I, I say that it is more used, but it is rapidly being uh, overshadowed by shockwave. Rotablator is, is nothing but a diamond coated burr, which rotates at high speed and creates kind of a digging into the vessel, creates a small hole and creates a fracture into the calcium of the vessel wall. It's, the device is uh, not very user friendly and it requires a lot of experience. The principle of device is differential cutting. The bar will cut, cut inelastic tissue, that is calcium and fibrous material, but the elastic tissue, because of the speed of the bar, will be repaired and the bar will not cut the elastic tissue unless you have severe bands where it may uh, cut into the vessel wall. So that's why rotablator is generally, once uh, uh, in hands of experience operator, is reasonably safe. The lesion modification with rotablator is something like this. You have a concentric plaque with superficial, lot of circumferential calcium and the 1.25 or 1.5 millimeter bar or 1.75 millimeter bar cuts a small hole into this calcium. And that hole or dissection allows the vessel to be expanded by a non-compliant or a larger balloon, and then you can expand the stent better. With rotablator, I, I, I'm not going to go into details of how to do a rotablator, so I will skip this part. And another device which is now available, and that is the orbital atherectomy system, and that is uh, now available in India. Uh, very few has uh, good experience, I mean, uh, significant experience with that. But hopefully, in uh, coming few months, we will have more and more experience with this. The only limitation to my mind is the cost. The calcium fracture with orbital atherectomy system is, again, very controlled. And even um, to many uh, operators, it is superior to rotational atherectomy. But again, it has it's a very niche product. Even more niche product is Excimer Laser Coronary Angioplasty, ELCA, which has photothermal, photochemical, and photomechanical uh, effects on the vessel wall. And it allows this kind of uh, expansion of uh, the lumen of the, uh, and creates much larger MLD compared to routine balloon. And the device which has taken everyone uh, uh, everywhere it has gone into uh, it has uh, created buzz is the shockwave lithotripsy. It's a, it's a simple balloon. You deliver it. It is little difficult to deliver, so you need predilatation. And sometimes in very heavily calcific lesions, you may need to do a rotational retrectomy, and then only you can deliver the shockwave. But it is a very useful device by uh, ultrasound energy. It creates fractures in the calcium uh, or calcific plaque, and that allows the good expansion of the stent. Another uh, example of plaque modification is in chronic total occlusion, and that is uh, when you use a STAR technique or SPM, subintimal plaque modification. The STAR technique is basically subintimal tracking and re-entry. The wire is knuckled into the subintimal space to create a cleavage plane, and then the prolapsed wire is advanced until there is a spontaneous re-entry. Sometimes you use a device like Stingray to achieve the re-entry, and then you basically kind of bypass the lesion and go through subintima into the distal lumen and stent it. So this is called a uh, STAR technique and uh, the method is subintimal plaque modification where you intentionally dilate the subintimal 
optimal space of CTO segment with a balloon. It is pretty safe. And uh, as you can see in uh, this meta-analysis, uh, the maze rate is not different uh, uh, compared to the routine techniques and perforation rates are also uh, uh, very similar. So it's safe. It has. It is. Uh, it basically improves the patient-reported health status at 30 days. And uh, many times you do star or uh, subintimal plaque modification, and then not do the stenting. Bring the patient back after uh, after a week or a few weeks, which shows improved distal runoff, and then you can stent, and this results into better long-term stent stent patterns. I'll just show you an example of uh, uh, a plaque modification. We go to the summary, please. Okay, I will go to the summary. This patient had a lot of calcium and it would not have been possible to dilate without plaque modification. I'll just go to the summary. So take home message is plaque modification is essential in fibrocalcific lesions, osteo lesions and certain CTO as well as bifurcation cases. Imaging side by side is very important in identifying the need for plaque modification and in controlling the outcome during PCI. Yes, Samir, Samir, your concluding remarks. Concluding remarks, Samir. Okay, I I just showed that uh, concluding remark is that each device has a niche value in plaque modification, be it uh, cutting balloon, rotational atherectomy, or shock wave. And now we have orbital atherectomy and ELCA, and it is important to uh, get good operating proficiency in each of these devices when we are dealing with complex cases uh, in PCI. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Uh, it, it was a beautiful and erudite uh, lecture on the plaque modification, which is very, very important in uh, PCI. In the interest of the time, uh, we are inviting Dr. Dhiman Kahali for his next uh, deliberation that is on left main PCI tips and tricks. Dr. Uh, Kahali, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dash, for inviting me. And uh, I'm just going to share the screen. The internet is very weak today in BMB <laughs> and I was in a with a lot of slow flow, so I was a little delayed, but you know, I try to uh, you have a few so slides. respected chairs. And yeah, Shamit, thank you for your beautiful lecture. And uh, yeah, you can see, I think, Minal. Yeah, we can see, uh, but uh, the uh, so I'm going to talk about to tips on. and tricks in left main PCI. Yeah, Are, am I audible? Am I audible? You are audible. Okay. Okay. So let me PCI tips and tricks and why it is such a big issue. Because the myocardial geopardy is extensive and does not leave much room for fault consequences. It can be technically challenging also. It demands proper planning and substantial expertise. We will try to not to do it on an ad hoc basis unless the patient has got some ACS or acute MI situation. It operates within the dark gray zone of current revascularization guidelines. Sometimes it's a class 2B indication. And this is the picture what we see in the distal left main bifurcation. You can see it almost always involves the origin of the circumflex and LAD. And these are the 
pictorial uh, graphs. This is an osteal stenosis I showed in TCT last time. This is the mid shaft stenosis, and this is a distal stenosis with significant lesion. And impact on prognosis, uh, especially in the elderly patient, if the patient has LV dysfunction, he has associated valvular pathology like a tight uh, aortic stenosis, emergent presentation, he is in shock, diabetes, because many of these patients on acute presentations are in shock, diabetes, presence of renal dysfunction, and if the Euroscore and syntax is high. This is how it looks, calcified, more than 50% of cases. Sometimes in about 70% of cases, it is associated with multivessel disease, and the majority of the time, it's in distal left main location, more than 70% of the situation. How it looks? It's a picture, uh, IVUS and OCT both, and you can see there is a lot of fibro fatty tissues over there. And uh, this was the CT image also on the right-hand side, and this is the left main 3D angiographic images. You can see a tight left main lesion before we intervene, and it is after we have intervened. You can see the distal left main, very tight lesion. So the fundamental issues remains CABG versus PCI. And now from the Excel trial and other many other trials from Parks Institute and other trials, we have come to know that CABG and PCI are equipotent. And there is not a lot of much of a difference in the mortality, neither in the mess and the incidence of stroke is much less in this population. And regarding procedural safety and effectiveness, PCI planning is mandatory. Long-term consequences are also sometimes not very clear. Now, these are the favorable uh, indications for PCI because before taking, we should uh, gauge that how the patient will behave, like osteal left. We can place the stent from the osteum. And as you know, the left uh, cranial view angulation LAO cranial is one of the best views for uh, seeing these patients. And while, uh, you know, putting the stents, we can go to RAO caudal or AP caudal views also to corroborate our findings. And we should take out the uh, this catheter a little uh, from the osteum so that we can place it right from the osteum. Mid-shift is a, a rather easy story. But majority of cases, we pre-dilate all the lesions. We put the stent, post-dilate with the stent balloon in our country. And then we post-dilate. Suppose we go for a 3.5 or 4 millimeter stent in left main, in majority of the patient, whatever it looks. And then we post-dilate with the 4.5 milliliter. Isolated left main disease. Left main diameter is usually more than 3.5 millimeter, almost always. And we should look also the patent RCA, because if the RCA has a CTO lesion, that becomes a relative contraindication for doing a left main lesion unless we have Impella or some other MCS procedure. No uh, number of mildly calcified or heavily calcified, good LV function, heavily calcified lesions are always unfavorable lesions. Now, problematic for PCI, if it has a distal left main, osteal LED, SARC, all are involved. Sharp LED circumflex angles means narrow angle. There is heavy calcification. As Shamir was telling, we have to go for uh, rota or nowadays with IVL or sometime rota tripsy. After rota, we find the results are not very good and we have to go for a IVL with 80 pulses delivered. And left main diameter less than 3.5. Sometimes, of course, it looks like that, but the left main becomes 4 millimeter. Associated multivessel disease, occluded RCA, as I told, it's a relative contraindication, CTO RCA lesion in the presence of significant left main lesion, poor left ventricular function, and associated how it looks from the inside after we do the stenting and a PCI considerations in left main PCI. Strategy in is PCI, direct versus non-direct stenting. Uh, very seldom we go for direct stenting. So we almost always go for pre-dilatation followed by stenting post-dilatation and post-dilatation with a higher balloon. And need for lesion debulking, as Shomit told, if the patient has got a uh, calcified uh, lesion, we go for rota. Rota is uh, economical in our country. However, we have got nowadays IVL sometimes, as I told, rota plus IVL. Bifurcation techniques, uh, there is... Uh, uh, you know, the little difference between the Dr. Chen from China, Nanjing, 
and what the European group tells, including Dr. Colombo and the European Bifurcation Society, uh, you know, they always tell that we should go for a single stand. I asked Dr. Chen last Sunday, I think, in a conference of Sky, that uh, why you advocate two stand technology in contradistinction to uh, Euro. European bifurcation club. So his answer was very clear cut. He told that EBC has taken simpler lesions, uh, 15 millimeter in length, side branch length was five to seven millimeter in length, mean length, and the side branch disease was not so severe and the, it was not multivessel disease in our series, means his series. It was, he was the, he is the pioneer investigator for DK cross three, four, five, six now. And uh, he has told that the mean lesion length was 51 millimeter, the side branch length was 15 millimeter. And as we know, that if the side branch means circumflex is more than 2.5 millimeter, and here comes the necessity for doing IVAS. And, uh, you know, if the IVAS shows that the sarc origin ostium has significant disease, we go for, uh, you know, stenting. And I think DK crash or culot is one of the best. Uh, treatment modality and I will show uh, pictorially how it goes and adjunctive technology IVAS to see MLA, mean luminal area we have to see RVD, reference vascular diameter also, vessel diameter also we have to see. Third, we have to see how much calcification there is and fourth, after putting the stent optimization of the stem. Sometimes we find that after IVAS angiographically, everything looks to be fine, but we find with IVAS that some of the strands, the strands are under expanded. Of course, in our country and also in Europe, in 15 to 20 percent cases of all left main procedures, we go for IVAS because of financial reason. Also, but in uh, EVAS and some other portions of the Europe, they go for 100 out of 100 IVAS in uh, left wing. But the same person like Dr. Shamin Sharma, Shamin Sharma was telling last week that uh, he does, I asked him and he told that he does uh, in about 15% of cases IVAS or OCT. He does mainly IVAS, not much of OCT, but uh, in, I, in left main lesions, he tries to go in 100% of the left main for IVAS. But that is not the experience with Frenek or uh, some other uh, legions in Europe who go for 50 to 20 percent of IVAS in the left main. So these are the nitty gritties because we are a poor developing country and we should cut our coat accordingly. And regarding the late outcome, long term propedogrel or presugrel, increasingly literature is showing again some U turn that clopidogrel is not very much inferior to presugrel or but initially for the first three months, we can presugrel and aspirin in a low dose. And then after one or two months, presugrel, we can come down to five milligram or we can de-escalate from presugrel or ticagrelot to clopidogrel. And sometimes it is told that repeat angiography or cardiac CTA, but I have a patient who was away for six before that I did his stenting and he didn't have any checkup with me also but his left main is fine and uh, you know the stent is there uh, we put a DS good stent and he's doing fine he's an obese person not too much of uh, compliant also and I told him that in Kobe there are so many good cardiologists why you didn't consult them but he has done like that and he's doing well so the you know because it's a large vessel left main the outcome is good in the majority of patients and Initially, it was uh, told that one should go within six months a repeat angiography. But now the dictum has changed. It was a 2005 SECHA Sky recommendation, but it has reversed now. Now, regarding austere left main stenting, debulting or cutting balloon, if the calcification is heavy, we have to go for rota. Stent position is very important. I told about the views. It's very important to see in the cranial LAO view Ali. that gives a good idea Ali, that we are Okay, optimal expansion with IVAS guidance, osteal and mid left main stenting. You can see another case. And this is the diffuse calcified left main stenosis. And major determinants of procedural success, vessel diameters, angle between left main to LAD and circumflex, 
Presence of an intermediate branch, plug distribution, plug composition, potential for plug shifting, need for lesion preparation. So we have to prepare the lesion very well. This is another case where the osteal LED uh, is very much uh, diseased as the left main bifurcation. And this is the way uh, we go. And this is the architecture after uh, provisional stenting. And this is a trifurcation case. There is a lot of discussion in the Euro PCR. And this is how complex crystal a uh, left main equivalent disease occurs. Uh, there is a beautiful case of e-stenting. I won't be able to show you in a patient with ACS with a cholesterol familial cholesterol. You can see the starts are opposed. And the two stent is this is just, uh, just I'm finishing, Gurjati. Uh, this is the DK crash step-by-step -step approach. They have dilated the side branch. We have dilated the main branch. We have put the stent in the side branch with a portion of it in the left branch, crushed it from the main branch part. So first part after uh, side branch stenting, this is the again the kissing balloon inflation. Now the stent is opposed at high pressure. Now again part after second stenting, main branch stenting part, and then kissing balloon after initial dilatation of the side branch. Uh, I can't show you the cases. Uh, but uh, this is one of the cases with 111 uh, Medina classification. The patient came after initial thrombolysis. He had stenting somewhere 300 kilometers away some time back. And the patient had a successful thrombolysis. All the arteries LED related in fault. You can see it. And we have done very uh, successful uh, stenting of the left main. You see the, how we done kissing. And we have gone for a tap technique in this case. And the results were very good. So this is another case. Uh, some dissection occurred. And we have covered the dissection. Sometimes we have this sort of complications. But we, we have to know how to manage them. I cannot show any more uh, uh, cases. Because Dr. Dhujyoti is telling that I am out of time. But to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, uh, left main stenting is not that difficult. If we follow the guidelines, proper planning, ad hoc situation, and proper, if we think that a city is to be done, we can go for a city also to see the CalCP garden and how is the, uh, you know, situation in the LED ostium and circumflex ostium. And usually we give it from LM to LED. And then we think about the circumflex ostium. And if it is more than 2.5 millimeter, if the lesion length is more than 10 millimeter, and uh, if the uh, lesion looks to be more than 70%, uh, then we can go for a FFR or otherwise we can go, go for a kissing balloon inflation if the results are not very good and we find there is substantial plug button. Then you have a tap technique, put a uh, you know stent across the ostium and uh, finish by kissing balloon inflation and final part. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kahali, for uh, Thanks, giving all the tips and tricks. Uh, uh, because of the time, you could not show many of the cases, but uh, definitely we'll be listening to all this later on if we get the chance. And now I request Dr. Uh, Prakash Mandal to present his deliberation on co uh, coronary lesions choice of stents. Over to Dr. Uh, Mandal, please. Am I visible, sir? My slides are visible? Yes, yes, Dr. Prakash. I'm going ahead then. Coronary lesions, choice of stains in view of acute coronary syndrome. Respected chairpersons and all the seniors, uh, inflammatory reactions to polymers may be of higher relative importance in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, which rather than in compared to stable coronary artery disease. High thrombus burden and penetration of struts, that's a good important thing into plaques with necrotic core are specific characteristic of intervention in this setting of acute coronary syndrome, which may affect the vessel healing post -tending. You can see in all acute coronary syndrome, the plaques are unstable, inflamed, either eroded or ruptured. So they will allow the stain starts to go in within the core of the plaque. And best design differences regarding drugs, we know lemurs are definitely superior to others. Stain platform, now it is acceptable that clover chromium or platinum chromium are the favorable choices. Now regarding polymer, there are some 
queries still prevailing, whether biodegradable or durable, and release kinetics may affect the outcome. So stain design progression, there is my changes with time, stainless steel to cobalt chromium, cobalt nickel, now platinum chromium. I think this is platinum chromium or cobalt chromium are more acceptable. And vascular response to this polymer is one of the determinant of inflammation, local vascular inflammation, neotherosclerosis or thrombosis risks. And in COVID era, this thrombosis risk is now a culprit. I have seen at least seven thrombotic strain thrombosis in last one and a half year in compared to five or six in last 10 years before COVID era. So drug loading strains have definitely improved outcome of PCI, but the polymer used in first generation or second generation are blamed to have a chronic inflammatory response which lead to strain oriented adverse outcome that is strain thrombosis or restenosis. Strategies to mitigate these adverse effects were development of biocompatible durable polymer or a development of biodegradable polymer. Now, head-to-head -head comparison between this durable polymer or biodegradable polymer. There is a study presented in the last year TCT, that is host reduced polytech ACS trial, and with an endpoint that Primary outcome of POCO, that is patient oriented composite outcome at 12 months, and also device related, that is device oriented composite outcome DOCO at 12 months. This study has shown this is the trial flow. You can see more or less comparable number, and this number of lesions and their characteristics are more or less equally distributed. And primary outcome in these two groups shows this biodegradable polymers is having a bit ahead in regarding outcome. And also in secondary outcome also, biodegradable polymers are bit ahead of durable polymer. And regarding subgroup analysis, that shows if we go for sub analysis regarding diabetes, CKD, and other multiple lessons, and total length and strain number, most of the thing uh, favors that is durable polymer. but in ACS, it is biodegradable polymer is more favorable. And postdoc analysis also shows that thin start stains are associated with greater thrombogenicity. And there is thick start stain or greater thrombogenicity. That means we should favor thin start stain and also biodegradable polymer. And in this durable polymer group, PROMAS was included, resolute ionics, giant sulfine, but in bio. And another group that is Ultimaster or Syro and Synergy. So, conclusion from that study shows that ESCS patients who had a significant coronary stenosis and eligible for stent implantation, durable polymer DACE was non inferior to biodegradable polymer. That means more or less same. The thing was coming that biodegradable should go ahead of durable polymer, but that is not the thing. It is Biodegradable and durable polymer behaves more or less same at one year, but it needs further evaluation also. This biostemi trial that shows the sirolimus eluting stain with ultra thin start, either 60, that is, if the stain length is less than 30, it is 60, if it is more than 30 millimeter, then it is 80, to have this integrity of the stain regarding radial stain and coconut. An absorbable polymer was non inferior to standard eurolimus eluting stain with durable polymer. And that's, that means if the strain start thickness has got a local hemodynamic force alteration, and Dr. Kajalwang was showing some no flow can be evaluated by coronary Doppler. This is also by evaluated by coronary Doppler. That's so thick start stain have more of local internal middle area, there is turbulence flow because of thick start. And that is much less with thinner start stain. This is an example of 26 years male. That suppose if there is a co-founding variable is there, like this patient having CLD with portal hypertension and esophageal varies and basically admitted with GIV, but develop a massive anterior wall MI. And the hemoglobin was still maintained after infusion, the blood transfusion, but he is a substrate having a bad comorbidity that is CLD with portal hypertension and esophageal varices with the history of recurrent GI bleed and also past history of NHL treated by chemotherapy at the age of nine years. So his has his blood 
three, that means ARC score regarding bleeding risks will be around 4.94. That means it will be in the gray zone. It is not in the safe zone. And this is the, this is the lesson on coronary angiogram. This is a osteoproximal LAD. Location-wise, it is a very important area. We have dilated with balloon with protection for the diagonal wire also. This is the post balloon OCT that shows minor dissections at the lesion sites. And it was tinted with a resolute onyx stain 4 into 38. This is a relatively thin start stain. And with good outcome. And this is the final result. I think result is very good. We have evaluated with post and OCT. And this is the final OCT. That shows good stent apposition without any residual defect, no edge dissection. That means I want to confirm it whether I can reduce this DAPT duration to 30 days. That was my intention of this 3D OCT to evaluate the post stent result. I think there is a good apposition. There is no stent distortion or any strat is not in contact that is not there. And this 3D OCT confirms that. And on follow up, I have given eco spin for continue and clopidogrel only 30 days. Atravastatin has continued in view of CLD, it was only 20 milligram, and propanolol for prevention of, of to reduce the portal pressure. And evidences of stopping DAPT at 30 days, there are some evidences are there. Evolved short DAPT poem all shows that. We can stop, particularly stop DFT 2 and master DFT that shows one month versus 12 months. There is no much of difference in mess. So, low drug. And so, just a short another case there is a COVID positive patient, 29 years male, diabetic smokers, having and was on high flow nasal oxygen in a COVID hospital, developed sudden onset chest pain, ECG suggests elevation on beyond to V6. And one avian, he was formalized in a place, but pain continued and needed ionotropic support and developed VT with hemodynamic collapse and reverted with DC shock. Developed pulmonary edema, put on NIV with other measures, transferred by support ambulance to our hospital. This is the CT at emergency. You can see the extensive involvement with COVID. And this is the ECG at our emergency. There was persistent ST elevation, ongoing chest pain. This is the coronary angiogram. We have gone for intervention immediately with support. And you are stented with a 3.538 Giants expedition stain. With a very good result. So, but you can see. This patient died on third day due to VTGF. And before we enter to this COVID ICU, the patient died. I think it is a, a presumed to be a VTGF, maybe due to stent thrombosis. Now that means we are tackling ACS in this COVID era who had either a past COVID history or vaccinated or Presently having COVID, active COVID. In this scenario, this thrombogenicity of stain and outcome should also be considered in, besides the characteristics of stain, either of its drug or platform or its polymer. So in conclusion, a low drug load with predominant use of lemas agents, thinner start strains, Biodegradable polymers or permanent polymers with a more biocompatible profile like Giants, Synergy, or your Regulatonics, and preferential use of cobalt chromium or platinum chromium platform. This will be my choice in SS. The stains which are fulfilling these four criteria, they are the preferable stent of choice in SS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prakash, uh, both for concluding within the stipulated time.
am doing an excellent uh, presentation about what should be the choice, firm recommendation of what should be the choice of stents. That I think should go a long way to the under our uh, um, uh, older class students who are starting their careers. Now it is my present duty to invite Dr. Ramesh Dagubati, who is a good friend of Cardiological Society of India. He's an overseas member of the Cardiological Society of India. He's an excellent teacher and an experienced interventionist in all forms of cardiac intervention, who is now stationed in the USA. Let him speak on is transcatheter intervention going to be the feature of mitral valvular disease management. Uh, this is a pre-recorded uh, lecture. Uh, support team, please start his lecture. Please start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to join you today. I'll be talking on is transcatheter intervention going to be the future of mitral valvular disease management? <laughs> These are my disclosures. The challenges of mitral valve as compared to aortic valve are multiple. I think we need to just uh, not think about uh, the valve leaflets, whether they're stenosed or uh, uh, regurgitation. But there are many other places that we need to think about that are the capillary muscles, cordae, and the muscle itself of the left ventricle. So let's start off with the journey on the mitral valve transcatheter interventions is case selection for mitral clip of primary or secondary. The, is the pro problem mainly the valve or is it the ventricle? So if the valve is a problem that is usually mixomatous or a uh, prolapse or a uh, ruptured uh, a flail leaflet, or whether it is, uh, you know, if the ventricle that is uh, primarily probably an ischemic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy that actually can cause co malcoactation of the leaflets that you can see here. So in one of the first and foremost things that we need to realize is that not everything can be clipped. Here is a degenerative mitral regurgitation of mixed matters, uh, my, mitral valves, that probably these are the ones that cannot be clipped. But what about uh, what are the things that can be clipped and what should we do before uh, uh, doing any transcatheter mitral valve interventions? Number one, the most important thing is uh, uh, no medical option is available for the valve and uh, surgery for symptoms or uh, LV systolic dysfunction and uh, asymptomatic if uh, repairable and uh, low risk patients. In secondary as well, the medical therapy comes first and then consider CRT pacing, and uh, surgery only in highly selected patients with heart failure. So wherever now surgery is being done, whether it is primary or in secondary, we can replace that with transcatheter valve interventions. This is my first patient in 2009, severe mitral regurgitation, an 84-year-old man deemed inoperable by two cardiac surgeons at that time. Patient was enrolled in the Everest uh, Realism Registry and uh, as you can see, severe mitral regurgitation here, and uh, that after two hours from skin to skin post clip deployment, a severe mitral regurgitation was uh, became uh, one plus mitral regurgitation. And if you look at uh, what are the available uh, uh, devices for transcatheter mitral valve interventions, the leaflet repair is uh, FDA approved as mitral clip. And several others are probably in development, as you can see, mm -hmm. indirect annuloplasty, direct annuloplasty, and caudal repair, and, uh, and enhanced coaptation and LV remodeling devices are all ongoing as well. And, you know, in Europe, uh, Edwards Pascal system is also approved uh, uh, as well. And uh, here in clinical trials, it is still being done in the United States. Five-year results of Everest II, which is the most important the initial transcatheter valve intervention, even prior to actually TOWER, showed that uh, survival at uh, five years is similar with the uh, device versus surgery. It was a two-to-one randomization. Uh, every two patients that were randomized to device, one was randomized to surgery, and the 30-day mortality was only 6%. 
And then we did another trial for uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, which is the coapt uh, primary effectiveness endpoint was uh, all hospitalization for heart failure within 24 months. And as you can see here, the guideline directed medical therapy alone uh, resulted in uh, uh, 283 events in 151 patients. Whereas in the uh, MitroClip Plus guideline directed medical therapy uh, resulted in 160 uh, events in 92 patients. Obviously, that was very statistically uh, uh, significant uh, in the COAP study. It also showed that mortality is different, uh, favoring uh, MitroClip uh, Plus guideline directed medical therapy in secondary mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful picture of a 3D mitroclip, and uh, once it is placed immediately, you can see that uh, almost similar to an Alfieri stitch between A2 and P2 segments, the clip is deployed, and there's a now double inlet mitral valve uh, limiting um, uh, mitral regurgitation. So here, there are different types of uh, uh, mitroclip, uh, NT, NTR, XTR, and mitroclip. Uh, generation four, which is uh, now what we are using in the United States with the improved leaflet grasping and greater MR reduction in complex cases. And you can do a, a single leaflet grasp at one time, prior that posterior or uh, uh, anterior. And in the future, Gen 5, actually enhanced steering accuracy and improved uh, ease of use is going to be there. The basics in mitroclip procedure, transeptal puncture, left atrial navigation, orientation of the mitral valve, and clip implant and valve assessment. So the mitral clip device appears to be very complex, as I showed you in our first slide, compared to a tower, how great it is in uh, uh, steerability and everything. And as you can see, that uh, that device is complex, but the clip is very small. And there are grippers and the clip arms between which the, the, the leaflets are grasped. And we have a stabilizer, we have a, a guide catheter and a clip delivery system that actually makes a lot of moments to get the results, the final results, which are excellent. First of all, we start off with the transeptal puncture about four centimeters in height, uh, above the mitral annulus minimum, and it was probably better to get even four and a half to five centimeters. And uh, so this is uh, about the coaptation point that uh, we need to have that height. And uh, using an explain in transesophageal uh, echo uh, cardiogram is very important and understanding a TEE and on uh, basics of uh, uh, mitral valve and TEE is important for us interventionists to learn. The left atrial navigation here is a guide catheter that is in place and uh, where bubbles are coming through the flushes that are ongoing. And through the guide catheter, then we advance the clip delivery system and uh, utilizing uh, both the 2D and 3D uh, we can easily get the mitral clip navigated towards the uh, leaflets, uh, which are here. Uh, there's a, a anterior and mildly posterior leaflet prolapse. And once uh, the clip orientation is uh, important, that in the, in the long, uh, long axis of the LVOT view, you can see that uh, the clip arms should be very much visible to be able to grasp. And as you know that uh, this clip is going mostly towards the posterior, so you might have to put an anterior torque on the guide to do it. And uh, so explain and using that and where the significant MR is, and uh, as you can see, sorry about that, you can see that grasping the leaflets is very important and uh, you can reduce the MR significantly. Okay. Sometimes you might have to do more than one clip and uh, using fluoro also will help and uh, you know it, it is very important uh, as long as the tip of the mitral clip is moving with guidance the knob articulation can be driven through left atrium and you can check in both in uh, as we said in 2d as well as on 3d which we prefer 3d mostly to look at the clip arm orientation that has to be perpendicular to the uh, closure of the mitral uh, mitral valve leaflets and so be able to be able to grasp the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets. So here it's beautifully being brought up and uh, the grippers were dropped as you see the bubbles were there and grasping the leaflets both anterior and posterior. This is the anterior leaflet, that's the posterior leaflet. 
and then you tighten the uh, uh, the mitral clip and you're able to reduce it significantly and you can place another second clip if you want to reduce this mitral regurgitation as well after checking the gradients and making sure the mitral valve gradient is not more than uh, six millimeters or five millimeters because you don't want to create mitral stenosis for these patients as well. So in some understanding uh, 3D uh, is of key importance and uh, so it can help with the efficiency and a person with the hand on catheter should drive the catheter and the echo and the procedure. Here is a patient with a subacute um, uh, mitral regurgitation with a shock 45 year old uh, male with a month of a progressive shortness of breath and abdominal pain, atrial fibrillation with RVR, elevated LFTs, INR was 2 creatin 1.7. TTE showed severe mitral regurgitation with the uh, flail P2 segment, EF35% and RV failure. Cardiac cat showed a cardiac index of 1.5, which of 30, with V-waves up to 45, and uh, PA systolic was 64. The coronaries were patent and IAPP was placed and transferred to us. Subacute the mitral regurgitation with the shock is seen, as you can see here in the severe MR. And that was treated with the clips here, as you can see, um, uh, very, very well. And, uh, you know, the MR reduction is going to be done very soon. And in the intercommissural view, uh, as you can see, the clip leaflets are going to be uh, coming into this picture. So here, uh, with the one uh, uh, intercommissural view, you can see the confirmation of the leaflet grasping. and it's still attached uh, uh, to the guide catheter. And there is still a, a very good grasp and a very minimal amount of, uh, of uh, uh, regurgitation uh, on the medial aspect of the clip. And uh, in the pre and post, you can see that, uh, that the flail leaflet is now very much uh, captured. And a couple of ways to look at it is uh, pulmonary venous, uh, pulmonary vein flow reversal was now eliminated in the pre clip. You can see that there is a, a systolic reversal, and uh, whereas now at least there is a, a systolic uh, uh, blunting. So the favorable outcome, as you can see, the LA pressures, which were up to 45, now have come down to 25, and the V waves are very good. So what anatomic criteria preclude repair with just mitral clip alone? And do we need anything else for transcatheter mitral valve interventions? The calcification of clefts in the A2 and P2 scallops, severe MAC, mitral stenosis with the mitral valve area less than four, flail width of more than 15, flail gap more than 10 millimeters, and commissural mitral regurgitation. And too much redundant leaflet tissue may not be able to address with mitral clip. So we cannot have a transcatheter mitral valve interventions just for those uh, people who have all the good features. But so we do have to think about how to eliminate the need for surgery, uh, whether it is a valve replacement or leaflet repair, who meets uh, who needs what, depends upon the pathoanatomy of mitral regurgitation and, uh, and also uh, of the prolapse flail length. If the flail length is more and the valve area is less than four, you would need a valve replacement. If the valve area is between four and five, you can take care of with a leaflet repair with mitral clip. If the valve area is more than five, you might need to do annuloplasty and leaflet repair. And this is all in degenerative MR. Whereas in uh, as a functional mitral valve replacement, uh, mitral valve disease, if the valve area is less than four, you can either do mitral valve replacement if there is apical tethering, and if there is posterior tethering, you can do leaflet repair or annuloplasty. And if there is any valve area in the more than uh, uh, four and uh, four and a half or so, you might have to do mitral clip and annuloplasty or a valve replacement completely. As I said, nobody would love to go through surgery and how we can avoid that is actually having different devices. Here is a neocord device and uh, which actually showed that uh, uh, it can uh, uh, grasp the caudal leaflets and be tethered to the apex and also be combined with uh, uh, some other uh, devices uh, such as annuloplasty. And the freedom from reoperation according to mitral valve anatomical type has been shown that uh, 
uh, you can see that uh, uh, you don't have to operate or uh, again on these patients in about uh, 100% of the people who have uh, just purely cord caudal dysfunction and if they have uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, about 80% of the patients do not need uh, reoperation still just with the neocord and actually probably using an annuloplasty band. So here is a nice picture of uh, uh, how preoperative versus postoperative the people who have a severe MR uh, were, were able to be treated without any significant mitral regurgitation. Is that all? And but uh, as I said, that sometimes we have to do transcatheter mitral valve replacement and human use, and there have been several ones. Evoke or Cardiac Q Edwards and uh, Tiara has gone out of favor now. Abbott is what we are doing, trialing out in uh, our center. And some centers are using a high life Medtronic Interpret and Kason are all ongoing as well. Here is a 69-year-old uh, status post two prior bypass surgery, seen wall MI, EF 30 to 35, with the congestive heart failure function class three to four and severe functional mitral regurgitation as well. And, uh, and this patient, as you can see, severe MR and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And uh, we actually chose to uh, treat this patient uh, with the tendine. And uh, the tendine is going transatrical and uh, it goes to the left atrium. And then you open it up as a flower and bring it back down and then tie it uh, down to the uh, uh, to uh, the apex. So this is beautiful flower that's opening up and the anterior and posterior uh, uh, leaflets and as you can see the MR is completely eliminated and it can be tethered to the apex with this uh, 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 button. So tendine for severe MAC also has been done at our center and uh, uh, a complete uh, uh, resolution of the mitral regurgitation can be uh, 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 achieved with the tendine uh, um, valve in MAC. So there are several limitations of current uh, DMVRs, uh, you know, variable anatomy and uh, damage to the LV function, chordate tendon damage or LV structural damage can happen and LVOT obstruction can happen as well. If there is LVOT obstruction, you might have to do alcohol subclavulation in these patients. So the anatomical challenges, as I mentioned, mitral valve uh, compared to aortic valve, but mitral valve is large, asymmetric shape, no clear landmarks and closing pressures are higher. And the device challenges are delivery, fixation, seal, and most importantly, LVOT obstruction, which is a concern in about eight to nine percent of the patients. The future uh, is uh, still very bright. From transapical, we might be moving very quickly to transatrial or transeptal. So the early outcomes of mitral valve replacement have been slightly, you know, different for uh, different trials. Some, as I said, TRA has gone out of business because of the. Uh, 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 higher chance of mortality. And uh, even cardiac U from Edwards had to be redesigned and evoke is a new trial that they are working on. But the uh, tendine so far has been good in uh, having low mortality with, uh, at 30 days. Obviously, it is a very good start uh, for a transcatheter mitral valve replacement with their encouraging results. We now have improved understanding patient selection and technique is important. And further work is ongoing as well. So even though the mitral valve uh, repair to replacement is a natural transition, but this transition will take some time. And operator and institutions with transcatheter mitral repair experience will have an advantage. Obviously, we must resist temptation to perform these procedures outside clinical trials. Enrollment in clinical trials will be crucial for this field to mature. And my take-home messages are that uh, you know, MitroClip is the only uh, FDA-approved device currently. But mitral clip cannot treat all patients. But knowing anatomy of the mitral valve helps in choosing the right therapy. At our center and multiple other centers in the United States, summit trial will show whether mitral clip or transcatheter mitral valve replacement with tendine is better. Repair MR and primary MR, which we are the centers for, for as well, will address mitral clip versus actually surgery in low risk patients. Intrepid and evoke trials are ongoing as well in other centers. So I think the future is very bright for transcatheter mitral valve uh, interventions. And I think every type of mitral valve disease could be treated with the transcatheter uh, technique in the future. With that, 
Thank you, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Dagobati, for your beautiful uh, and elaborate uh, expression and deliberation on mitral valve disease intervention. And I think, as you concluded, uh, the, uh, the future is very bright with the development of the technique. Definitely, it will be the possibly the only choice rather than the surgery. So without wait, wasting much time, let us uh, uh, thank uh, uh, everyone and uh, let us go to the next session. Yeah. What? Thank, thank you, sir. So the next session is on fellow course on hemodynamics, the oximetry done. And the chairpersons for this session are Dr. T.S. Banerjee, Dr. Amol Kumar Khan, Dr. Bondita Das. And the session will be moderated by Dr. A. Sharkar and Dr. Kajal Ganguly. The speakers for this session are Dr. Devastri Gangopadhyay, Dr. A. Das Vishash, and Dr. Shiva Kumar. May I now request the speakers to take charge? Uh, just a little bit of change has been there because of some uh, uh, problem. Uh, with the Dr. Shiva Kumar actually had another uh, assignment. So Shiva Kumar will be giving the first lecture. Oh. Just bear with us. All the, all the, uh, what about the other chairperson who are designated for this session? Do Dr. P.S. Banerjee, Dr. Amal Kumar Khan and Dr. Bondita Das. Are they present? Okay. Uh, no, sir. And what about the other fellow, Dr. Sarkar and Dr. Ganguly? Are they present? Dr. Sarkar. Dr. Kajal Ganguly is present, sir. Dr. Kajal Ganguly, sir, is present. Okay. So we can go ahead with the first speaker. So I now invite the first speaker, Dr. Devusri Gangubadai. Yes, Dr. Shiva Kumar. Okay. Shiva. Okay. Carry on. Good evening, uh, Chairpersons. Uh, is my slide visible and I am audible? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Thank you very much. I thank Dr. M. K. Das, the uh, CSI West Bengal, Dr. Lipika Adhikari, and all others in uh, Calcutta to have considered me for this lecture in this fellow's course. Uh, the hemodynamic assessment in different forms of congenital heart disease is different because the aims for CAT differ in each heart disease. So when we come to the basics, we look at what is the cardiac output based on the oxygen consumption divided by the arteriovenous oxygen content difference. Oxygen content is calculated based on hemoglobin into the oxygen carrying capacity. And uh, the QP, QS and QEP are calculated based on formulae that involve pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, aorta and mixed veins. When coming to oxygen consumption, in majority of the cardiac centers in India, we use the Lafarge formula rather than a true respiratory mass spectrometry, which is available only in research labs. Vascular resistance is calculated based on the formula pressure between the aorta and right atrium divided by QS for SVR, PA minus LA by QP for PVR. So with this basics, let me get into the topic. Why do we catheterize left-right shunt lesions? In left-right shunt lesions, how do we decide about operability? If a patient is having symptoms of dyspnea and poor feeding, it's a sign of large shunt. Younger the age, usually the shunt is high and so they are often inoperable. If there is a clinical finding of a hyperkinetic chest, usually they are operable. If the x-ray shows large heart and plethora, usually they are considered operable. Similar findings in ECG when there is LV volume overload on a VSD or a PDA and similarly echocardiogram showing LV volume overload. And the last one, in pulse oximeter, if the saturations are more than 95%, usually they are operable. But there are fallacies. If suppose there is a significant lung disease, the same dyspnea and poor feeding will be there and it's difficult to differentiate from a heart failure. In spite of a very young age, a genetic and a syndromic child may be inoperable. The clinical findings of a large heart with a flow mid-diastolic murmur 
may not be acceptable if the patient is also having a coexistent MR or AR. Similarly, a chest X-ray, cardiomegaly and plethora can be there due to LV dysfunction or pulmonary venous hypertension for some other reason. ECG findings are non-specific. Echo shows LV enlargement in a VSD, but if there is an associated LV dysfunction or MR, then also LV dilatation will be there. Pulse oximeter saturation may depend on lung disease also. So there is a need for CAT in some patients where these rules cannot be followed. In general, in a post-tricuspid shunt lesion, if you have a large shunt lesion, aortic and pulmonary artery pressure will almost be similar. So in this case, how do we decide about operability? We, to decide on operability, we do use pulmonary vasodilator testing, sometimes with only oxygen or sometimes with additional agents. When you give oxygen in a patient with VSD, the same patient whom I showed the previous trace, the pulmonary artery pressure drops down in diastole, whereas it continues to remain the same in systole. So this fall in the diastolic pressure in a patient with ventricular septal defect is a sign of operability. How do we decide on vasodilator response when we use agents like nitric oxide or oxygen? The pulmonary artery mean should fall by 20%. The PVR should fall by 20%. If you use PVR by SVR ratio, it should fall by 20%. If you are using absolute PVR number, the PVR should be less than 6 units. The PVR-SVR ratio should be less than 0.3. And PA diastolic pressure to aortic diastolic pressure ratio should be less than 40%. The agents that are used in commonly in children is nitric oxide. In Western countries, they use nebulized iloprost or inhaler treprostinib. It's very rare to use hypoprostanol or aloprost infusions. Adenosine is not recommended in children. While I told that in, diast in, in, in VSD, there is a diastolic drop, in PDAs, actually there will be a systolic increase of the aortic pressure. The reason being, whenever there is a high QP, the higher LV stroke volume will result in higher aortic pressures but there will be a diastolic equalization because the diastole, both the aorta and PA will be equal. In general, the, the rules in a PDA as well as VSD will be mostly be the same. One additional method in PDA is balloon occlusion of the ductus where aortic pressure increases and the pulmonary artery pressure decreases. This is another rule that is used in deciding on operability in a PDA. Coming to pre-tricuspid lesions, Atrial septal defect may be associated with severe pulmonary hypertension in about 5 to 6% of the patients. In some of the patients, it may be due to progressive large shunt. In all these patients, the ASD is more than 2 cm and the patients are beyond 4th decade. But a small proportion may be presenting very prematurely in very young age where the ASD is often less than 2 cm and this is considered to be an idiopathic genetic PAH with a bystander ASD. In these patients, the operability criteria are if you are having QP by QS of more than 1.5, PVR index of less than 5 good units, PVR-SVR ratio less than 0.3. I have specified the PVRI uh, rules, ESC's rules, AHA's rules. In general, most of them mimic each other. And PA systolic by aortic systolic pressure ratio less than 0.5 to 0.6. The role of balloon occlusion is not well documented in PAH. In patients who are having borderline data, sometimes a strategy of close and treat is followed, in which case you use a fenestrated device to leave behind a pop-up. Another role for fenestrated device in patients with restrictive LV physiology where patients with associated coronary artery disease or diabetes or other coexistent diseases the basal LVED may be only 10 to 12, but the moment you go and occlude the ASD, the LVED increases to 25 to 26. And in these patients, penetrated devices may be the utili utili most utilized device. Coming to cyanotic heart diseases, the role of cardiac catheterization differs between different heart disease. In transposition, usually there is no need for a CAT study, but there are three exceptions. If we have a neonatal TGA with reverse differential cyanosis, that means the lower limb saturation is higher than the upper limb saturation. Usually this indicates TGA with coaptation and PDA. 
but sometimes it may be TGA with PDA and high pulmonary vascular resistance as in PPHN. In these cases, if we document a reverse differential cyanosis on oximetry, we use oxygen or sildenafil or appropriate ventilation to treat this high pulmonary vascular resistance and then take up these new bonds for corrective surgery. Sometimes older TGA is present with severely elevated vascular disease. The reason why TGA is prone for high vascular resistance is because of large amount of high AP collaterals or PDA which supply hypoxic blood to the pulmonary artery and that leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction. The pulmonary hypertension, high flows in the pulmonary artery along with hypoxia precipitates early pulmonary vascular disease. Transposition with VSD, almost 80% above the age of one year will be inoperable and about one third of the patients with the TGA and ASD after one year will be inoperable due to high pulmonary vascular resistance. There is another role for transposition getting CAT. If there is a regressed left ventricle, if you have an LV systolic pressure of less than two-third of aortic pressure, that is also considered unsuitable for arterial switch operation. Moving on to tetralogy of fallow, again, cath is not very commonly used, but there are some exceptions. Tetralogy with hypertensive PDA or hypertensive collaterals. This is an example of a tetralogy where the ascending iota is directly coming off from the right pulmonary artery. So the right pulmonary artery is at systemic pressures, but left pulmonary artery is very, very, very protected. So this is this patient will have a low pressure in the LPA and high pressure in the RPA. So in these cases, we may have to do a catheterization. We may have to use formula such as 1 by R, 1 by R1, 1 by R2 to identify what is the PVR. Tetralogies can be associated with massive epicollaterals. This is an example of a huge epicollateral causing severe pulmonary hypertension. In these cases also, we may have to sometimes use CAT to decide on hemodynamics. Admixture lesions, the last lesion, can be at atrial level where it is TAPVC or eight common atrium, ventricular level as single ventricular DORV, arterial level as truncus arteriosus, we calculate QS, QP, and also QEP. Effective pulmonary blood flow is calculated by oxygen consumption by PV minus mixed venous. And from the QEP, we calculate what is the amount of right to left shunt and what is the effect of left right shunt because admixture is a bidirectional shunt. In these patients, the general rule is if you are having any patient with univentricular physiology and the saturation is more than 85%, the QP is often higher and these patients are operable. But we need to remember, if the patient is very sick, moribund with heart failure, bronchopneumonia, mixed venous saturation may be very low. And in these cases, even a saturation of 75 may be operable. So there will be a need for catheterizing patients with admixture lesions to decide on operability. We also have to understand there is something called a streaming in admixture physiology. Streaming means there is favorable amount of higher oxygen saturations in aorta than in pulmonary artery. This is seen in DORV subbiotic VSD. Unfavorable streaming means aortic saturation is less than pulmonary artery saturation. This is seen in toxic Bing anomaly, but in majority of the cases, it will be absolutely be equal as in tricuspid atresia or pulmonary atresia. The last part is univentricular heart where you do bidirectional glen or fontan surgeries. There are certain fixed criteria. PA pressure should be less than 15. Transpulmonary gradient, which is PA mean minus PV mean, should be less than 6. Diastolic pulmonary gradient, which is PA diastolic minus PV mean, should be less than 3. Ventricular end diastolic pressure should be less than 12. Indexed PVR should be less than 4. But the fallacy is all these things will need QP calculation and QP will be based on nomogram. So there will be people who will wonder the Lafarge formula has got its own limitations. So in these cases, you can use cardiac MRI to calculate the QP and from the cardiac MRI calculated QP, go in for the pressures from catheterization and see what are the calculations. So the last to summarize, we have to understand the hemodynamics in cath lab in different forms of congenital heart disease because there is specific aim in each and every cath, whether it is a pre-tricuspidal shunt like ASD or a post-tricuspid shunt like BSD PDA or a TGA tetralogy, admixture lesion, or pre glen and pre fontan the aims differ in each and every catheterization procedure. 
Thank you very much. I would say that it is a little bit challenging to present a lecture within 12 minutes, but this is the best that can be done because of the limitations of the time. If there are any questions for the fellows, directly the fellows can text me and I'll be happy to reply to any hemodynamic related questions on my either WhatsApp or my email. Thanks a lot to Dr. Uh, Adhikari and Dr. M. K. Das for this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva Kumar, for an excellent lecture. Uh, and I call upon Dr. Devoshi Ganguly to uh, uh, give her deliberation on congenital heart disease. How chest X ray and ECG directs the path. Dr. Devoshi, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll just take one minute to start. Thank you, sir. And uh, I feel it's a huge honor for me to be a part of this um, excellent uh, academic meeting. And I thank uh, organizers, Dr. Lipika Odhikari and Dr. M.K. Das for kindly inviting me to join this uh, meeting. Um, in next uh, 12 minutes, I'm going to talk on the importance of X-ray and ECG in the diagnosis of uh, uh, congenital heart disease. So uh, before trying to before trying to interpret the X-ray and ECG, we should always ask about the patient's age and presence um, or absence of uh, cyanosis. So we should always try to interpret the X-ray in the context of the clinical features in the patient. While we are trying to um, deal with a patient with congenital heart disease, it is useful to remember the uh, broad classifications of congenital heart disease, which is done in four broad categories, left to right shunts, obstructive lesions, regurgitant lesions, and uh, cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease or right to left shunt. So this will help us to guide our questions and um, uh, physical examinations uh, in such a way so that we can narrow down the differential diagnosis on the bedside. So what is unique about pediatric ECG? In the, uh, when a baby is born, the heart is dominated by the right ventricle because in the fetal born, the right ventricular mass is higher, bigger than the left ventricular mass. So this right ventricular dominance, a change from the right ventricular dominance in the newborn period to the adult left ventricular dominance happens somewhere between the age of four to five years. And while we are trying to interpret an ECG um, around this time, we should be cautious and careful uh, in making a judgment about what is normal and what is abnormal. Um, when we are uh, interpreting uh, ECGs or X-ray, uh, which belongs to patients with congenital heart disease, we should make uh, we should make note of key features on uh, ECG. So we should try to interpret uh, the P and QRS axis for uh, on the ECG, and we should try to see clockwise or anticlockwise, or that has got uh, diagnostic implication. We should try and determine the ventricular dominance. Presence of Q wave uh, should be noted in the precordial lead or in the uh, or in the limb leads because that has got uh, implication to diagnose chamber enlargement, ischemia, and and also helps in ventricular localization. The key features on chest X-ray should be uh, noted, and those are cardiac situs, determination of cardiac situs, type of cardiac enlargement, whether it is the uh, right ventricular or left ventricular type of enlargement. The lung field should be carefully assessed for plethora or oligemia, or whether there is patchy uh, lung vascularity. Uh, we should also check for uh, upper lobe congestion, which could mean venous hypertension, and main pulmonary artery segment should be carefully assessed. Now, to keep things simple and interesting, I have decided to include uh, a few clinical examples which are common and which we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, first, to begin with left to right shunt lesions. So, uh, this is a ECG from a five-year-old boy, ECG from a five-year-old boy who presented with incidental diagnosis of murmur and there was no cyanosis um, and there was a two-on-six ejection systolic uh, murmur. Uh, over the second left intercostal space. The ECG shows uh, sinus rhythm, QRS axis between plus 90 to 100 degree, and there is incomplete right bundle branch block. 
the chest x-ray uh, shows cardiomegaly with uh, left ventri uh, with the uh, left ventricular type of apex um i'm sorry with the uh, right ventricular type of apex with prominent vein pulmonary artery segment and um, prominent hilar pulmonary artery so this was a case of a uh, echocardiography diagnosed ostium, ostium secunda asd this is a ecg uh, which belongs to a 18 month old boy who is clinically down syndrome and who has failure to thrive and a resting uh, tachypnea i cannot see the my uh, slides so i'm getting a little distracted i'll just make a little adjustment so that yes now it is better um so this is this ecg uh, belongs to an 18 month old boy uh, with uh, down syndrome uh, who has failure to thrive and has got resting tachypnea saturation of 99% the ecg shows uh, sign with biventricular hypertrophy which is characterized by um, uh, large qrs complexes large rs complexes over in the mid precordial leads and there is right incomplete right bundle branch block uh, qrs axis is plus 120 degree and there is deep q wave on lead v5 and v6 um the chest x ray of this uh, same baby which shows there is a a huge cardiomegaly with left ventricular type of apex and biatrial enlargement um, there is pulmonary plethora and uh, significantly increased uh, lung congestion so this uh, echocardiogram diagnosed to be this to be a case of large perimembranous ventricular septal defect now this ecg is uh, from a one year old girl uh, who uh, who has gross failure to thrive and has got frequent chest infections uh, uh, chest symptoms and her saturation is 96% there is a 3 on 6 ejection murmur in the left 3 uh, on 6 continuous murmur in the left parasternal area the ecg shows qrs axis to be plus 90 degree with a biventricular hypertrophy now the chest x ray again shows huge cardiomegaly with left ventricular type of apex there is prominent uh, right atrium and also there is double contour on the right border of the heart suggestive of left atrial enlargement and there is uh, lung plethora so this uh, this child was diagnosed on echocardiography to have a large cirrhosis now this is a is he from a 3 year old boy with resting saturation 93% there was a loud second heart sound and a 3 on 6 hollow systolic murmur in the lower left parasternal area ecg shows sinus rhythm with right atrial enlargement left axis deviation conspicuous by a, a prominent r wave on avl and uh, uh, dominant right ventricular forces with poor r wave progression on chest leads the extra from the same patient shows cardiomegaly with left ventricular type of apex prominent main pulmonary artery and central pulmonary arteries however there is prominent peripheral pruning of the lung vessels as we look to the periphery so this is a case of complete ab canal defect uh, with significant ab valve regurgitation and severe pulmonary arterial hypertension coming to uh, obstructive lesions now uh, this is a 3 month old boy with resting tachypnea and increased work of breathing there is gross failure to thrive on clinical uh, questioning and uh, there is a 3 on 6 ejection uh, murmur ecg shows normal qrs axis and left ventricular dominance now left ventricular dominance in a 3 month old boy is grossly abnormal there is also stt changes on b5 and b6 um, and also lid 1 avl uh, and uh, and lid 1 and avl so this is a case of critical aortic stenosis is with severe left ventricular dysfunction and uh, this ecg is taken from a 3 month old baby girl who uh, was referred for incidental diagnosis of murmur and she has got a good weight gain her saturation is 90% and there was a 3 on 6 ejection systolic murmur um ecg shows qrs axis of 150 degree there is a pure r wave on lead v1 with positive p wave suggestive of right ventricular hypertrophy and there uh, there is right ventricular cardiac forces so this uh, patient was diagnosed on echocardiography to have severe pulmonary artery stenosis with a uh, foramen shunting right to left this is an ecg from a 2 month old girl with incidental detection of systolic murmur at the time of vaccination ecg shows qrs axis of plus 90 degree with left ventricular dominance which is again grossly abnormal but this patient had severe aortic stenosis with normal left ventricular function this ecg is different from the uh, first ecg that i had shown that there is no stt changes on this ecg 
Now, this is a third ECG from a 13 year old boy with history of hypertension and leg claudication. Clinically, there was significant radio femoral delay. ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, STT changes suggestive of left ventricular strain pattern. Now, this is the um, x ray from the same patient, which shows uh, mild cardiomegaly with left ventricular type of configuration. And there is a rib notching uh, on the inferior border of the ribs and on the uh, left border of the heart, there is prominent aortic knob giving a figure of three appearance. This was a case of severe cooperation of iota. Now to uh, give a few examples of cyanotic conditions, this is a two-year-old boy with saturation 75% with significant motor delay and history of seizures. Uh, on ECG, we see sinus rhythm, right axis deviation, QRS axis is about 150 degree. There is clockwise rotation of the uh, heart, which is identified by the fact that there is um, Q wave on the and there is right ventricular hypertrophy with early transition of RS complexes from lead V1 to V2. And there is small left ventricular forces. This is the X-ray from the same patient, which shows mild cardiomegaly with right ventricular type of apex and in, uh, inconspicuous um, main pulmonary artery segment. This patient was diagnosed to have petrology of fallow with infundibular pulmonary stenosis. This is a two-year-old girl with saturation of 72% with frequent uh, episodes of cough, cold, and hospitalization. There is also a loud to and fro murmur to be heard on the precordium. Extra shows uh, cardiomegaly with right ventricular type of apex with prominent right atrium and very prominent hilar pulmonary arteries. So this extra is very conspicuous for a diagnosis of tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary valve. This is an ECG from a five-year-old girl with severe restriction of activities, saturation of only 75%, and a three-on-six ejection systolic murmur on the precordium. ECG shows left axis deviation with a counterclockwise rotation, which is noted by the fact that there is Q wave on lid 1 and lid AVL, and there is left ventricular dominance. X-ray from the patient shows a, a cardiomegaly with left ventricular type of apex, and the arrowheads show that there is absence of right atrial shadow um, and pulmonary oligemia. So this is a patient of uh, uh, patient of tricuspid atresia with severe pulmonary stenosis. Three weeks of uh, three weeks old baby girl with saturation of sixty five percent presented with lethargy and poor feeding, and there was no audible murmur. ECG shows uh, sinus rhythm, a QRS axis of more than one fifty degree, right atrial enlargement, and right ventricular hypertrophy. So this is a classical chest X ray of a baby with TGA with intact ventricular septum, wherein the heart uh, shadow is like an egg on side appearance, and there is pulmonary plethora with a narrow uh, uh, cardiac pedicle. This ECG belongs to a three-month-old boy with saturation of 80%, poor weight gain, and history of uh, hospitalization due to pneumonia a few days ago. ECG shows a QRS axis of more than 150 degree with right atrial enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy. Again, uh, the X-ray shows uh, significant cardiomegaly with right ventricular apex and um, uh, congestion of the upper lobe pulmonary vein, suggestive of pulmonary venous hypertension. So this patient echocardiographically was diagnosed to be TAPVC, supracardiac TAPVC with obstruction. Nine-month-old girl with frequent chest infection, failure to thrive, Saturation of 90%, soft continuous murmur over anterior and posterior chest wall. Is ECG shows QRS axis of 90 degree, clockwise rotation, and biventricular dominance. Uh, X ray from the same patient shows cardiomegaly with right ventricular apex and patchy, uh, uh, patchy vascularity of the uh, lung fields and inconspicuous pulmonary artery segment. So your time is up. Your time is up, please wind up. Okay, um, so I'll just uh, uh, quickly skip my slides and um, go to my tech home message. The conclusion. Um, yes, sir. So ECG and X-ray are very uh, are two very potent clinical tools. Uh, they they are best used in the light of physical features, and when they are carefully assessed, they they provide really useful clinical clues. Uh, my acknowledgement is that few of my uh, extra messages has been taken from Dr. Amitabh Chattopadhyay's archive and I'm thankful to him. And again, thank you to Dr. Odhikari and Dr. M.K. Das for kindly inviting me. Thanks a lot. Now, one point I'd like to ask you, Dr. Devosri. Now, from the clinical examination, X-ray, ECG, how do you differentiate between the AP window and the patent doctor's arteriosus? Sir, I cannot hear you very well. 
from the X-ray clinical examination and uh, ECG. Can you hear me now? Um, still very distant, sir. Tell me. Um, my computer is giving some give me giving me some trouble. I'm having a lot of uh, things going on in the screen. Probably there is internet break on your side. So I like to ask you once again. I did it. Sir, I did. I stop. I stop sharing. I'll okay. stop sharing first. No, I did. I did. I did. I did. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Now you are audible. Tell me, sir. Okay. So what I like to ask you that from the clinical point of view, clinical examination, ECG, X-ray. How do you differentiate between the AP window and PDA? Sir, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. The difference between AP window and PDA? Yes, sir. Body window and PDA? Yes, sir. How do you AP differentiate? window on PDA on, uh, on, on what? I mean, uh, uh, is it based on the X-ray and ECG? X-ray, ECG and clinical examination. So basically, um, sir, it is... Uh, AP window and PDA, they basically clinically they are same and very difficult to diagnose on the bedside. However, AP window will have uh, more of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So there can be uh, more of biventricular hypertrophy uh, because AP window there is direct pressure transmission and usually generally they are uh, large to be of clinical significance. So we see faster development of pulmonary hypertension and the reflection of the same on, on ECG. And X-ray, I think, uh, will be same. And uh, the conspicuous thing is the iota will be dilated in both the situations. But it, this is hard to def uh, uh, define, uh, differentiate clinically and based on uh, these two investigations, unless we do echocardiography. Thank you, Devasri. Uh, that was an excellent lecture on, based on the clinical part of the pediatric cardiology differences. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I'll call on... Dr. Arubda wishes to give his deliberation on congenital heart disease with oximetry run. Dr. Das wishes, please. Dr. Das wishes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have to be allowed to share my slides first. Ask your technical expert. I, I cannot see the share slide screen in here. Uh, sir, kindly, kindly, sir, kindly make it a full screen of your Zoom application. Kindly maximize your screen. Okay. Now you can see, sir. So, good evening, everyone. And particularly, I thank Lipika, my ex student, to invite me to give this lecture and also the other organizers. Now, as Shiva Kumar told, it is very difficult to convey some message on these difficult aspects in 12 minutes. Despite that, I'll give you some examples only rather than going into the very much nitty gritties of the oximetry run. And uh, to suit the needs of the fellows, and I think it is meant for the DN and DNB students rather than hardcore pediatric cardiologists. So I'll be trying to make my story simple. Now, with these words, uh, first of all, we have to remember that the role of catheterization in the congenital heart disease scenario has become limited nowadays due to the having uh, opportunity of having excellent imaging uh, opportunities, including CT, MRI, ECHO, etc., which not only give anatomical information but also uh, hemodynamic information also. But in certain uncertainties, we have to go for limited catheterization for the exact answer to the problem. And also when the clinical and the uh, non-invasive management doesn't match, then we have to go for limited cardiac cath again, or in certain cases, extremation of the PBR, etc., to determine the Operability, that becomes an issue for cardiac catheterization and individual cases, case-based discussion in such a case scenario has been extensively and very well demonstrated by Dr. Shiva Kumar. Now, my statement would be first regarding the pressure and saturation. When we are doing a pediatric cath, we have to be gentle, not probing too much, 
not folding the catheter too much, not twisting or torching because the walls are thin, liable to arrhythmia, hemodynamic changes, dysrhythmia, bradycardia, etc. So do not form a large loop. Do not press upon the atrium. Do not press upon the ventricle. Be gentle and polite. And it is better to have a balloon-tipped end hole catheter. But for a larger child, you can have without balloon end hole catheter for the pressure and oximetry measurement. And the hemodynamic data must be obtained before performing angiograms. I'm skipping the Douglas portion. Pressures have been dealt with. Now, my focus will be oxygen saturation and oxygen content, mainly oxygen saturation from the tips, like blood from the collected from the tips. So, what do we do in a complete oximetry run? We may be going for limited oximetry if the clinical scenario permits. Otherwise, the protocol is from LPA or RPA, we go to MPA, RV, three levels, RVOT, inflow, and mid RV. Similarly, RA three levels, superior portion, mid portion, and lower portion. SVC, IVC again, two levels. SVC near the innominate brain drainage and SVC nearer to the uh, RA junction. IVC similarly nearer to the uh, diaphragm and IVC below the renal venous drainage. I don't have the time to discuss what are the reasons for doing this. But you have to remember these uh, usual normal saturation and normal hemodynamic. Just saturation alone cannot justify the analysis of the data. It has to be incorporated with the concomitant pressure data. Then only you can infer. So it is the clinical data, non-invasive data, and the cath lab data that has to be considered in totality. Now, from these values, we can also calculate cardiac index. I won't go into further details of calculation, vascular resistance, etc. So the grossly on the desaturation side, it is 65 to 70 normal values and 96 to even 100 if we think about the pulmonary vein in an oxygenated baby. And so this is the reddened portion means saturated portion. Pulmonary artery wedge, of course, though it is on the pulmonary arterial side, it is the when we draw the blood, we actually draw from the capillaries or even maybe from a continuous suction, it could be somewhat from the pulmonary vein also, so it is saturated. Now, how to draw a blood, that also requires a skill. How to heparinize a syringe, that also requires a skill, but I won't go into those technical details. Now, coming to the intracardiac shunt, there are certain varieties with the difference of opinion with the authors. For example, I have quoted this from one authority who is showing 9%, 6%, and 6%. There are other authorities who go for 7 Five, five, and if it is not average, multiple uh, level things are not done, we require higher values. For example, for a single measurement, it has to be 11% at atrial level. So again, you have to remember these values. And these are, so when there is a step up or lift in oxygen saturation, you think of left to right shunt. And step down of greater than 2% or a saturation of less than 92% is suggestive of left to right shunt. And I'm not going to the flam portion because time is running out. So you have to calculate the QPQS. This is the simpler formula from the saturation. To be more accurate, you may go for the content. I'm not discussing that. Uh, so what are the causes of intracardiac shunt? That means step up at atrial level. The commonest known is ASD, but remember PAPBC, LV2, RA may be a part of ventricular arterial, uh, atrial shunt like the garbody defect, VSD with TR, RACV with RA, coronary artery venous fistula training into RA. 
and causes of step up at ventricular level it could be vsd low asd atrioventricular septal defect pda with pr rsob draining into rv coronary artery venous fistula draining into rv etc similarly there could be right at right to left shunt at different level that could be pulmonary venous desaturation they start from the lung causes and pulmonary artery venous fistula desaturation at la level due to multiple problems desaturation at so you have to think of sequentially and logically to come to a conclusion and desaturation at descending aortic level from isenmenger of pda pda with coarctation uh, interrupted aortic arch etc here is an example i have tried to give you certain examples but there is a no time to go for quiz so you have to think uh, 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 how to analyze this is a 6 years old asymptomatic child asymptomatic s2 white split that means basically asd like picture now there is lift also into the ra of 13% so you may be tempted towards drawing the diagnosis towards asd but if you look into the pressure the ra pressure and the la pressure difference is quite high so it is not a non restrictive asd so most likely it is the partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage so you have to be careful and don't jump into conclusion look into all the data before giving your answer similarly another patient 12 year old with findings of atrial septal defect that means the, these uh, are the similar findings i'm not repeating again you may be think of thinking of that this is a case of asd but there is a mild desaturation this may be clinically overt or clinically may not be manifest but nowadays bedside spo2 uh, from fingertip is allowed so you should be able to pick this up there is mild desaturation and you find that the oxygen saturation is a quite a lift i told you around 70 is the normal here it is 88 and that level is maintained up to the arterial level so all these are levels so you can think of a situation where there is pulmonary venous drainage into the right uh, a superior vena cava which is draining into ra where there is good mixing and this mixed blood is circulating and the pressure study that shows the atrial and left and right atrial mean are similar so it is a case of tapvc without any obstruction with a good asd size and the tapvc is supracardiac now coming to this uh, picture you can correlate that the lv and pa these pressures are similar saturations are similar similarly if you go into rv and aorta pressures are similar and saturations are similar and the patient is desaturated his um, la pressure pa wedge is not shown we expect to be high so this is a case of tga without ps because the uh, rv to i mean lv to pa pressure there is no much of difference and here there is an example of three year cyanotic clinical diagnosis of tetralogy of fallo in nadas textbook you will find there is a dictum that if you find a cyanotic child who is thriving for five years 10 years like that relatively asymptomatic and if you tell from a distance that it is a case of tetralogy without knowing the history without knowing the going into the clinical details you will be uh, almost um 75% of the times correct and that is tetralogy of fallo here also the picture is similar to tetralogy of fallo there is arterial desaturation and there is uh, rv pressure is high you find it 120 but there is a difference between the lv and rv the normally it is equalized lv and rv pressure so it is a bit deviation 
from the usual fellow and it is by definition not a case of fellow but a case of restrictive vsd so it is uh, it is a rare situation now 8 months old 6.5 kg down syndrome so one of the common problem in down syndrome is atrioventricular septal defect another norm name for this is uh, this primum asd with the inlet vsd but it is the common term nowadays used at avsd and here we find that the initially pvr is very raised but with 10 minutes of oxygen inhalation the pvr decreases so it is likely that it is though the pa is quite high pressure it is likely that it is still operable so you can utilize the oximetry for assessment of pvr the reversibility with the vasodilators including oxygen nitric oxide etc the operability and suitability for uh, whether the patient can be operable should i continue or finish here yeah um, uh, dr dajbishesh we are really running short of time and we are yeah. also behind so i am just uh, showing you the slides what do we have my in stock on discuss so this is a case of obstructed supra pvr cbc i gave you an example of uh this uh, unobstructed case here is an obstructed case here is an uh, rare case you find that initially your temptation will be bsd but here the gradient is quite high between uh, the la and the lv so it is a mitral stenosis associated and i have not this data despite that i am not uh, running out of time so i uh, conclude here uh thank you for your patient hearing uh raj vishas the wonderful disposition of the hemodynamics in congenital heart disease cyanotic as well as asanotic as dr dipit sina is repeatedly reminding us about the shortage of time so we don't have any questions i just to took ask. 13 minutes perhaps anyway the discussion was it nice. is my uh, watch shows it is 13 and 30 13 minutes 30 seconds Okay, you need not explain. You have done a wonderful job. So let us go for the next session. Thank you so much. Have a great evening and night. Thank, thank you, sir. That was a wonderful lecture. So now we move on to the next session. Our next session is on coronary intervention. The chair person for this session are Dr. Anjan Lal Lotto, Dr. Bishwakesh Mujunda, and Dr. Shubhanon Rai. The session will be moderated by Dr. D. P. Sina and Dr. S. C. Mondol. The speaker for this session are Dr. Anjan Sharma, Dr. P. K. Goel, Dr. M. Lodha. So, may I now request the chairperson, sir, Dr. A. L. Dutta, Dr. Bishwakesh Mujinda, and Dr. Shubhanon Roy, to please come on the. Dr. Sharma. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Dr. P. K. Goel. लॉन्ग पाथ वॉट वॉज इनिशियली जस्ट डायलिटेशन विद बेलून और फॉर दैट मैटर फॉलोड बाई स्टेन रेबुलेशन इज चेंज इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट सक्सेस रेट in terms of in terms of success rate in terms of relief from symptoms mortality morbidity and complex congenital uh, complex pci all these factors have come up so we should now probably have some newer guidelines in terms of complex pci and difficult to treat ischemic heart disease the topic will be discussed by dr anjan sharma a renowned interventional cardiologist with i would any further comment without wasting further time i would request dr sharma to start his presentation good evening everybody uh, i am really thankful to csi for inviting me to talk on a subject which is very close to my heart uh, i will be talking on this the wired selection 
for coronary intervention. Just a minute. Can you see my slides? Hello, yes. my slides yes, are visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, apart from your access to the artery and the selection of a proper guide, guide wires are equally important for a successful angioplasty. So, for, for the juniors, I'm just talking because many of our seniors are knowing everything about this, but for juniors, I'm just talking a few points, how to select and what are the things you have to think. So there is no substitute for a tactile feel. So this tactile feeling has to be understood at the beginning. And it is very, very important to <coughs> have the angioplasty done. And you must familiarize yourself with the capabilities of different types of artery wires. You can have a CTO wires, you can have a hydrophilic wires, soft wires, hard uh, pointed wires. So you must have some familiarities of uh, each class of wires. And you do not expect that one wire will do your every job. So you must have experience with all the types of wires. Not a single wire has got a good properties, all the good properties. Means a single wire, you will have a good support. You will expect that it is, will have a very good torqueability or very safe. Everything will not be there. And if you have to choose a wire, you, you have to uh, select one wire, which the property may not be ideal. And you have to lose one property. And that will be based on your lesion morphology as well as the vessel morphology. <clears throat> your workhorse wire should be safe. It should be ideally hydro, uh, non hydrophilic because it gives you a better tactile feeling and the risk of dissection is less. Uh, just a little bit of basic of guide wire technology. You have a core material inside. Then you have core diameter, which is almost equal in almost all the wires. But the core tapering is diff uh, different in different wires. So some of the wires have a very sharp bends and you have some of, have a very long taper. Tip style, you can have the core tip which is reaching up to the, uh, this tip. Or some have a free thing and you have a ribbon there you can, which is uh, less likely to puncture. And you can have a covers and you can have a coating on the wire. So pore of wire is basically of stainless steel and that sort of distal part is mainly either of stainless steel or nitinol or durasteel. This durasteel and nitinol have a better shape uh, memory. So that is most of the wires are now having some mixture of either nitinol or durasteel. And this core material will decide the supportability, trackability, flexibility and uh, torqueability of the wires. This core tapering is important. So you have to understand all the, the wires. Some of the times you may have to go into an angulated vessel. And if you have a tapering which is long, uh, it's less likely to prolapse. But if you have a short uh, tip, then you can have a chance of prolapse. So these things you have to understand. So tip of the wire, again, you have different types of uh, design. Core to tip means the core of the wire reaching up to the tip. And another is your shaping ribbon design where the, uh, the core is not reaching up to the tip. So if you have a tip, this core tip is uh, core to tip design is there. The shapeability of the, you can uh, have a better torqueability of the wire. But if you have sh shaping ribbon design, it has got a, uh, some shaping memory is there. And the risk of perforation is slightly less. And then coils and covers. Some of the wires have a coating. And this coating can be polymer and that can lead, lead to increased uh, lubricity of the vessel. So trackability is less, but the tactile feedback is less. We have some special types of wire. One is wiggle wire where that core is uh, tortuous. So it will give you some better maneuverability in a very tortuous calcified vessels. Or if you are going through a, a obstructed stent, the wire may not be able to track. And in these types of vessel, it can be uh, used. And sometimes it gives a better support. So if you are not able to put a long stent into the wire, into the vessel, which is uh, tortuous, this wheel wire can help apart from your body wire. Thus, marker wire. Once you have a this radiopic portion here, which is usually 30 millimeters, and thereafter every 10 meter you have a marker. So this is for measurement, exact measurement of the listen. This is important if you are putting a stent uh, which is 
you are not li uh, uh, liking to cross. Suppose you are post putting from the AD ostium and you don't want that the stent goes up to the diagonal. So you have to have a very exact measurement of the length of the stent that you are looking for. For this, you can have a measurement, but if you take a stent and this radio opacity of the wire as well as the stent, there is some confusion. So this wire are not longer used. <clears throat> then about the coating of the wire, some of have a hydrophilic coating, which has got a slippery like surface. It is much more lubricious and easier to advance, but it has got a less tactile feedback. Chance of perforation and dissection is high. And hydrophobic, you have a wax-like surface, slippery and less trackability, but it has got a very good tactile feedback. And some of the wires have hybrid coating. The tip is hydrophobic, and the other portion is your hydrophilic. So the feedback remains, and you can have a better trackability. So if you opt for a slippery wire or hydrophilic wire or a hydrophobic wire, you have to, if you increase the lubricity by PMR coating, and if you have no coating or T a, a Teflon coating, a hydrophobic a tactile response is better. So you have to choose in which type of uh, vessel you are taking the wire. And based on the property of this uh, coating, you have to choose a wire. This torqueability, you know, you just torque by say 45 degrees, the tip will rotate by 45 degrees. This is very important once you are entering into the sharp bends. So these wires are usually have a Go to tip design. So, characteristic of a uh, PTCA wires are either it has to be as has to have a good trackability, torqueability, flexibility, crossability, able to cross uh, tight lesions, and supportability. I'm not going to the details of the is the property of this vessel, uh, these wires. So, the factors that are determining the performance of PTCA wire are one core diameter that determines the flexibility and support. Core tapering, it can be long or short, it can be blunt or pointed. Core type can be either steel or nitinol. Core style, I have already said, core tip or shaping ribbon design. Shaping ribbon or tip coils can be spring coils or micro cut nitinol sleeves. Their nitinol sleeves are having a better say, memory. Coating can be hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Support for bulky device, uh, you have extra support wires. Tip load is important for CTO. And you have to, you may have to use support catheters, micro catheters for exchange of wires or increasing the tip load of the wire. And wire length is important if you are going for it to get CTO intervention. Long wires are needed. So I will just skip these slides because these are the standard high support wires, flexible wires. So you must experience each type of wire at least once so that for support, you use either Grand Slam or Iron Man. The Sion or Fuser or Galio, these are standard wires. For CTO, you can use Miracle, Bro Miracle Brothers or Confianja, Pilot. So these uh, different types of wire, you have to have some idea about the uh, capabilities of this wire. So for simple reasons, you take a workhorse wire, which is usually having atomic tip and should be hydrophobic. The ideal choice uh, uh, floppy or BMW. For a tortuous anatomy, you need a flexible or very lubricious wire, hydrophilic, classically whisper, or maybe choice floppy, or maybe pilot 50. If you cross this initial tortuosity, you can put a, a balloon, and then thereafter you can uh, track the wire safely. And this uh, slippery uh, whisper wire or pilot 50, if you are going through the tortuous cities, you may not be able to have a proper torque once you are into the deep part of the vessel. So thereafter, you can take a balloon and thereafter you can talk, take your wire inside. For bifurcations, you, you are gelling a wire. Just don't take a polymer covered wire because once you are taking out the wire, they can be stripping up the polymer and it can lead to uh, unwanted effects. And during recrossing, you require a wire which has got a very good torqueability as well as it should be slippery. So once you have taken out and you are crossing across uh, from the stent, then you require a slippery wire. And the usual choice is BMW or choice floppy or whisper. 
if you encounter a dissection in the coronary artery, then I feel the wire which you have most commonly used, with which you have most confidence, you take that wire and it has to be a hydrophobic wire, should not be hydrophilic wire. So if we, with the maximum confidence that you have, uh, the wire which you are much more dependable on, take that wire so that it, it uh, follows your command and the usual dryer wires are BMW or choice floppy. For dedicated CTO wires, you have to analyze the CTO segment and based on this, you will choose either drilling or penetration or sliding method for doing the procedure. So for sliding through, if you are able to see some micro channels, you choose a hydrophilic wire like pilot or whisper and you can just go through the micro channels and uh, should be hydrophily coated. Filter XC, filter SP are good. And uh, if you have a lesion which is having a nipple, then you take a wire which has got a very short tip and it should be hydrophobic and should be non tapered wire. Sometimes after crossing a part, part of the lesion has been crossed, you can take a balloon support and then go in. The ideal situation, the ideal wires are miracles or miracle brothers. So if you have a good nipple, then take your hydrophobic wire. And if you have a blunt thing, <coughs> CTO, then you have to feel the CTO first. So take your workhorse wire, feel the listen how hard it is. Then you can exchange over a micro catheter here and take a hard wire, super stiff wires, which are tapered, either conquest for a conference jar or cross it uh, 400 and just give multiple torques. So you should not have a rotation of more than 90 degree and just keep the pressure on and keep on drilling and you can penetrate through the CTO. We have different types of CTO specialty wire, polymer jacket wire or non-jacketed hydrophilic wires. So in all each class you have whisper pilot, we have filter, we have pilot 200, you have Sion, you have Gaia uh, type of wires or Confinja. So you gain some experience with each type of wire. But initially, you should not choose these hard wires. So for beginners, you should start with no polymer jacket wire, like BMW Pro Water or ST Pro, uh, Floppy. With intermediate polymer jacket, a BMW Universal or Run-Through, or fully jacketed wire or Whisper or ST Pilot, you can choose thereafter. So which wire for which lesion depends on the vessel anatomy, which is tortuous or ingulated. Lesion morphology, whether it's simple, subtotal or CTO. Which type of device you are, whether you are using a long stance or not. And sometimes it is experience and preferences of the operators. So if I say that you take BMW and you are very happy with the run through, uh, I believe the experience will be uh, main main thing. So you have to choose depending on your experience and belief on the wire. For CTO, first choice should be non-hydrophilic with intermediate stiffness like Miracle Brothers. Second choice hydrophilic with intermediate stiffness like choice PT or Pilot 50 or 100. For third choice, my suggestion would be a non-hydrophilic wire should be Miracle Brothers or Confringia. And the last choice is most aggressive are Shinobi or Pilot 200. And on uh, these wires can be taken on micro catheter, the tip load can be increased to maximum. And uh, you have to have a proper shape of the wire depending on the return and the vessel. You must maintain a free movement of the wire tip. If needed, you withdraw again and you uh, go again. Avoid undue forces. So to avoid side branches, you may have to make a loop and just. Move. Please continue. Please continue. And uh, just, uh, one or two uh, slide, one or two words. You use your trusty work workhorse wires for short forward lesions. For tortuous lesion, you use hydrophilic or polymer jacketed wire, and you need extra support wire for uh, delivering long devices, buddy wires or wiggle wire for calcified lesions. And if you are choosing a buddy wire or side branch wire, you uh, preferably choose different color of the wire so that you don't have any confusion. And this CTO I have already said. And uh, okay, thank you. If you have any query about this wire choice, I will have. Is giving lecture is uh, difficult and uh, rather having a listen and then discussing which type of 
wire would be waste for that lesson is more important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. An excellent start to this session and corner intervention. Uh, may I request Dr. Anjanala to take him up, please? Dr. Jata, please take over. Dr. Jatak, please unmute yourself. Dr. Jatak, please unmute yourself. Sir, I sent a request to unmute. Kindly accept the pop-up, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, it was an interesting presentation, giving very important inputs in regard to the trackability, torqueability, and deep load. These are very important issues. But at the end of the day, what is most important is your familiarity or your feeling easy with which type of wire. As Dr. Sharma also pointed out, that feeling comfortable, the wire that you have been using for years together, you try to do that if the lesion is simple. In complicated lesions, obviously you have to use the other words. But again, your own experience is very important. And whisper wire is dangerous in one sense. They have apparently tracks and goes through the narrowest possible track, but it is notorious for dissection. So with all these wires, we have some plus points and minus points. And the end of the day, your performance, your experience will guide you as to which type of wire you should take. Thank you. The next session, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Dr. Tobin Kumar Goel. And sir, please start your session. Yeah. Dr. Sina, thank you. Dr. Sina, I'm taking leave now. You just do it, yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, West Bengal uh, uh, chapter. So the talk that has been given to me is uh, check the shelf before taking for CTO intervention. Now, this is very important. Check the shelf means you have to check for the hardware. Hey, should you put in? Is it okay I'm speaking? Is it audible? Yes, sir, you are audible and visible. Okay, fine. So, so uh, you know, uh, several times we, uh, this is especially for the youngsters, we get uh, answers like, you know, I could not do this because I did not have X I product or something. So uh, I would suggest that you should have one category of product in each of the different types of hardware that are used for CTO intervention. Have your choice and have those where you have experience. There are always alternates, and but keep all all these strategies, all the levels with you. So now uh, my slide is not changing. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. So the CTO toolbox, basically it is the CTO toolbox that you should have before you take up the, the patient. So I'll just show you one slide and, and talk about it and then show you the case where uh, the importance of having things on your shelf was important and which was uh, uh, my experience and I will show you. So the first product that is required is the access product. I think there's someone who's talking and it is disturbing. Can you unmute the others, please? There is someone who is talking uh, somewhere. It is a Techn technical support team. Please unmute others. Technical please support unmute team. Unmute because it disturbs. Okay. Yeah, again, someone is speaking. Yeah. Please proceed. Sorry. Okay. So. First, when you start a procedure, you need the access products like the sheets and the guiding catheters. Guiding catheters, there will be different shapes for different arteries. Sheets will be six French, seven French. Which approach you are using? Radial, femoral. Well, radial also you can do seven French with the glide sheet. So you have to be conversant what you want to do and you should have that. Because several CTO cases mostly need seven French at least because there are certain things which a six French will not be able to do. Like you cannot trap a crusade in six French. 
You cannot trap a, a stingray balloon in a six French. You cannot put a Ivers and Corsair together in a six French. Uh, well, you can put a Ivers and microcatheter together in a seven French. But uh, and this is needed when you are doing anti-grade penetration technique using Ivers to penetrate. So you know you have to. It depends how much is your is the is the scope of your work where you want to limit yourself. But depending on your limit, you have to have the products. Next is the microcatheters. No CTO intervention can be done without a microcatheter. I've seen people trying to open CTOs with balloon, uh, putting the wire through a balloon, and they say balloon support. No, that's not right. You have to have a microcatheter. And microcatheters, as we understand, we will always start with a single lumen microcatheter. They are different microcatheters that are available. I don't have time to show you to tell you the details of each, but in this slide itself, you will know everything about what hardwares you require and how to plan it out. So Fine Cross, Corsair, Caravel. Now they are 130 centimeter, 150. 130 is usually for the anti-grade procedures and 150 is for the retrograde. So if you're doing retrograde, you must know you should have 150. Then you need dual lumen catheters sometimes. You have gone into a side branch or you have gone subintimal. Now you need to uh, get back into the lumen or get into the main vessel, uh, leaving the wire in the side branch. You need a dual lumen catheter. This is what is a crusade and the new one, the Sasuke. So one of the dual lumen catheters are because several times you will go into, into um, a subintimal plane or a side branch and you need something like this. So crusade is required. And crusade, well, if you want to trap it and get it out, you need seven French. You cannot do it. With seven French. So you need these seven French. Wires, well, we just heard a talk on wires. So, uh, well, there are dedicated CTO wires. All companies have their own sets of wires. The majority of wires that are used in CTOs are the Asahi group of wires. So the Asahi group of wires, we have the, the Sion uh, the C on C on black, C on blue, well, there are differences. Well, you must know that. So that is usually the, the, the first level wire. Uh, that is a workhorse wire, I would say, not even a CTO wire. It's a workhorse wire. And then you have things like the XT series. You have the XT, XTR, XTA. They have their own features. They, are, they will find their own way. They are the first level wires to be used. Second level wires are the non-hydrophilic ones like the Miracles, or we are not using Miracles much now. What we are using is the Gaia first, second, and third. They have much greater advantage, so you must have one of the XTs, at least one of the Gaias, and then you step up to Conquest. The Conquest uh, is again uh, Asahi. You have alternates in Boston, like the Hornet, which is there, which is similar to Conquest. The Fighter of... Uh, of Boston is similar to XT. So you must have uh, which one will you want, but at least think about it and keep that. Then if you think that you're going to do a retrograde procedure, then there are some retrograde procedure specifics which you have to have on your shelf. Externalization wires. Now these externalization wires are 300 centimeters. So you cannot do externalization through fixing two wires through extension. They will It will uh, delink itself in your... So you need a 300 centimeter wire. So the 300 centimeter, the usual one is the RG300. So that is what you should have. Well, we could use a rota wire that is also 300. So that is one. Then sometimes if you are doing osteal CTOs, uh, well, these are high level CTOs, I must tell you, then you need snares to pull the wire back because the guiding anti-grade guiding will not hook the, the, the blocked vessel. And then the wire will come out, and then you need to snare it, and then do. Then there are collateral tracking wires. Well, we do largely with Sion, uh, but SuO3 is very good for tiny channels, which are not so SuO3. So you must have a SuO3 if you are thinking of a retrograde uh, procedure specific. If uh, anti grade dissection re entry, this is today very much a salvage type of a. Uh, device. So if you get subintimal, the cell artery is good, then you can do ADR, but then you need this uh, stingray device with you. Cross boss is less needed. It's like the microcatheter, but the stingray uh, will uh, get you, uh, will give you the balloon uh, into the intimal space and then you can re-enter. So if you have that, then you can think of a 
and degrade the yield. There are situations in CTOs when wire has crossed, but balloon does not cross. Now, these are the difficult situations. You should be ready for it. And for this, you may need something like a guide extension, which may also be needed in retrograde procedures. You may need some extra support wires, which you will only put uh, through the microcatheter extending through the lesion. So the microcatheter has gone, but the balloon doesn't go. Then you exchange it to extra support wire and then try the balloon again. Then you would have some low profile balloons. There are some CTO balloons, 1.1, 1.85. Well, you may do that, or you can use a tornus, which is a core screw device. Uh, through which you can uh, go in down. So uh, the, in situations where the balloon, uh, the wire has crossed, but balloon doesn't cross or the microcatheter doesn't cross, so tornus is the next option. So you, if you have one of these, you can try that because these are the things which will finally get you to success. Otherwise, you will you may get stuck in between. Then niche devices are sometimes needed, IVAS and rotas. So that is you have to think about it. And largely, before you take up a patient for CTO, I would advise and suggest you must have the emergency products available with you. Things like covered stents, glues, coils, and appropriate delivery catheters for the coil. Sometimes you get stuck, you have a coil, but your microcatheter will not take the coil because the coil is 018 and your microcatheter inner lumen is only 014. So, so things like this, so you have to have a matching like prograte is one catheter which is good for coils of 018. 018 will not go through fine cross. You need a 014 coil. Sometimes you don't have the 014 coil. So things like this and covered stand. So these are because if emergency is created, you should be prepared to handle the emergency before you really decide to do that. I will do a CTO. So these are the ways you can build up. And this all thing comes with experience. But at least if you have that bottom line, you will uh, work on it. Now I'll just show you a case, uh, which uh, you know sometimes what happens is you think that well things are not too difficult in the sense that go ahead. When things change, you don't know. So and uh, when you need what? So I'll just show you one case example to tell you the importance of what happens when you miss things on the shelf. Now this case is not any from anywhere else. It's my own case. I I, I joined a new system, uh, so I thought things would be there. And uh, I started, and I and you see how problems come. So so you you learn from it. So it's a 51 year old male, uh, diabetic, class two angina for two years, had worsening angina for seven months. Also had some breast angina with trough positive three days back. So I thought maybe things are okay. Maybe having acute occlusion, no problem. We'll go ahead and do it. So so that is RCA injection, RAO and LAO. So you have a block vessel here. There is some anti-grade filling, which seems to be initially looked like a true channel, but maybe there are some bridging collaterals which are filling it. And the distal vessel is not filling so well. I think partially it is filling through contralateral collaterals. Now, contralateral injection is very important in a CTO. So, so you see, uh, so you can't take things for granted. So this so what we did, and then that's the left injection, and left injection shows the RCA filling much better, showing that this is all largely contralateral. And also there is a circumflex OM that is that is occluded, if you see here. There is a there is an OM that is occluded. So I thought maybe the OM is, uh, is uh, RTO, and that's responsible for the top positive, and we will uh, do the, um, and the RCA is probably a CTO. So, and you're finding LED normal, OM 100%, maybe CTO, maybe RTO. RC 100 was CTO with epicardial contralateral filling. So plan was to do PCI to OM and RC. So let's do the OM and fix it. Maybe it's RTO and then do the RC. So case did not look so difficult. So took up as routine case and it was a new setup. So expected usual hardware to be available and we proceeded. Now the first difficulty. Now you see how things change. When I hook the guiding catheter, hooking left coronary was not easy. You see how the guiding catheter, the, jet, uh, the, the EBU is going straight inside into the, into the mouth of the left coronary because you will experience these things into the mouth of the left coronary and it has already surpassed the origin of the circumflex. So you can't get the circumflex through there. So, and EBU 3.5 was not reaching the ostium. EBU 4, 
hook the left system as but very deep as i said and the moment you pull it back it would exit it would uh, leave the uh, left coronary so that was uh, so then uh, well and so you, that means you need these 3.5s and 4s and all choices so then i'm changed the plan i said let me do the rca first I mean, both are occluded let us try the rca so rca we took uh, sal 6.5 i usually do ctos with 7 french but now 7 french was not available this was a new setup that i had just joined the 7 french was not available so i said okay let me consider uh, i thought that rca crossing would also not be very difficult in this case that's what i thought so we started with 6 french and uh, and i specifically did not ask for 7 french also but 7 french was not available so that's my mistake of not having checked that 7 french was not available because if i have to do a cto i must do it through 7 french because then i have the flexibility to do everything now case proceeded with microcatheter plus xt well i thought maybe the xt will cross it is not too long the cto but you see if you see here as the xt crosses the initial cto part then later it turns inside so that's not a good direction it's not going the right way so i have to do something else so i have to change so i changed to xta xt is 0.8 grams xta is 1 gram xta can be maneuvered better than xt will find its own way now it's going down but now you see my distal filling through the contralateral is a little less so maybe i am not in the right place maybe i am subintimal so now the problem will be there anyhow so i tried to pull back the wire and readvance in a different direction mm. uh the xta because you can give some direction to xta and then uh you know orthogonal view if you see with contralateral injection it suggests that the lesion is crossed successfully but the distal wire probably distal end is probably in the wrong track you see you can only trace it so so that is that so now i wanted to exchange the wire okay that it has crossed whatever part it has crossed let me put my microcatheter till that level and then i will go distally in because that is all uh, vessel is patent in the distal part so how do i do that i have to put a microcatheter and and uh, exchange the wire so now but the issue is now the microcatheter would not go microcatheter could not be advanced it was not advanced because there's some little loss of support here microcatheter is not advancing so tried advancing the wire a little further and the distal end of the wire following again the same track and the tip is directed inferiorly so all the time going the same track that means i'm subintimal so i need to somehow exchange the wire so one is either do i parallel wire or i get it back and uh, change the wire through a microcatheter so it is in the subintimal plane so i thought okay let me do a parallel wire so parallel wire so well i had the crusade so crusade was in and i could cross it successfully you see the the conquest has crossed so the case is done but now the problem the real difficulty starts now now how do i get back the crusade the crusade can either be trapped but 6 french will not trap it as i told you i did it with 6 french and 7 french was not available and the other thing i can extend the wire the uh, the conquest and then pull back the crusade on that conquest but i do not have the extension now i did not yeah yeah i'll just i'll 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 i'll, I'll uh, rush it up no problem that's not right so so arrange for a new extension and then got the extension uh, transported it but in the meantime tried to cut the uh, crusade and get it out but it never worked and had to pull out everything doing it again reattempt it will follow the same track everything followed the same way xta and but now i did not have a second crusade so you should have the products and you should have them in surplus because you may lose one spoil one because the first crusade got damaged the second crusade is not available so again waited physically waiting because if that's the only way to succeed and then so got the crusade and then completed a parallel wire now conquest crossed and now finally the balloon will not cross so that's the 
last difficulty, balloon is not crossing, although the conquest has crossed. So now comes the importance of guideliners. So if you don't have a guideliner, you will not be able to complete. So I put the guideliner and with guideliner support, the balloon crossed. And finally, this will be complete. So that's the final. So if you have to do CTOs, well, uh, and then we did OM stage two. It had its own difficulties. I don't think I have time to show you that. So I will skip. You see the tortuous thing there? The way it is bending the wire here. So, so, so that is also not easy. So again, uh, got into the side branch and finally could complete it. So, so that's that. Uh, so the learning messages, uh, what I would like to say, all that looks simple may not be all that easy. Be prepared for all eventualities, especially with respect to hardware. Know the limitations with and possible options with a six French versus seven French. What all is possible, what all is not possible. And lastly, and most importantly, do check the shelf before you finally proceed to a CTO journey as per a prospective plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goel. That was a really enlightening lecture on uh, doing a CTO, what should be there on the shelf and how to proceed. Now, next are... Uh, uh, thank you. I think I'll, I'll have to leave now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. M. Loda, who will talk on tips and tricks of safety pension. Dr. Loda, please. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Please start. Yes, sir. Yes. Can you go to share a screen, Dr. Loga? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, uh, is my slide available, sir? Slides are visible. Okay, I'd, sir, request yes, sir. To, I'd request you to please stick in time. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak about the uh, tips and tricks in sexual puncture. Uh, I am speaking before my teacher, Dr. P.K. Goel, who has spoken before me. And all the tips and tricks that I am going to share, I have learned from him. Uh, actually, he most of the time he speaks about the coronary interventions, but I can tell you it was very difficult to assist him uh, in, in the PMB because he was so fast and so accurate. And whatever I am going to share, it is because of his teachings. Uh, so thank you, sir, uh, for sharing thank you. the knowledge. Uh, thank you, Manoji. Thank you, Manoji, yes. for the nice yes. talk. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, if you are present, then it will be a great opportunity for me, sir. Uh, it is difficult for uh, to present a case before your uh, teacher. Uh, thank you, sir. Nine. Thanks a lot. Please go. Please go ahead. So, yes, sir. So before we speak about the transeptal punctures, uh, we should know the indications of the transeptal puncture. The most uh, common indication of the transeptal puncture are the BMB, as we know. But now the uh, to age to age repair of the mitral bulge uh, for the LA appendage closure or uh, for the EP studies in. Uh, Currently, and also uh, to uh, put the LV assist devices, we need to put a, a transeptal puncture. So we need three things to know before transeptal puncture. We, so we must be aware about our hardware, which are we are going to use, the technical landmarks, uh, and the, the guidance, imaging guidance, which may be either uh, which may be either a, a fluoroscopy guided or maybe uh, even we can do a, a PE guided or a, a ice guided. Puncture. So in our hardware, if we see there are uh, mullen seed and mullen dilator we use, and the broken boros metal to puncture the uh, the broken boros metal has a 21 gauge uh, tip and 18 gauge sap, uh, which which goes through the uh, mullen seed. So if we know the uh, mullen seed and dilator, it is a 0.032 wire compatible. So we should must know the compatibility of the wire. And in pediatric uh, systems, the wire the seed is compatible with only 0.025 wire. The length of the broken coronal needle is about four centimeter longer than the mullen seed. That is about 71 centimeter in pediatrics in adults and 56 centimeter in pediatrics. 
so it would be knowing the uh, how much length of the uh, broken down radius if you if we fully push then it will be around 4 cm ahead of the dilator skin so now coming to the anatomical landmarks anatomical we must understand the anatomy of the interior septum very well to uh, do the procedure successfully so, so the interior septum is situated in the jung about uh, in the middle and lower jung the junction of the middle and lower one third of the uh, of the right atrium and it is situated a bit posteriorly so we can define the anatomy on the eco echocardiography we can define the anatomy on the ct scan or mri so if we see the interior septum the plane is not uh, horizontal in not in vertical in supine position rather the situation at the interior septum is from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock position so this uh, orientation we must be aware during the puncture of the interior septum and similarly the fossa valley is the point where we try to puncture most of the time because fossa valley is thinnest part of the septum it is easier to cross and fossa valley is the uh, plane of the fossa valley is 4 to 6 o'clock position so if we see the broken bone nodal most of the time we puncture at the 4 o'clock position so before we embark on the procedure we must know the anatomy of the interior septum very well not only the suitability of the mitral valve but the operator must look himself about the anatomy of the interior septum by he could by doing he could himself so if the interior septum is normal then the normal position of the broken bone nodal is 4 o'clock we hold 4 to 5 o'clock position as seen in this uh, diagram but if the interior septum is bulged and it is convex then the, we have to put the, in the broken bone nodal in the position of 2 o'clock or even in 3 o'clock or when very convex and in even in 2 o'clock position so knowing the anatomy is very important before embarking the procedure so what are, what are the uh, anatomy where it can be distorted so dilated aortic uh, ascending aorta of the dilated left atrium or the dilated right atrium can distort the anatomy of the interior septum so we must uh, look carefully in these three structures when the ascending aorta is dilated basically it is present in the intra superior part so it will uh, it will push the septum downward or it is more becomes more horizontal so this uh, in marfal syndrome or in the bicuspid aortic valve when the ascending aorta is dilated that can put the, you make your uh, interior septum more horizontal similarly in case of uh, when the la is quite dilated uh, like in mitral mitral severe mitral stenosis or when there is diastolic hyper diastolic uh, dysfunction uh, then the is is convex towards the right atrium and it may become difficult to puncture so in those situations uh, we may have to ch change the position of the broken bone nodal to either 2 uh, o'clock or 3 o'clock position similarly in the, if the right atrium is dilated like in the severe tr uh, then in the, these cases the is becomes uh, con concave to, uh, from the ra side and we, we, we have to reach deeper to uh, puncture the interior septum so this is the anatomy which we must know carefully then the third most important part is the guidance So, so we can do under either fluoroscopy guidance or we can do under the uh, trans esophageal echo guidance or uh, nowadays given by the eyes or intracardiac echocardiography uh, guidance uh, guide uh, function we can do so this is the most common side where where we do the fluoroscopy guided we put the uh, pictel catheter in the uh, non coronary uh, cusp which is the most dependable uh, the dependent cusp in the uh, rao view so we must check our uh, position of the pictel uh, in the rao view and we should be sure that the uh, the position is in the most dependent part or it is non coronary cusp then uh, if we see the interior septum then in any lao view interior septum is vertical so we cannot see the full interior septum uh, and the puncture will be below the uh, aorta rao in rao view and in the in the rao view the pf or the or the fossa oval is which you can see in face so we can see the full fossa ovalis in the rao view so both the views lao and rao are important to localize the fossa ovalis where we are going to puncture so if uh, we are doing a t guided then the, there are basic three views by which we can identify the intercept the true position of the fossa ovalis one is bicaval view where by which we can identify the uh, cranial and caudal location of the uh, uh, needle then uh, short axis view whereby we can understand the anterior and posterior position of the uh, of the broken bone needle and we can identify the true position of the puncture site and then uh, there is a standard four chamber view by which we also can identify the interior septum so these are the three views by which in a te we can identify the true position of the broken bone needle and we can puncture the interior septum in the right direction so in normally when what we do we put a 0.032 wire uh, in the left innominate vein and then put the seed and mullen seed over the uh, wire and gradually we bring down the uh, the mullen mullen seed with the broken bone needle 
and once when we pull it down then there will be two jumps once one jump is because when we come from the sbc to ra and the second jump is when we pass the over crystal is uh, uh, to the ridge of the crystal over and uh, to the fossa ovaries so this two jump uh, we can identify and secondly when we are putting the broken rod uh, putting the mullen seed in the fossa ovaries uh, because fossa ovaries is thin we can uh, we can feel the pulsation of the left atrium so this is very uh, important so to have the tactile feel of the left atrial pulses and in raob and uh, and lao view uh, it is dependence on the uh, operator's experience um, most of the operators do both in raob and lao view check the position of the needle both in the raob view and the lao view and some do one also only in the lao view or lateral view so in the R in the raob view the position of the septa, uh, position of the needle must be away from the aorta and the uh, coronary sinus and then the lao view if we see uh, the the mullen seed and the mullen seed we can give it a bit of dye and see the staining of the septum so we should not uh, put the dye uh, too forcefully because it can uh, cause the uh, dissection of the interior septum so we can put a little bit of dye and in the lao in the lao view uh, the our seed will be directed posteriorly and superiorly and it will be below the interior in below the catheter pictorial catheter similarly in the if in the lateral view we see uh, if we uh, draw a line from the tip of the catheter to the posterior border of the heart then the our puncture should be around in the middle one third of the this line uh, and this will be also directed posterior superior towards the left atrium so once we are sure about the position of the uh, in, uh, of the uh, broken valve of the seat in the position then we can put a firm push to put the needle in and once we are uh, we have punctured the interatrial septum then we must see be sure uh, that uh, we are in the left atrium either we can check it by the la pressure tracing so where the pressure curve will change from the right atrium to left when we go from right atrium to left atrium and the pressure curve uh, pressure become much higher or uh, we can uh, do an oximetry run and see the saturation of the uh, blood uh, which will be much higher, usually oxygen saturated blood and thirdly uh, also uh it's uh, uh, third by giving a dye we can we can show that we are in the uh, left uh, we are in the left atrium and once we are sure that we are in the left atrium then only we should put the seed and uh, seed in the put the seed inside because uh, once we puncture from the needle then uh, it unlikely to cause many of the complications but once we put the seed then the complication starts so we must be in, must make sure that we are in the left atrium uh, before we put the seed in so these are the pressure tracing by which you can identify that we have entered the left atrium uh, and once we, if we have punctured the, uh, in the superiorly then we have to um, uh, if the puncture is by mistake is more superior then we have to make the the, uh, the stylet more acute angled or if we have punctured too inferiorly then we have to make the stylet more obtuse so these are the tips to success uh, for bmb if we are putting la closer devices uh, then uh, then we have to puncture the septum in most more posteriorly and more uh, more the la the left atrial appendage in the cranial the more inferior we have to puncture so we should not probe the pfo in uh, when we are trying to close the la because by by pfo it is too difficult to put the device inside the la so the puncture is more uh, posterior and more uh, inferior as compared to the bmb puncture so these are the anatomies by which we can puncture the c uh, and uh, in uh, we can be also uh, do it in the t guided where I mean by cable view we can see that it is away from the sbc so it is more inferior and uh, so we can you can see the posterior puncture so in mitra clip also in mitra clip uh, the puncture uh, should be uh, more superior and posterior and it should be at least 4 to 5 cm away from the point of coaptation so t guided puncture is better in the patients with my, when we are trying to put a mitra clip so appropriate location determine the success of the procedure uh, these are the anatomy we are not going in detail so as i said it is the most more posterior and more superior so is the specific features on the when the in, there is severe mr and the la is quite dilated then in, in in t we should look that uh, our needle is four, around 4 to 5 cm away from the point of coaptation so the success uh, ts puncture location determining factors are left atrial size the type of the pathology where is functional or play uh, prolapse and whether we are trying to put the um, uh, mitra clip in the medial aspect or on the lateral aspect these things determine the puncture size so for a uh, puncture again uh, the uh, puncture should be more posterior more posterior 
and inferior. So the complications of uh, intraatrial subtract fracture, it occurs, uh, the mortality should be less than 1%, and we must learn pericardiosynthesis before we try to put a transatrial subtract puncture. Uh, and ECHO must be readily available in the cath lab because if there is complications, if there is a uh, pericardi pericardial uh, uh, tamponade, then we must uh, learn to drain it. So if there is an aortic root staining during the puncture, we must abandon the procedure, uh, follow the patient uh, uh, by repeated echo. And once if it is by only needle puncture, most of the time it is spontaneously and don't, re don't require any intervention. But if it is a need, if a seed has been put in, then we need uh, urgent surgical interventions. So stitch phenomenon is when the left atrium is too much dilated, then uh, then the part of the left, uh, part of the atrium will, will have not have an actually intraatrial septum. So in that case, we can cross the needle by both the right atrium and the left atrium, and the patient may have uh, tamponade. So we should be very careful uh, when if it is only by a needle puncture in the case of a stitch phenomenon, then probably the uh, if we put uh, put out the needle and we monitor the patient most of the time, uh, it doesn't require any surgical intervention. But again, if we have put the seed and the dilator in, then most of the time uh, that we need urgent surgical interventions in those cases. So, so uh, to know the contraindications of the Inter-intraatrial septum puncture. The absolute contraindication is either the presence of uh, thrombus in the LA cavity, or uh, when the thrombus is near the inter-atrial septum, or there is there is a tumor uh, in uh, in the left atria uh, near the inter-atrial septum. So these are the absolute contraindications for uh, inter-atrial septal puncture. Um, but the relative contraindication are when there is a grossly dilated LA, there is a which is too convex, or when there is an interrupted IGC, or there is a post LG repair uh, patch repair. Then these are the relative contraindications for uh, inter-atrial septal. Uh, puncture. But uh, definitely experts can do it, but uh, I, will, I will advise the beginners not to do uh, in those situations where there is a, a LA a appendage clot or when there is a hugely dilated LA or RA or when the inter septum is too convex or it is unusually dilated. Mm -hmm. So there are other methods by which we can do the RA puncture like RF ablations with the energy. And when uh, if there is interrupted IBC, you can go from the jugular vein and uh, we can also puncture the interrupted septum, but these are for the experts. Uh, for the beginners, they should avoid all these procedures, fancy procedures. Yeah. To conclude, yeah, yeah, just I'm concluding. Uh, so, so conclude interventional septal puncture has been rejuvenated with the progress of structural heart disease interventions like uh, uh, paravalvular leak closures and advancement in EP studies. Uh, intra intracardiac catheter should be used as an anatomical marker to avoid the puncture of the aortic root. After the initial puncture, it is essential to verify the tip of the transeptal puncture, as I said, uh, there with, the, uh, lead, uh, with the needle in the left atrial. And in view of risk of stroke, rheumaticulous attention should be uh, paid to the D airing and uh, hepatitis so uh, to conclude approximately 1% of the procedures are abandoned due to failing or to cross the intraatrial septum complications occur in less than 1% of patients most commonly in advanced puncture of the pericardial space is the most common complication tamponade is unlikely if the seed and dilator are not pushed so again cross check your needle whether it is in the position or not and uh, real time visualization with the of the intraatrial septum via te or by ice uh, has uh, minimized the complication and iatrogenic atrial septal defects usually disappear by uh, spontaneously by 3 months uh, thank you uh, thank you very much thank you dr luga for giving an excellent uh, talk on the, uh, the tips and tricks of septal puncture i have this particular session of coronary intervention in the PG track program is now comes to comes to a close. We have the last session coming up for the day, which is pacemaker troubleshooting. And uh, for this pacemaker troubleshooting program, we have the, our master uh, professor Dr. C. Narasimhan to talk about physiological uh, pacing. Dr. Narasimhan needs an introduction. Sir has been waiting for a long time. Sir, please proceed. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Dr. BTC, I'm audible. Yes, yeah, yeah, just to, hello. Okay, just to say hello. Good evening, uh, Dr. Rakesh and uh, chairpersons. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, noise about physiologic pacing. And uh, predominantly, I'll talk about physiologic pacing in heart failure and then have one or two slides uh, about uh, the role of physiologic pacing in routine bradycardias. So if you look at uh, therapies, uh, we have realized CRT is extremely useful in patients with left bundle branch block. 
So this is the intrinsic activation time. This is QRS that is narrow, 120, 140, 150. If it is a left bundle branch block, by CRT, you are able to narrow the QRS and that translates into clinical benefit. Whereas patients with IVCD right bundle branch block do not derive the same benefit when you try to do a regular CRT. So it is the total ventricular activation time that is very important because you may resynchronize the LV, but if you are producing a very abnormal uh, QRS, during exercise, the patients may have RV desynchronous. So this is a classic paradigm. Most of you would have seen uh, strain rate imaging of the left ventricle. Among patients with the left bundle branch block, uh, I'm sorry, for some reason this is not playing. Okay, I need not tell this August uh, audience. In left bundle branch block, already there is a weak cardiac muscle and there is a lot of wasted work because one area contracts and passively stretches the lateral wall. And the other area, by the time it contracts after 150 milliseconds, it stretches the septum. So in the broad sense, you are wasting energy. Whether this happens in the right ventricle or in the left ventricle, that's involved ventricle, there is wasted energy. So this is the normal blue activation of the anterior and posterior fascicles. Whereas here, if you look at it, there is stretch as indicated by the yellow when the lateral wall is contracting in blue, it is stretching the septum. And similarly, uh, when the septum contracts, the lateral wall gets uh, stretched out. So we have understood from physiology days, uh, there's a tremendous amount of network of rapidly conducting fibers in the subendocardium. And if you engage any of this, if you can pace at one of these fibers anywhere, you are able to simultaneously activate a wide network of fibers, both in the septum and lateral wall, translating into near simultaneous activation of the ventricle. So this is how the first uh, concept came with uh, selective his bundle uh, pacing. You can have a very significant narrowing of the QRS in select group of patients and uh, at, when you lose the capture, you have widening of the QRS uh, at a particular, uh, this is a pacing output dependent capture of the left and uh, right bundle branch block. So even among patients who failed to respond to CRT, when their RV lead was moved to the HIST location called as hot CRT, that translated into a significant clinical benefit by improving the LV ejection fraction and the QRS duration progressively came down by having one lead in the left ventricle, the other one in the his bundle lead. So the his bundle lead ran into a particular problem of undersensing of the ventricle, high pacing uh, capture threshold, and the unpredictability of capture from the his bundle. So came this concept uh, from uh, Dr. Huang, who looked at a very attractive target of a wide area of subendocardial left bundle, which proves to be an attractive target for capturing the whole of the subendocardium and resulting in a stable low threshold of the ventricular capture. Pacing is beyond the sight of the high threshold, larger R, R waves, and the problem of oversensing of atrium doesn't occur. And uh, there is left septal myocardial capture in these patients. So several small studies involving uh, just about uh, 20 to 60 patients have shown the feasibility of doing left bundle pacing uh, in patients with heart failure, which has translated into a clinical benefit in terms of ejection. These are small scale uncontrolled uh, case series that have reported proof of principle of capturing the left bundle. And uh, taking this one step further, Dr. Vijay Raman and others have looked at the feasibility of adding a, a left bundle and a, a free wall capture of the LV lead and significantly reducing the QRS duration 
and uh, improving the LVEF. So that was the concept was called as lot CRT, where in patients, in addition to the conventional CRT, if it fails to narrow the QRS, they started pacing the left bundle directly and that translated into a clinical response in 70% of patients, echocardiac response in 70% and super responders in about 30% of these patients. Now, we should learn this pattern recognition that when you have a right bundle morphology of QRS with an absence of S-wave in the standard limb leads in lead one and AVL, that's a masquerading bundle branch block. And uh, that indicates disease in both the bundle branches. And these patients benefit from conventional CRT. So what is the future of physiologic pacing among patients with heart failure? You have broadly patients with uh, left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, and then uh, patients with IVCD. If you get an optimal CRT by putting a, a his bundle pacing in among patients with right bundle branch block, you can narrow the QRS. There is a small feasibility study of improving cardiac output in these patients with right bundle branch block and heart failure where you can achieve complete correction. In patients where you are not able to achieve complete correction, you may use um, you may use uh, an additional RV lead uh, to, especially along the moderator band, to further shorten the QRS. Among patients with left bundle branch block, a conventional biventricular pacing, and vast majority of them, you'll be able to completely narrow the QRS. But if you fail to narrow the QRS, you can either add a his bundle lead, as was seen in uh, uh, hot CRT, or a left bundle lead by a lot CRT, and you can achieve optimal CRT. Among patients with IVCD, there is, again, you may need several combinations depending on the conduction system disease that is present in a given individual. So assessment of the ECG and the echo and looking at the areas of uh, activation delays will help you to plan uh, how to successfully resynchronize these patients with physiologic pacing. You can achieve this at the area of latest activation in patients with left bundle branch block, which is free wall of the left ventricle. Among patients with predominant conduction system disease, if it's proximal conduction system disease, you can narrow it down with his bundle pacing or left bundle pacing. Among patients with right bundle branch block, there is a, a very small study which looks at the feasibility of uh, direct his bundle pacing and additional RV lead. So that begs the question, what about pacing in bradycardia? Now, I know there are a lot of series, but in patients who have presented to you with syncope, the most important thing that a physician should consider is prevent sudden death by due to asystole. Now, in the attempt to do a physiological pacing where it is not indicated, you may run into more harm than good. For example, if you take up straightforward sick sinus syndrome, all that this patient, so you have a patient during atrial fibrillation conducts to a heart rate of 160, 170, but during sinus or conversion pauses gets four second, five seconds pause and is having a syncope. This patient just needs the most physiologic pacing for him is just a AI or AIR. If you think the same six sinus syndrome patient has a borderline AV conduction, you can drop an additional ventricular lead. For most patients with AV block, if a patient's financial status doesn't permit, a simple VVI will be able to correct the problem of syncope and sudden death in these patients or DDDR will be required for patients, I mean, can be offered for patients where they can afford. But even this DDDR, most of the problem of pacing-induced LV dysfunction happens because of inappropriate management after the implant. Either the lead is not exactly on the septum, it's not engaging the distal conduction system, or it is a patient has persistent tachycardia, uncontrolled risk factors. 
So it's more important in these patients to prevent asystole rather than uh, going for a fancy pacing and uh, getting into problems. So I think a lot of senior uh, cardiologists are there who have been doing this pacemakers for uh, over several decades, four or five decades. They have seen patients going, coming for first replacement, second replacement. All of us have done that. And it's not that all the patients where you put a pacemaker, they go into LV dysfunction. All of them need a CRT. No, 90% of the patients, if managed well, they do not progress to LV dysfunction. Now, progressing to LV dysfunction may be due to uh, a disease which was undiagnosed initially, for example, laminacy or a person with uh, some kind of a cardiomyopathy or a genetic defect. In the natural progression of disease, they develop pelvic dysfunction. You may have to resynchronize these patients. Yes, but it doesn't, it's probably not required in every single patient to consider his bundle pacing. So in summary, conduction system pacing is a valuable mode of pacing for a subgroup of patients with heart failure. Initial studies do indicate better outcomes in patients who are indicated for CRT. That is, physiologic pacing is equivalent to CRT in some of the initial studies. However, we don't have long-term randomized control trials to prove that the outcome is any different or better or worse in routine clinical practice. We need to wait for this evidence because any new type of pacemaker that comes in the market doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. Uh, so we, as clinicians, we need to temper our clinical judgment and look at the patient and offer what is better or what is best in the patient's interest. I think I'll stop here and thank you very much for the patient listening. Uh, thank you, Professor Narasimhan. That was a masterly description of the physiological pacing. And I also welcome Dr. Dijip Kumar to the chair of this session. And, and next to we have Dr. Rakesh Jadav, who will be talking um, about dual chamber pressing troubleshooting in this PG track program. Uh, program. Dr. Rakesh Jadav, please. Thank you, Dr. Dikesana, sir. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm audible, sir? Yeah, you are audible and your slides are visible. Also. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, in next uh, 12 minutes, what I have to speak is basic troubleshooting of a dual chamber pressing problem. Uh, believe me, sometimes even uh, expert cardiologists cannot give 100% diagnosis of troubleshooting seeing on ECG because there are a lot of algorithms which has been introduced and pacemaker. There are a lot of things which has been introduced and until you know each and everything about that particular pacemaker, sometimes a normal pacing function can be labeled as troubleshooting and sometimes a troubleshooting is interpreted as a normal ECG of a pacemaker. I am going to give a brief and very uh, basic how to find out the troubleshooting, what are the various troubleshooting, and how to manage it. Believe me, the pacemaker, the secret of interpreting pacemaker ECG is that pacemaker is made to do only two things. It will either sense or it will pace. And there are few intervals which are very, very important, especially in dual chamber pacemaker. You know, there's two types of pacemaker, and I am at present particular concern about troubleshooting of a dual chamber pacemaker. And why it's important to know the troubleshooting? Because it may be possible that you may be a sensing failure and pacing failure, but sometimes if patient's troubleshooting is not recognized, it may lead to a ventricle fibrillation also. So sometimes it may be life saving to detect troubleshooting as early as possible. Now, the pacemaker, dual chamber pacemaker may be either simple DDD pacemaker or you include as DDR when you switch on the rate response pacemaking mode. And that's very, very important. Now, what you should know before diagnosing this question. First thing, what is the mode of this pacemaker? So, you should know that patient mode is either there is a DDR mode, what is the lower rate which is being set what is the upper rate of pacemaker which is being set? Is hysteresis is made on or not? What are various intervals which has been set at the time of implantation? Or if there any of the interval has been changed? And you should be knowing the special 
features of that pacemaker before interpreting the abnormal or troubleshooting of dual chamber pacemaker. So, first and foremost, important thing is the refractive period. You should know what is the refractive period of the pacemaker. The refractive period is an interval initiated by a pace or sense event. And during the refractive period, the pacemaker sees, but it is unresponsive to any signal. It means that it will see, it will see the impulse, it will see the event, but it will not respond at all. And it is designed to prevent inhibition by cardiac or non-cardiac work. Very, very important. Second important interval, which is which you should know is a blanking period. What is a blanking period? Blanking period is a time immediately after a sense or paced activity. Pacemaker is blind in any activity during the blanking period. And it's designed to prevent oversensing of pacing stimulus or influencing depolarization. So, in a blanking period, the pacemaker is totally blind. And in a refractive period, it sees, but it will not act. And third, various interval in dual chamber pacemaker, that uh, interval which is important, what happens when there is an actual output, either a sensed output or a pace output. There's an initiation of AV delay, there's an initiation of ventricle blanking period. And there is a initiation of safety standby pacing algorithm, which is in various companies, it's a different different. Now, these are the four important type of DDD pacemaker. First, your atria is being sensed and your ventricle is being sensed. Both are being sensed. So you will not see any spike, and the QRS morphology will be a native morphology of the patient. The second possibility is when you have an atrial pace reading and a ventricle sense reading. So what will happen? You have a spike before the atria, you have a very well P wave and a QRS, and the QRS morphology will be seen as a native QR morphology. The third possibility is that you have an atrial sense activity and a ventricle pace activity. So after an atrial sense, you are fixed after a fixed AV interval, the ventricle pacemaker spike will be seen, and this pacing morphology. If it is put in a right ventricle, will be a left bundle branch morphology. And if it's a biventricle pacemaker, it will depend upon where the LV lead is being put. So the morphology in a pacing lead will change until it is a his pacing or a bundle branch or pacing in which really the morphology mimics the native ECG. And there may be a fourth thing that both axial and ventricle are paced. So, how to recognize the troubleshooting? There's basic five abnormal pacemaker ECG, which is seen in dual chamber pacemaker. Either there's under sensing, or there's over sensing, there's a non capture and no output, and there's a pseudo malfunction. It means the pacemaker ECG is normal, but we interpret as a malfunction. Now, what do you mean over sensing? Over sensing means if you have put a pacemaker on any lower rate, suppose you have put a pacemaker on a 60 per minute rate. So, the pacemaker should fire at rate of 60 per minute. However, at the time where it should have fired, there is no spike. It means it is sensing something at that time. So, over sensing means there is no pacemaker spike, there is no intrinsic P wave or QRS complex, and where it has to come. And it is basically depending upon what is the lower rate which you have fixed. So this is an oversensing. Now, in a, I, this is suppose this is a very good example. Now, this is a ventricle pace within this. There's an atrial. This is a VVI pacemaker basically. There's a ventricle sense yes, and there is a ventricle sense which is being shown in a vent, but there is no spike here. It means the ventricle is sensing something here, but there's no nothing here. There's no QRS which ventricle should have. So it is an oversensing of a ventricle or atrial. Now, second, it, it is basically there may be because of lead uh, failure, poor connection at a character block, and uh, uh, or exposure to interference. So there is three important cause of ventricle or actual over uh, sensing. Then there is under sensing. What do we mean by under sensing? The under sensing means the pacemaker is not able to sense the intrinsic, whether it's the actual activity. Or it's the ventricle activity, and it has given a spike because a pacemaker it sense any intrinsic activity, it should not have given a spike. And this is it, what is happening. 
it's a dual chamber pacemaker uh, single chamber pacemaker uh, sorry dual chamber pacemaker ecg what is happening here there is an spike at atrium is properly captured but the next spike there is an atrial activity which is preceding this spike it means this atrial activity is not being sensed and pacemaker is fine same things happening in a fourth beat there is a capture there is a capture there is a capture so there is a normal capture but there is an abnormal sensing of the actual spike in the dual chamber pacemaker so it is known as under sensing this is not a capture failure because if you give a spike during the refractory period it is not going to capture either a atria or the ventricle so it is not a capture failure because spike is immediately coming uh, uh, within a p wave so it is under refractory period that's why it has not given an another p wave Uh, this is again several example of under sensing there is a spike though there is a qrs complex which ventricle should have sensed but it has not sensed so it has given its spike and why under sensing is sometimes troublesome because if this spike comes in a very vulnerable period of the descending limb of the p wave in the during the depolarization it can lead to ventricle fibrillation and these are all the causes of under sensing in appropriate program sensitivity you have kept sensitivity very high lead dislodgement lead fracture lead uh, maturation or change in the native signal which all can lead to under sensing non capture yes it's very very important to recognize the non capture and in first ecg i have shown the atrial uh, there is a spike and it is not also captured but that is coming in the refractory period And this is an example of a dual chamber pacemaker. A pace, A pace, B pace, A pace, B pace, A pace, B pace, and what is happening here? There is an atrial spike, no atrial activity, and this has not captured the atria. So there is no atrial activity, so this is not captured the atria. So you have to recognize, especially in dual chamber pacemaker, when atrial lead is in trouble because sometimes it is mixed or overlapped. and again there is an atrial good atrial sense followed by a ventricular spike so there if you find these type of signals no p wave after the spike or there is no qrs after the spike it is non capture same thing what is happening in a ventricular lead there is a ventricular pacing ventricular pacing ventricular pacing and suddenly there is a spike and no capture and these spikes are coming at exactly at the same time where it should happen so it is a non capture uh, of the uh, lv by this pacemaker same thing here it's it's a, it's a pacing 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 and suddenly there's no capture of the ventricle so it has to be recognized because very very important because this can lead to syncopal attack non capture there's several cause of non capture it's uh, basically because of this this lead dislodgement low output p which we have kept lead maturation poor correction and lot of causes of lead failure shoulder syndrome electrolyte imbalance especially hyperkalemia may sometimes lead to non capture acute ACS may lead to non-capture. Some drug therapy, which is known to increase the threshold, increase the uh, threshold of the uh, LV, can lead to non-capture, and sometimes that will be treated. But again, there is two condition: non-capture and no output, because that is very very important. Now, if you see this marker ECG, it is an A pace, V pace. Second is A pace. V pace. Third is what is happening. There is a V pace. It is showing that there is a V pace. A pace, and in below it is seeing that there is a V pace. It means the pacemaker has given a spike, but it is not seen here. No output is seen. So there is no output means there is no spike which is seen on the ECG. It means there is no output where it has to come. And these are these are the causes of no output. Poor connection, lead failure, battery depletion, and circuit failure are the causes of no output. This is very very important. You should know that what is stenosis. Stenosis is very very important because it allows a lower rate between sensed event to occur. Pace rate is higher. So what happens? Suppose you have set a lower rate as sixty. So what will happen? The pacemaker will and you have set stenosis at the lower rate of forty. So If patient pacemaker is sensing A sense B pace, A sense B sense, A sense B sense, and suddenly the rate drops to fifty, 
the pacemaker will not going to work because you have set hysteresis rate of 40 so until the rate drops to the 40 the pacemaker is not going to fire and then if pacemaker fire it may fire at the rate of 60 which you have put as a lower rate. so sometimes your ecg you will say i have set a pacemaker at uh, 60 the patient's heart rate is 50 and patient is not firing because we have switched on the hysteresis. So this may be sometimes said by the patient that sir, your pacemaker is malfunction. You will integrate everything, everything will come normal. However, you are not able to recognize with the bus system because you have switched hysteresis on. So hysteresis is very, very important function which mimics troubleshooting, but actually it is a normal function to prevent unnecessary ventricular pacing. Magnet operation that is also very, very important. Sometimes you will see this type of ECG and you will say what is happening to the pacemaker. The pacemaker suddenly starts firing with a very higher speed. But do think that this ECG was not done by putting a magnet over the pacemaker because it is a magnet rate which is shown here. It is not a troubleshooting of a pacemaker. The upper rate behavior is very important. What when you fix the upper rate in a dry chamber pacemaker, the pacemaker. If there's totally ventricle dependence, the ventricle weight will never exceed more than what is upper rate behavior. Suppose you have put upper rate behavior to 100 and atrial activity increases to 120, the pacemaker ventricle weight will only be 100. So, what will happen? How would the pacemaker sense atria, pace ventricle, atrial rate is 130, ventricle rate is 100? How the pacemaker behave? It depends upon. Uh, various pacemaker and majority of the pacemaker has venky back phenomena. By venky backing, they decrease the ventricle rate. In, in older patient, uh, patients, it was two stool block which is being produced. So, in some time when you, the upper rate behavior, there is a pseudo venky back operation which is coming here and it mimics that there is something wrong with the pacemaker. It is actually not wrong with the pacemaker. It is an upper rate behavior which is shown in this ECG. So, and this is an older pacemaker, the pacemaker suddenly rate drops to half. So it is not a troubleshooting, it is an upper rate behavior by which patient's pacemaker responds. More switching is very, very important because majority of the device at present in 12 chamber pacemaker have a mode switching operation. So if you switch on the mode, what will happen? Suppose patient with normal sinusitis goes into atrial fibrillation, then this pacemaker will go to the ventricle BVIR mode. It will, it will, it will trap atria, but it will only face BVIR mode, and that rate is also fixed by the operator. You can fix that rate. You can fix that rate at 90, 70, 80. So you should know what is a mode switch. Because suppose you you have seen some ECG, you have set a lower rate of pacemaker to 60, and suddenly you see a ECG in which the pacemaker is firing at rate of 75. And in atrial fibrillation, because there is a complete heart drop, the pacemaker the way rhythm will be equal. So you will see what is happening here. I have fixed a lower rate of 60 and this pacemaker is firing at the rate of 70. So sometimes the, the switch, because of the mode switch, the ECG will have some bizarre appearance, but it is normal basically. And this also you should know, the pacemaker mediated tachycardia, though in a recent pacemaker, I have not seen the pacemaker mediated tachycardia in last 10 years, believe it, I have not seen a single ECG of that. Because the recent pacemaker, there's a lot of things which has put in the algorithm to prevent pacemaker mediated tachycardia. The rate drop response, that is very, very important. You should know in certain pacemaker, when you are integrating the pacemaker, there is a rate drop response. And uh, you should also know this type of rate drop response. Rate drop response means delivers pacing at higher rate when episodic drop in rate occurs. Pacing therapy indicates for patient with neurocardiogenic syncope. That is being given for neurocardiogenic syncope. And that is very much similar to um, uh, hysteresis. You will set a rate that there should be this rapid rate drop when the pacemaker detected that this rapid rate drop has occurred, it will start intervening and start pacing to a larger size. Uh, you should also know the, what, we, what we mean by the safety pacing and there are some ECGs which sometimes mimic abnormal ECGs but uh, basically Adab, they are, Adab, late in the day like, and last sure last like. slide, this is my last slide sir. thank you very much can you please conclude hello yes sir this is my last sir I have concluded 
I've just shown some troubleshooting which is which thinks it is troubleshooting, but actually it is normal. So basically, batch number pacemaker. Sometimes even uh, if you don't put the pacemaker patient on the uh, vent, and if you don't uh, integrate the pacemaker, sometimes it's very difficult to tell what troubleshooting actually it is. So ECG basic, you can know all the basic troubleshooting, but for detecting the exact, you have to integrate the device and see what is happening inside the device. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jadav. Uh, that is a very enlightening lecture. I sincerely hope the our fellows are listening to these lectures and perhaps they are keeping a record of it because some of the materials that has been discussed today by the various of, uh, our teachers have been excellent. You cannot find all of the knowledge distilled into such a short time. Now I call on Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee, who is all the way from Ontario, Canada, to uh, give his derivation on implantable cardiovascular defibrillator troubleshooting. Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee, please. Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee, please. Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee, are you there? Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, is there. Uh, yeah. Please. Come on, line. Sir, I sent a request to unmute uh, yourself. Kindly unmute, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I, I just sent a request to unmute. I think sir is not there in front of our system. Uh, in that case, um, uh, please, uh, if he comes online, please put Dr. Sanjeev Mukherjee on hold. Meanwhile, we pass on to Dr. Munna Das, who will be talking on cardiac resynchronization therapy troubleshooting. Another very important and interesting session. It should be another very important and interesting session. Dr. Munna Das, please come online. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. Am I audible? Yeah, please. Please uh, proceed. Thank you, sir, uh, uh, Chairperson, and uh, the entire CSI West Bengal Update Committee for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak on such an important topic of cardiac resynchronization therapy troubleshooting. Now, in order to address such a complex issue, I have divided the troubleshooting uh, points into problems related to patient selection, to procedure-related issues, and post-procedure follow-up issues. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, first, in order to maximize our benefit of CRT, we need to decide to offer CRT to which patient. Now, we know that the response to CRT is based on certain factors like electrical, we, where we need to have a left bundle branch block and a QRS duration 150 milliseconds or more to have an optimal CRT benefit. Mechanical in terms of dyssynchrony that can be demonstrated through various imaging methods. Absence of a transmural scar, particularly at the lead ex, uh, tip where the impulse exits in, to depolarize the myocardium and absence of a severe mitral regurgitation which are impediments to a good CRT benefit. Also, we know that a female gender and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, subset of patients benefit from CRT most, and certain genetic yet unknown factors like fetal genes and calcium handling may be responsible for the unfavorable CRT response in certain patients where QRS becomes narrow, but that does not translate into a mechanical benefit. Next slide. Now, where to put the LV lead to maximize lead 
uh, your uh, CRT response or the efficacy. Here, the anatomy becomes very important. We need to uh, re-emphasize, again, the course of the CS and its tributaries. In the LAO view, our usual traditional position is, to, is the 2 to 3 o'clock position around uh, putting the lead into the lateral cardiac vein or the posterolateral cardiac vein or one of its sub-tributaries to maximize the CRT response. And in the RAO view, we should be uh, happy placing the lead midway between the base and the apex. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, uh, now we have imaging methods like uh, fusion of LV venous anatomy on fluoroscopy venograms with spec myocardial perfusion images for guiding CRT LV lead placement. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So, we, uh, we can de delineate the star burden in such issues, particularly at the LV lead uh, uh, placement site, uh, the point of latest activation and coronary sinus tributary accessibility with, the in with this integration method. Next slide. So you can see the fluoroscopic anatomy uh, on the uh, screen with the, uh, your functional evaluation being uh, put into place for guiding the LV lead placement. Next slide. Yeah, so this is another way of uh, showing the target LV lead position. That is the mid part of the anterior uh, vein in this particular uh, patient. Next slide. So another concept of multipoint LV pacing to maximize CRT benefit in patients who have a suboptimal response with a single uh, LV lead uh, placed with a single point pacing. We, it was found that putting two LV leads was safe and associated with significantly more LV reverse remodeling than the conventional bi pacing. Next slide. And in experimental models also, it was shown that with multiple LV pacing electrodes in patients who had a suboptimal response with single site pacing, the acute LV performance as measured by the LV DPTT as well as the LV activation time both were substantially improved. Next slide. And conceptually also, pacing from two LV sites has a benefit of capturing a larger area, improving the pattern of depolarization, repolarization, and improving hemodynamics, and thereby improving the resynchronization. Next slide. And in the clinical outcome data also from the Italian registry, the Iron MPP study, it was shown that the clinical composite score at three months improved with multi-site uh, uh, pacing using the quadrupolar LV lead vis-a-vis -vis the usual bipolar lead pacing. Next slide. Now coming on to the technical nuances regarding our first impediment to putting an, a successful LV lead is engaging the CS. Now how to find where is the orifice of the coronary sinus? Here also, we need to have a good, uh, next slide, good uh, uh, concept of the fluoroscopic anatomy. Identify the fluoroscopic fat pad, delineating the septal isthmus. If we ha already have a RV lead in place, the, uh, the kneel uh, of the RV lead itself uh, points us to placement of the LV lead through the CS OS. And uh, we can use the usual guide wire method to probe into the CS and we can have the RO view and the LO view to complement each other. We can also use contrast to delineate the ventricle, the tricuspid annulus, as also the CS OS and the proximal CS. And we can also use the EP catheter if uh, in certain situations it becomes difficult to find the, next slide, the CS electrograms and thereby identify the CS. But my personal experience and also tallies with others regarding a safer placement with the usual guide wire method using an Amplus catheter and the usual uh, termo, uh, uh, the glide wire rather than uh, a stiffer EP catheter that because that actually can dissect the coronary sinus, particularly 
with a proximal tortuous force. Next slide. And the CS angiography to delineate the tributaries and the course of the CS. Next slide. Can at times end up dissecting the coronary sinus. Once dissected, then how should you approach the, the rest of the case? If a coronary sinus or it's one of its veins is dissected, then the best strategy is not to put any further contrast. You can use the PTCA wire to guide your uh, LV lead into another target vein, uh, another tributary of the coronary sinus you think appropriate, or you can delay the LV lead placement for another two weeks, allowing the CS to heal or abandon the case, which is the least favorable in favor of epicardial surgical approach. Next slide. Now, at times we can encounter a big target vein with an acute angled origin. A big target vein and an acute angled origin actually predisposes to uh, your uh, LV lead dislodgement. So whether we put a big, bigger lead in a big, big vein, no. It is not at all necessary to match the lead vein size. A small caliber lead with a deeper insertion is suggested. And in the acute angled vein, it's preferable to use another cardiac vein. Next slide. Now, we have the option of active fixation leads like the Starflex lead, but it has also its uh, potential problems of showing a 15% operance of phrenic nerve stimulation on long-term follow-up. Next slide. Yeah, so another big problem is during upgradation from dual chamber pacing to bi pacing in patients who have a LV uh, function deterioration and a permanent pacemaker dependency, we can encounter occlusion of the subclavian vein. Now, we can do a venoplasty of the same site, but the other options, next slide, will be a less favorable epicardial approach, which will need general anesthesia and a substantial recovery time. Next slide. Or preferably the opposite side approach is uh, uh, in this case. And if we uh, do it, then a guide wire method is preferred rather than putting an EP catheter for risk of L the RV lead dislodgement. Now, phrenic nerve stimulation is another issue that we can detect during the procedure or at times during follow-up. Next slide. And next slide. Yeah, so uh, PNS incidence has been reported in up to one-fourth of patients during a follow-up of uh, around uh, two years. Next slide. And the incidence of PNS in different locations shows that it's most frequent at the middle lateral posterior, the same sites we choose to put our the LV lead plus the apical LV sites. Next slide. Next slide. So programmable multiple pacing configurations can help us to overcome the high left ventricular pacing thresholds as also to avoid phrenic nerve stimulation. Next slide. And in this case, a quadrupolar left heart lead helps us to uh, prevent such nuances. Next slide. So our basic approach to improving response to CRT will be to select the appropriate patient, achieve a stable and effective lead LV lead location, deliver optimal therapy, and provide device diagnostic data that enhances device and disease management. Next slide. Now, in this uh, histogram, we can uh, uh, see that uh, the common causes from uh, the uh, in the descending order of the potential reasons for suboptimal CRT response, of which the suboptimal AV timing, arrhythmias, the usual heart failure management, including correction of anemia and appropriate heart failure therapy, apart from the CRT, suboptimal LV lead positioning, and uh, less than 90% by V pacing, all uh, actually in, uh, contribute to a suboptimal CRT response. Next slide. Now, in non responder evaluation, we need to address non-cardiac issues like sleep apnea, thyroid evaluation, anemia, depression, drug toxicity, even deconditioning, that is lack of exercise, and pulmonary disease. 
among the cardiac non device related causes that we need to address are the residual ischemia, volume scatters, right heart failure, and underlying rhythm and arrhythmia burden, including AFib and VT load. And cardiac device related issues include, include the heart failure diagnostics, AV optimization, and uh, ensuring uh, adequate uh, LV capture and BIV pacing, arrhythmias, and LV lead function. Next slide. Now, re common reasons for less than 100% BIV pacing include atrial fibrillation, PVCs, and competitive AV nodal conduction, that is intrinsic AV nodal conduction. So, in a cohort of more than 80,000 patients, more than 40% patients exhibited less than 90% BIV pacing. Next slide. And in this famous study, we found that cardiac resynchronization therapy, suboptimal, less than 98%, actually determined the differences in the survival curves. So, we need to ensure 100% BIV pacing at all costs. Next slide. And a common impediment uh, scenario in such a situation is atrial fibrillation. Next slide. Where we encounter loss of BIV pacing. Next slide. And in the, uh, in the, the device diagnostics, we can see that only 60% of time, this patient actually had any BIV pacing at all. Next slide. So long-term survival after cardiac risk connection therapy among patients with AFib who underwent AV junction ablation, which is a very effective means of tackling the AF-related intrinsic nodal conduction, is similar to that observed among patients in sinus rhythm, and drug therapy is inferior to AV junction ablation. Mortality was higher in the former group. Next slide. So apart from CRT, we also need to address other heart failure therapies regarding uptitration of neurohumoral blockers, eco-guided AV optimization, heart failure education to the patient, arrhythmia management, and LV lead repositioning. Next slide. So regarding AV and VV optimization, next slide. ECO is a very useful bedside tool to optimize the AV interval. We know that a too short AV interval will lead to a truncated A wave and uh, lead to reduced LV filling. A longer AV interval can address that with a more complete A wave. Next slide. Regarding VV optimization, we know that adjusting the sequence and timing of the LV and the RV pacing to make the LV as efficient as possible to produce an optimal stroke volume is our main objective. And that can be done either through M mode or VTI, and both are in vogue, equally effective. Next slide. And apart from the manual uh, optimization that we perform on each clinic visit of this patient, there is the device-based optimization that assesses the intrinsic conduction and addresses optimization every minute. If there is a normal AV conduction, we have the adaptive LV pacing. And if there is a prolonged AV conduction, we have adaptive BIV pacing. And they form the cornerstone uh, um, management strategies of adaptive CRT algorithm found in certain company algorithms. Next slide. So basically, response to CRT is based on optimizing medical treatment, monitoring and optimizing our device, regular follow-up of our patient, and ongoing patient education. Next slide. So to conclude, our patient selection, our site of LV lead placement, technical issues like addressing the coronary sinus, extra, preventing extra cardiac stimulation, addressing issues of pacing failure, either lead dislodgement or a scar, addressing inadequate BIV pacing, addressing other heart failure therapies to optimize the patient in a holistic way, and interrogating the lead status frequently to optimize BIV pacing are the cornerstones of this successful heart failure management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munna, uh, for an excellent work group. But, uh, at the basic level, for the fellows, how to manage a CRT device. Uh, Dr. Dilip Kumar, would you like to make some comments on this? 
Yeah, I think excellent lectures and excellent session. I have only one question if Dr. Simon is still there uh, uh, regarding, uh, yeah, sir is there. So uh, how is, uh, what is your uh, sir, experience with the newer devices uh, like uh, left bundle pacing and his bundle pacing, 3830 lead has been, you know, the, uh, uh, has been there and it all started with electronics lead. So now a very, very kind of uh, attractive options uh, with uh, Agilis, uh, his catheter, deflectable catheter with a mapping option is there at the, at the tip of the catheter. And you can map the his and then take the uh, lead, conventional lead there, screw it there and come out. Uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, slit the uh, sheet, uh, the uh, his, Agilis his sheet. So what is your experience with these sheets, uh, uh, Abbott sheets and the Bitronic pacemakers like, uh, uh, you know, his bundle, uh, pacing systems. So, do you feel Medtronic is going to, uh, you know, have the upper hand, or uh, these will also be become a, uh, you know, al good alternatives? Okay, that's a very very interesting uh, question. The in terms of numbers, the largest implants and experience has been, as you know, with three eight three zero, and the whole world is uh, moving towards left bundle, in preference to his bundle. Uh, we know this and uh, the HISPRO sheath was dedicated when the, with the his bundle pacing in mind. Uh, in no doubt it's useful. But uh, I am sure most of us have moved away from his bundle to selective left bundle pacing. For selective left bundle pacing, I don't think uh, the, the, the conventional screw-in leads which are uh, with an open screw it can be done, but I think there are certain problems. I think uh, we are aware that uh, ingenuity lead, uh, late retraction of the screw and loss of uh, left bundle capture is known to occur, at least in a small percentage of cases. Second thing is uh, the screw goes in and you cannot pull out the lead in sometimes. In a fibrous septum, you have not gone to the left side, but you are neither able to pull out the lead nor advance the lead. So that is a catch-22 situation. This has been known to occur more often. At least uh, in uh, 3830, you can advance and the lead, as you know, doesn't have an inner core, a lumen. Therefore, it is quite strong to pull. You can advance the sheath over it up to the septum and then pull the whole thing out. Uh, whereas the other leads made it kind of break uh, in the process. So I have my concerns about the extended screw. Yes, in 80-90% you can achieve, but occasionally if you run into problems, we'll be facing a difficult situation with the patient. Uh, so till as a part of the trial, I'm willing to do it. Uh, but uh, I think 3830 is much uh, safer option to take it to the left bundle. Right, so I think, and the holes which the conventional lead is making it's all it's all uh, also a larger one that's like right three zero as you know thin lead and uh, three four times you go in come out so and and and, and stability is also ensured more or less yeah, absolutely that's very nice so yeah. and, uh, i think we have uh, doctor we have doctor Shunji mukherjee as a, um, a panelist but uh, somehow other we lost him so this doctor mundadas and doctor uh, dilip kumar uh, and with uh, and very many thanks to um, Dr. Narasimhan to conclude our sessions today. Till we meet tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, sir, please be there. We'll be having very interesting sessions tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Good night, sir. Recording stopped.